Hello friends, welcome to the ITLS Academy. It is the best online training platform with its unique feature which you will not find anywhere else. As we know that the microbiology is most promising career for life science and applied science background candidate in industries, you can have your better career in respective medical microbiology field. We are providing the best training module to you without going anywhere. Just learn with us from your home on mobile or laptop without any time restriction. So do not waste your time and join a job-oriented online course based on medical microbiology. We are pleased to conduct this three-month online certificate course to empower the youth for their better career in medical microbiology. During this course, participants will get an idea about medical microbiology and how to make career in it. The main aim or purpose for this course is to make you familiar with the medical microbiology, to aware the participants regarding the microbiology tools and techniques used in medical research, and to make familiar with career prospects in medical sector after completing the education. Here you will be learn about the scope of medical microbiology, molecular bio microbiology, microbial control and mechanism of pathogenicity, virology, clinical microbiology and job prospects in medical sector. There will be 14 topics to be covered under this training. The first is the history and scope of medical microbiology, cellular and molecular microbiology, microbial control and mechanism of pathogenicity, immunology, gram-positive bacteria, gram-negative bacteria, spirochetes and other bacteria, general virology, DNA viruses, RNA viruses, multiple viral complexes, mycotic infection, applied microbiology, clinical microbiology. Students of BSc Biology, Biotech and Microbiology can join this program or MSc with Microbiology, Biotech and Biology, BT student with Biotech and Bioinformatics, MTech students with Biotech and Bioinformatics, D Pharma, B Pharma, N Pharma student or any faculty or research scholars, medical science professionals can easily join this course. All the participants of this course will be provided with the certificate on the completion of the course. So do not waste your time and quickly log on to our website www.itlsacademy.com and register yourself for the course under the Medical Microbiology. For more information, you can also contact us at 7080833450. Today we are going to have our first lectures on Chapter 1, History of Medical Microbiology. So we start with our what is microbiology. Microbiology is a study of living organisms which are microscopic in size, very small in size and which can be visible through a microscope. That is a micro study of that microscopic organism is known as a microbiology. The term microbiology was first introduced by a French chemist named, named is Louis Pasteur. The study of microbes starts with the discovery of microscopes. And then Anthony von Leeuwenhoek designed a single lens microscope and demonstrated a little agent which causes disease as a animal cue. These animal cues are now well-known established identities belonging to a group of bacteria, viruses and several other pathogens. The organism which can be in which are being invisible to our naked eye but can be visible through a micro or microscope are known as a microorganism. There are many uh, scientists who had worked with the microbiology, but there are many pioneers who have started working with the microbiology. So the pioneers, we will read in this chapter, we will read about the pioneers of medical microbiology. The medical microbiology was first established by the scientist Louis Pasteur. He was also called as the father of microbiology and he gave, he coined the term microbiology. For many years, it was believed that the microorganism arose from the dead, especially decomposed organic matter. And this theory is known as a theory of spontaneous generations. But in Louis Pasteur, he uh, gave a strong evidence that the microorganism didn't arise spontaneously in a media but can be introduced and he proved this so here yeah, theory known as a germ theory of diseases the germ theory of diseases state that the certain diseases are caused by a specific germs or infective agent which are present in a environment and he proved by applying one method that is he took a flask with a neck and he applied uh, with a neck and in this class he kept the, he kept the media and in this media this media was heated and let the class sit for some hours or a day 72 to 48 hours and then he say he has seen that no bacteria is grown in that flask again he repeated that experiment and now in this second experiment he cut the neck of that flask and he kept that media for a few days and he has seen that the bacteria is present in that media then he had applied this thing third time and he had uh, tilted the heated media and kept uh, for a certain days and he has seen that some bacteria are presented this uh, plus. So he proved that the experimentally he proved that the existence of my germs in a air and served as a final name in the coffin of spontaneous generation theory that no spontaneous generation theory was wrong and the germ theory of diseases was right, which is postulated by Louis Pasha. Pasha has given many achievements in the field of microbiology. In the, uh, in the field of sterilization, he has also worked and uh, he has shown that the microorganism can be inactivated by boiling, can be uh, inactivated by autoclaving, that is, is heating the media under 120 degrees Celsius under a pressure. And in a hot air oven, we can also inactivate the bacteria. The Pasha developed the vaccines against chickenpox, cholera, anthrax by using the attenuated suspensions of that particular bacteria. With this work of sterilization, so after the work of sterilization, so Joseph Lister, he has also started work, working with the sterilization procedures and, and he working on he worked on the bone sepsis. And he introduced the practice of protecting the bone from the airborne microbes by applying the antiseptic in that bone, which keep the microbes away from the bone. 
the third scientist which came into being is the Robert Koch. Robert Koch was also known as the father of bacteriology. Robert Koch's first contribution to science was the demonstration of a character and mode of growth of positive, vac uh, positive bacillus of anthrax and he discovered the tubercle bacillus and cholera vibrio also. This manifold discovery leads Robert Koch to be called as the father of bacteriology. He has discovered many bacteria which causes disease in a human. Koch works on the diseases and, and diagnostics of cumulative creations and this cumulative creations are known as a Koch postulate. What is Koch postulate? Koch has given a postulate which says that the isolate should be found, the uh, bacterial isolate should be found in every case of a disease under a condition which explains the pathological change and the clinical feature. What does this first postulate mean? The first postulate says that if somebody, some patient is having that particular type of disease, example, malaria. If the malaria is seen in the patient's one with a fever and a chilly, uh, uh, temperatures or something which is uh, which is related to a malaria causative uh, pathological changes then it should be shown in a second patient also which we said he, this second patient is also a malaria patient so the same symptom should be seen for that particular disease Second postulate should say is that it should be possible to isolate the causative agent in a pure culture from the lensons. If lensons is produced in a diseased person body the same causative agent should be found from that person. Third postulate says that Third postulate says this, when such pure culture, when the uh, pure culture is grown from the lens and it is grown in a pure culture, it should be, is uh, inoculated in an appropriate lab laboratory animal and the same lens should be produced, which we had seen in a deceased person. When we re-isolate the causative agent in a pure culture, the lens produced in the experimental animal, we should culture, we can culture them. The lens which we, it has been seen in a experimental animal, this is a coach postulate. But there are some exceptions uh, of a coach postulate, inability to grow, the Tryponema pallidium, Mycobacterium liperi, known as a causative agent of syphilis and leprosy. Inability to grow many viruses and negative initial by pathogens on a artificial medium. What Coach has so shown in the in, it, uh, in its postulate is that he has drawn a blood sample from a cow who is suffering from anthrax disease from the blood. He examined that bacteria and cultured in a pure culture and from that pure culture he has injected the anthrax bacteria into a healthy cow and that cow died because of anthrax. This is the main framework of Coach's postulate. Another scientist, Paul Andrich. Paul Andrich, uh, who is described as the father of chemotherapy, he has treated many bacterial diseases through a therapeutic antimicrobial agent. In 1900, he cured one of the trypnosomasis cases in rat by using a dye known as a trypon rat and another form of mice with a organic arsenic compound known as a etozyl. In 1910, Andrich successfully treated syphilis using a compound known as 6 and which is also known as a salverson or the chemical uh, nature and chemical name of that compound was dioxidiamino arsino benzol dihydrochloride. Discovery of viruses. We had talked much about a bacteria, but we had not even touched about the viruses. So in, by the end of 19th century, many infected diseases have proven to have a bacterial etiology. But yet there remain many diseases like common occurrence, which have no symptoms of, uh, which doesn't show that they are a bacterial agents, which causes diseases. Such diseases are smallpox, chickenpox, measles, and common cold. After the advent of, uh, after the advent of electron microscopy in 1934, by the Rusk, made the morphological example of viruses possible. And the first human diseases proven to have the viral etiology was a yellow fever. And in this way, after the discovery of electron microscope, many viruses came into being. And the first one is 1973, Ruta virus came into being, major cause of infantile diarrhea worldwide. And after that, in 1975, Prevo virus. And in 1983, HIV virus. And in 1991, new species of Rebbebisha virus is seen. And in 2004, influenza virus is seen. And in 2020, we are seeing the coronavirus. So there's a number of Nobel laureates in a medicine and a physiology were awarded this prize for their work in a microbiology and immunology. A number of Nobel laureates in our medicine and physiology were awarded this prize for the work in microbiology and immunology. Is uh, the first one where one bearing he discovered the diphtheria and T toxin. And uh, in uh, 1930, Lancaster uh, uh, discovered the blood group. <coughs> in this way, many scientists who has worked in the field of medicine and the physiology, and they were the Nobel laureate. They were awarded the Nobel Prize. Conclusions of lectures in a nutshell. Contributions of Louis Pasha. Microbial theory of fermentations and proving that all the forms of life, including the microorganism, arises from their life, not spontaneously. The principle and the practice of sterilization was given by Louis Pasha. The initial bacteriological technique, how to grow a bacteria, was given by Louis Pasha. How to control a disease of silk worm is given by Louis Pasha. Development of vaccine against anthrax, chickenpox, and cholera. Contribution of Robert Koch. Robert Koch, Robert Koch, he has given the theory or jump theory of disease, introduction of staining technique for the visualization of microorganism, discovery of a solid medium in a bacteriology or for the growth of bacteria, he has discovered about the solid medium. Discovery of causative agent of tuberculosis, cholera and anthrax is use of laboratory animal for the experimental infection was given by Robert Koch. 
contribution of Paul Andrich, he has discovered the salvacin as a chemotherapeutic agent against syphilis. He opened a new field of antimicrobial agent which saved many millions of lives till date. He had identified that mycobacterium tuberculosis or a mycobacterium group of bacteria give the acid fastness, acid, acid fastness nature, proposed a theory for the production of antibiotic is antibodies which is known as the side chain theory. He refined the science of staining the microorganism. By staining the microorganism, we can better, better visualize the structures, the shape, its type, etc. Advocated the sterilization, standardization of biological, um, biologically including the toxin and antitoxin to ensure the uniformity. Contribution of many scientists and who are Nobel laureate in microbiology is first the advent of microscopy in 1934 by Rusk. He has uh, allowed the study of viruses, morphological exam uh, examination of viruses possible with the advent of electron microscopy. The first human diseases caused by virus were discovered by yellow paper, discovered as a yellow paper. The number of many numbers of Nobel laureate in medicine and physiology were awarded their prize for their work in microbiology and immunology. So in this way, the, the people have started working with microbiology and they had given a shape to work on that particular diseases and um, the way that we can work with a microorganism, how they cause the diseases and how we can treat the diseases. We're going to study about scope of medical microbiology. So in the previous lecture of the series, we have discussed about the history of medical microbiology. We have seen the involvement of different scientists and their work. So in this particular lecture, we will see what is the scope of medical microbiology in this present scenario. So let's get started with the topic and let's see the let's see what is a medical microbiology so if you talk about medical microbiology so it's the study of the of bacteria viruses my, fungi protozoa and algae which are collectively called as microorganisms and unlike microscopic organism that are readily visible which these require this uh, these require magnification to be seen with the help of a microscope so my, medical microbiology is nothing but it is the biological study of the microorganism microorganism you can say just as bacteria fungi protozoa viruses algae, that organism that are so tiny that you cannot see with the naked eyes so you need a certain instrument to visualize that uh, to see this uh, microorganism so that is known as microscope so in microbiology there are different uh, types of microscope let's say there are simple microscope there is a compound microscope electron microscope and uh, there are uh, uh, transmission emission electron microscope so there are different kinds of uh, microscopes that are present in the medical science to visualize these organisms that are so tiny. Now moving to the next that is what are microorganisms. So we all know that this microorganism means organisms that are so small that are so tiny that is present everywhere on this earth but we cannot see with our naked eyes. So a microorganism is a, uh, is one of a very diverse group of organisms that are typical, uh, typically are microscopic and occur as independent rapidly producing units that are collectively less complex than plant and uh, animal and exist almost everywhere. The easy way to remember these features is M for microscopic, I for independent unit c for complex r for rapid growth rates and o for omnipresent so if we talk about microorganisms so they are it is one of a very diverse group of organisms whenever i am saying diverse group so diverse group means that they have different characteristics every microorganisms have different physical as well as the chemical characteristics so they are very diverse in nature they are occur almost everywhere they don't need anyone they do they do not depend on anyone so they are independent they are rapidly producing if i am saying rapidly producing means they multiply very fast that is the reason they are found in so many numbers in, on this earth they are very uh, complex in a structure they are some are uh, simple uh, unicellular some are uh, you know means they have a very diverse uh, structure of themselves so as you compare microorganism with plants and animals then as compared to plants and animals they are relatively less less uh, and less complex than plants and animals that exist in this air oh, sorry on this earth but they are present everywhere right so easily if we talk about let's see this one the first one is microscopic. Microscopic means they are very tiny. They are very tiny. Independent units mean, means they do not depend on anyone. They are independent. Complex means they are very complex in their uh, stru structure or in their nature. Uh, some are, uh, you know, some are some have a very simple structure, some has a very complex structure. Then comes the rapid growth rate. Rapid growth rate means they are very, uh, they multiply very fast. The, the multiplication uh, uh, rates are very high. So, a rapid growth rates then the last one is omnipresent omnipresent means everywhere omni means everywhere so they are present everywhere if i am talking about uh, microorganisms so there are thousands and thousands of bacteria that are present on the on my skin on the surface of my skin if i say i am using right now a table in front of my table on the surface of the table there are thousands and thousands of microorganisms that are present in the atmosphere which are surround uh, which is surrounded uh, um, uh, we are surrounded by atmosphere isn't it so in this atmosphere there are thousands and thousands of microorganisms that are present so microorganisms make their way 
to be present on the earth they are present in soil they are present in water they are present on land they are present uh, on air uh, in the atmosphere and if i say the most have the favorable environment for the growth of microorganism is air and water right so air and water play plays a very uh, important role for their habitat because they are uh, they are mostly present in atmosphere and air now comes microbiology and patient so medical microbiology is concerned with uh, erythology pathologies laboratory diagnosis and treatment of infections in an individual with the help of uh, epidemiology and control of infection in the community the ideal bacteriological management of a patient with infectious diseases of the following steps establish of a clinical diagnosis isolation of a causative agent determination of antibiotic susceptibility in the laboratory administration of a effective drug monitoring of therapy measurement of antimicrobial agent in the body fluid and last is the confirmation of bacteriological cure so medical microbiology it is concerned with etiology pathogenesis laboratory diagnosis and treatment of infectious diseases so microbiology and patient how they are interrelated so this medical microbiology it plays a very important role in uh, while treating any infections of in an individual right so they they also you know sometimes they control the infections in the community this medical microbiology because it is a very uh, diverse uh, branch of of uh, you know uh, biology so how they they uh, uh, how they manage any the ideal bacteriology management of a patient consists of the following step the first one uh, is excuse me establishment of clinical diagnosis then comes the isolation of consecutive agent then comes the determination of uh, Anti uh, antibiotic susceptibility in uh, laboratory and administration of effective drug monitoring of therapy measurement of antimicrobial agent in the body fluid and last is the confirmation of bacteriological cure then comes the microbiology and healthy individual immuno uh, profiles uh, uh, is against a large number of infectious diseases has now become an established practice the development and testing of these vaccine in human beings fall within a domain of mi microbiology laboratory so see human beings are surrounded by so many diseases so many infectious diseases that now it becomes a very established practice so the distance, so the development and the testing of these vaccines so obviously if there is any diseases right so against that diseases you need a drug you need a vaccine to cure that uh, diseases so the development and testing of these disease uh, vaccines in human beings so they fall in the domain that is a microbiology laboratory let us understand this in detail with the help of a covid virus so covid virus that is a covid-19 virus that came into existence in 2020 so it is a virus that is a, you know that is creating a very you know uh, adverse effect on humans so we are, so the uh, so it is very communicable diseases if uh, one person is uh, is having a is covid-19 uh, then if uh, any person came in contact with that particular person that all person can also uh, get a huge uh, you know you can say effect of that covid virus and it uh, the patient is known as a covid virus for the patient right so this corona virus that is covid 19 is also because of a microorganisms right so after uh, we have seen what is the uh, effect of uh, the corona virus what is the characteristic of a patient that is having a corona virus how it is affecting a person so against that corona virus what scientist has done scientist has developed a vaccine right there are vaccines that are that works uh, to cure that particular infections and now that uh, the medical science has launched that vaccine in the uh, uh, right so the, after launching everyone has uh, the vaccine booster shots in, on themselves and we have cured the corona virus right so every every you can say uh, for every infection there is a particular vaccine if you see uh, when a child born so there are number and number of vaccines that are uh you know that are very compulsory for uh, a parent uh, to have that uh, vaccine uh, in their ch children why because that vaccine is uh, something that uh, you know fight against the infectious diseases right one of the very common is polio virus uh, vaccine one is very hepatitis vaccine i mean there are different of sometimes uh, there are you know different types of uh, uh, vitamin a vaccines and there are different types of vaccines that are present just to uh, cure a large number of infection in children now comes the branches of microbiology so if we see what are the branches of microbiology then the first one is bacteriology so since the name suggests bacteriology so bacteriology it is the study of bacteria the smallest simplest single celled organism so what is bacteriology so bacteriology is a science that study the bacteria what is bacteria so bacteria is the smallest simplest single celled called organisms so all the study of bacteria came under bacteriology then comes the micro 
माइकोलॉजी सो माइकोलॉजी इज द स्टडी ऑफ फंजाय विच इंक्लूड्स बोथ माइक्रोस्कोपिक फॉर्म दैट इज मोल्ड एंड ईस्ट एंड लार्जर फॉर्म दैट इज मशरूम राइट सो माइकोबायोलॉजी माइकोलॉजी इज द स्टडी ऑफ फंजाय फंजाय मीन्स इट इंक्लूड्स द बोथ दैट इज अ माइक्रोस्कोपिक फॉर्म ऑल्सो दैट इज दैट कंटेन्स मोल्ड एंड ईस्ट एंड अ लार्जर फॉर्म दैट इज अ मशरूम सो मशरूम इज ऑल्सो अ फंजाय राइट बट दैट फंजाय यू कैन सी विद योर नेकेड एल्स सो अगेन द स्टडी दैट डील्स विद विद द लार्जर फॉर्म ऑफ फंजाय दैट इज मशरूम इज ऑन एस माइकोलॉजी as well as the science that deals with the uh, microscopic form that is mold and yeast is also included under the mycology then comes the parasitology uh, it is uh, the study of parasites which traditionally includes the pathogenic protozoa and helminths so what is it it is the study of the parasite so whenever you want to study uh, a parasite so that study is known as parasitology then comes the virology so since the name suggests virology means viruses whenever you want to study virus what, uh, uh, what which branch of science deals with the study of virus it is a virology so study of virus minute minute that is unicellular particles that uh, uh, parasitize living things it is known as virology then uh, is the immunology system of body defense that protect against infection the science include serology a discipline that tests the product of immune reaction in blood serum and help in the diagnosis of infectious diseases so what is uh, immunology so immunology it is a vast branch of science that is dealing with the defense system uh, uh, in our body means it is a it is a defense system because our body okay so in our body there are thousands and thousands of diseases right so to uh, fight against that diseases the science immunology play an important role why it protect our body uh, against the infection so this science includes serology a uh, discipline that tests the product of immune re reaction in the blood serum and what it is doing it is helping and diagnosis of infectious diseases then comes the माइक्रोबियल टेक्सोनॉमी सो माइक्रोबियल टेक्सोनॉमी अगेन इट इज द स्टडी ऑफ क्लासिफिकेशन नेमिंग एंड आइडेंटिफिकेशन ऑफ माइक्रो ऑर्गेनिज्म सो वेन एवर यू वॉन्ट टू स्टडी द क्लासिफिकेशन ऑफ एनी माइक्रो ऑर्गेनिज्म हाउ द माइक्रो ऑर्गेनिज्म इज नेम हाउ दे आर आइडेंटिफाइड सो द साइंस दैट इज डीलिंग विद दैट इट इज अ मेडिकल टेक्सोनॉमी देन कम्स दायो टेक्नोलॉजी सो दिस बायो टेक्नोलॉजी दिस डिसिप्लिन इंक्लूड्स एनी प्रोसेस इन विच ह्यूम यूज सिस्टम और प्रोसेस ऑफ ऑर्गेनिज्म टू अराइव अ डिजायर प्रोडक्ट सो बायो टेक्नोलॉजी इज अगेंस्ट अ बायो प्लस टेक्नोलॉजी इट इंक्लूड एनी प्रोसेस इन विच द ह्यूमन इट यूजेस द सिस्टम or you can say a process of organism to arrive at a desired product means if you want to make a desired product by using the uh, recombinant dna or you can say if you want to uh, you know uh, 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 make a desired product by uh, you know uh, by providing a different uh, properties to that particular thing so you can get a desired product and this science is is known as biotechnology then comes the genetic engineering so genetic engineering and recombinant DNA technology is the most powerful and rapidly growing area in the modern bio microbiology which involves the techniques that is deliberately alter the genetic makeup of an organism to introduce a new compounds different genetic com uh, combination and e and even unique organism so what is genetic uh, engineering and recombinant recombinant DNA technology so it is the most powerful and rapidly growing modern area in modern bi microbiology why because it involves the techniques that uh, alter the genetic makeup of organism and after they are altering the genetic makeup of an organism so it they it in produce a new compound that is having a different genetic combination and even a unique organism then comes the role of medical microbiology so what is the sorry what is the role of medical microbiology the first is the confirmation of diagnosis which helps in the starting specific treatment detection of a new patho pathogens determination of antimicrobial susceptibility pattern development of vaccine and immuno immunotherapeutic agents development of newer antimicrobial uh, biocides to trace the source and reservoir of uh, infections to trace the root of spread of pathogen using epi uh, epidemiological marks such as gene sequencing development of newer regime treatment schedules monitor monitoring of changing profile of pathogen detection of is uh, is symptomatic infection of chronic carriers distinction between recent and past infection help in monitoring and response to treatment monitoring the quality of air water and food so in this area microbiology medical microbiology plays a very important role whenever you want to monitor the quality of air whenever you are you want to monitor the quality of food product water pro uh, water food so yeah, the role of medical microbiology plays an important role apart from this uh, it also helps in the development of vaccines and immunotherapeutic agents so it uh, also trains the resource of uh, or reservoirs of infection so it plays a very important role in uh, different areas that are related to any infectious diseases in treating any past infections right in uh, treating any chronic uh, carriers so it plays a very important role so this is all about the scope of medical microbiology i hope you have understood the lecture if any queries related to this uh, lecture you can simply ask uh, and you can leave your queries in the comment section below in the next lecture if i find any query i'll be answering all the queries and student 
Uh, as far as this topic is concerned, some are very important questions can be asked in the examination. The first one would be, what is a medical microbiology? And um, uh, yeah, well, you, they can also ask you about what is the ideal bacteriological management of a patient? With infect, uh, what are the different steps? So this is the answer. Then uh, uh, they can also ask you about uh, the branches of microbiology. Sometimes they uh, in MCQs, uh, they can ask you the study of uh, uh, fungi, which includes both uh, microscopic form as well as larger form. It is known as, then the answer would be mycology. Sometimes they can ask you about uh, defined immune or virology so you have to go through all the branches of microbiology in detail so this is about then uh, this question plays uh, uh, there a uh, place in the question paper that is the what is the role of medical microbiology so you have to uh, uh, remember any five or six point of this so according to this uh, you can answer we are going to start with a new unit that is cellular and molecular microbiology in this unit we are going to learn about the morphology of microorganism the uh, growth of microorganism bacteriophages etc and this would be your third chapter and in this chapter we are going to learn about the bacterial morphology how the bacteria look like right so we start with a bacteria what is a bacteria 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 are uh, omnipresent in our last unit we had learned about bacteria microorganisms are omnipresent they are microscopic nature they are unicellular etc right so bacteria is also a unicellular microorganism which are prokaryotic in nature of course they are microscopic they are very small in size we cannot see them with our naked eyes and we can see them we can see um, this microorganism or a bacteria through a microscope only bacteria is a microorganism which are found everywhere in the environment from a deep sea vent to the below of the earth surface truth and even in our digestive system also to understand the sizes, how, what is the size of bacteria, we need to know the measurement unit used in microbiology. So, uh, let's, let us learn about the measurement unit. The unit of measurement used in bacteriology or maybe in a microbiology is a micron. And also, these microns are also called as a micrometer. One micrometer is one thousandth of a millimeter, one mini micron. And is a or a nanometer is a one thousandth of a micron or one millionth of the millimeter. One Armstrong is one tenth of a nanometer, and one millimeter is equal to one thousandth of a meter. This micron has a sign is denoted by a sign called as a mu. So today in this lecture we will going to study about nutrition and and growth of bacteria part one. This is another topic of medical microbiology. So as far as the series of medical microbiology is concerned, we have completed what is the scope of medical microbiology. What is the history of medical microbiology? So today we will going to study about what is the nutrition and growth of bacteria. So whenever we are talking about bacteria, so bacteria is a very minute creature that is present on this earth. So if we are talking about bacteria, so they are so tiny that you cannot see them with the naked eyes. So you need certain instrument to visualize microorganism that is a bacteria, right? So and what is the growth of bacteria how bacteria is uh, uh, you know have uh, their growth how they uh, how fast do bacteria grow what is the bacterial growth curve and about the nutrition we will going to discuss about uh, what are what is nutrition why nutrition is needed for any microorganism what are the uh, you know what are the two categories uh, that are very essential uh, nutrient that are required by the microorganisms what are the oxygen and carbon dioxide that plays an important role um, for the bacteria whereas there are different kinds of uh, uh, different organisms depending upon the oxygen and uh, carbon dioxide uh, site content and then we will going to study about temperature how temperature play an important role uh, for the growth of bacteria right so in this uh, topic we are going to discuss all these things so the first one says introduction that is bacteria have well established uh, requirement of proper nutrient uh, nutrients oxygen ph and temperature nutrition is the process by which the, which chemical substance called nutrients are required for the surrounding environment and used in our cellular activities such as metabolism and growth so what is nutrition so nutrition is a process by which a chemical substance any chemical substance that is called as nutrients that are required for the surrounding environment and is used in the cellular activity. Cellular activity means the metabolism and the growth. Bacterial growth refers to an increase in bacterial cell number multiplication which results from a programmed, programmed increase in the biomass of bacteria. Growth usually occurs asynchronously that is all cells do not divide at precisely the same moment. So if we talk about this, so nutrition, what is nutrition? It is a chemical process. Uh, it, uh, it is a process by which any chemical substance, any chemical substance means nutrients that are required for the uh, surrounding environment that is used in the cellular activity. Whenever it is a cellular activity, then cellular activity simply means 
एक्टिविटी सेलुलर एक्टिविटी सिंपली मीन्स सच एस मेटाबॉलिज्म एंड ग्रोथ मीन्स फॉर एन ऑर्गेनिजम्स वी ऑल हैव अ सेल्युलर एक्टिविटी इन आवर इन आवर बॉडी सेल्युलर मीन्स सेल सो द एक्टिविटीज दैट इज गोइंग टू हैपन इन आवर सेल इज नोन एज सेल्युलर एक्टिविटी दैट टोटली रिफर टू एज अ मेटाबॉलिज्म एंड ग्रोथ सो द बैक्टीरियल ग्रोथ हाउ बैक्टीरियल वॉट इज बैक्टीरियल ग्रोथ सो बैक्टीरियल ग्रोथ रिफर्स टू द इंक्रीज इन द बैक्टीरियल सेल bacterial cell means how bacteria is multiplying itself how they are uh, increasing the their growth rate how they are increasing their uh, rate is known as uh, bacteria uh, bacterial cell number that result from a program increased in the biomass of the bacteria means how the bacteria is increasing how the biomass of bacteria is uh, increasing is known as bacterial growth so growth usually occurs asynchronously means all the cell do not divide at a same moment means every cell divide at they are appropriate moment now moving to the next that is nutrients so if we talk about nutrients so nutrients are are divided into two categories that is macronutrients and micronutrients so since the name suggests macro so macro are required in relatively large quantity so if i say macro so macro uh, is relatively a large quantities and play a principal role in the cell structure and metabolism so in this a large quantity is required and it play a principal role how they are playing a principal role in the cell structure and metabolism then coming to the micronutrients so micronutrients mean sometimes called as a trace in uh, element and are needed in much smaller amount for enzyme and pigment structure and function so macro molecule is required for cell structure and metabolism so i am marking here you can see uh, this a uh, macro molecule uh, if we talk about the macro molecule so they are required for the cell structure as well as for the metabolism as far as micronutrient is concerned sometimes called as a trace and element and are needed in much smaller amount uh, for enzyme and pigment structure and function so it is required in a much uh, smaller amount and it is uh, only required you know, for the uh, enzyme and pigment structure and their functions right then comes the mode of nutrients of microorganisms so mode of nutrients nutrients provide energy to maintain functions and matter to build and repair the structure so what is nutrient so nutrients uh, what they do if we see the mode of nutrition of uh, microorganism then what is a nutri uh, nutrition nutrition obviously we all know that this nutrition provide uh, energy to maintain functions and uh, matter to build and repair the structure right so is uh, uh, our body needs nutrition for the proper growth and development same as with bacteria same as with other microorganisms so nutrition provide um, plays a very important or you can say a very major role in maintaining uh, uh, maintaining the functions of the body in providing the energy to the body in building up uh, and re repairing of the structures of our, of our body or uh, here we are talking about microorganisms so for that so uh, as far as the building and repair of the structure of the microorganism so uh, nutrition play a very important role so far the nutrition is divided into two categories that is autotrophic nutrition and heterotrophic nutrition so autotrophic nutrition is a manufacturing of uh, organic molecule from co2 and source of energy heterotrophic means obtaining nutrients from the complex food molecule by the process of digestion so auto means self and hetero means depending upon the other so here the uh, autotrophic nutrition what it uh, what is it it is manufacturing the organic molecules how they are manufacturing from co2 and the source of energy whatever the, uh, be the source of energy then heterotrophic they are obtaining nutrients from the complex food a complex food may they uh, what they do they break down the food and um, they obtain the nutrients from them uh, and um, they uh, food molecule by which by the process of digestion digestion means by breaking the food into a very sm uh, simplest form right so further the autotrophic nutrition is further divided into two categories that is photosynthetic microorganisms and the chemosynthetic microorganism so if you talk about the uh, photosynthetic microorganism so what they are doing here they are using energies from the sunlight to synthesize uh, foods substances so photo means light so photosynthetic organ microorganisms are those organisms that uses the sun as the source of energy or you can say that they, they uses light as a source of energy and uh, with the use of this energy they are synthesizing the food right food substances so and that food substances uh, is uh, utilized for the uh, growth and development of the uh, structure of any microorganism so those organisms that uses light is known as photosynthetic organisms then comes the chemosynthetic chemosynthetic microorganisms are those organisms that uses energy from the chemical reactions as the name says just chemosynthesis so they are uh, they utilize energy in uh they uh, you know they uses energy from the chemical substance to synthesize food substances then comes the heterotrophic nutrition uh, so the first is the sapro uh, sept uh, septrotrophic uh, microorganism and second is the parasitic microorganism so septro septrophytic microorganism secretes uh, enzymes onto the external organic matter and absorb soluble products that is a nutrients then parasitic uh, or pathogenic microorganisms they live uh, on or in a host organism and fed on its organic matter causing harm that is causing a disease so this is 
about the mode of nutrients now, now moving to the next that is oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, side then the need of oxygen for a particular bacterium reflects its mechanism to meet the requirement of energy on the basis of uh, this uh, bacteria have been divided into two categories so we all know that this oxygen play a very important role in the survival of any organism so here the need of organ uh, oxygen uh, for a particular bacterium it refers uh, uh, it reflects its mechanism uh, mechanism in the sense to meet the requirement of the energy right so on the basis of this bacteria is divided into two groups the first is aerobe and second is micro aerophile aerobe means aerobic organisms that grow well in the presence of a normal atmosphere oxygen an organism cannot grow without oxygen is ob uh, obligate aerobe most fungi protozoa and many bacteria such as genus bacillus are strictly aerobic in the metabolism so if we talk about the aerobic organisms so they grow well in the presence of a normal atmospheric oxygen as the name suggests aerobe means they need oxygen for the uh, for their uh, proper growth so the organism um, cannot grow without so under aerobic organisms are those organisms in simple word i am saying so they need oxygen for the proper growth right so no organism under this heading cannot uh, survive cannot grow without oxygen so most of the fungi protozoa and bac many bacteria uh, uh, such as the bacillus are strictly aerobic in the metabolisms now coming to the micro aerophilic so they does not need the atmospheric tension so they does not grow at a normal atmospheric tension but require a very small amount of uh, oxygen in metabolism they need but as compared to the aerobic uh, organism they need a very small quantity of um, uh, this uh, atmospheric tension and uh, a very small amount of oxygen that is needed for the metabolism so they does not grow at the proper uh, or you can say normal atmospheric tension so examples as antinomycetes uh, uh, israeli and uh, uh, triponema pallidum is the example of uh, uh, micro aerophile so moving to the next uh, that is Aero, uh, aero tolerant microbes so the next is the aero tolerant microbes so they do not utilize oxygen but can survive in its presence these organisms are not killed by oxygen mainly because they are, they, uh, they possess alternative mechanism for breaking down the peroxides and superoxide so they display pasture effects uh, in which the energy needs of the cell are met by consuming less oxygen under the respiratory metabolism than under a fermentive metabolism so what is aero uh, aero tolerant micro anaerobes so, so they do not utilize oxygen but they can survive in its presence right so aero tolerant means they do not need oxygen for their growth but if oxygen can is present in a small amount but they can survive they can tolerate the presence of oxygen right so why uh, is it so because uh, of, uh, because they are breaking down the peroxide and superoxides uh, it is an uh, alternative mechanism uh, so because of this they can tolerate the presence of oxygen now moving to so they display the pasture effects pasture uh, effect is in which the energy that is needed by the cell are met by consuming less oxygen uh, less glucose under the respiratory me metabolism than under the fermentative metabolism then coming to the examples are lactobacilli and aerobic uh, streptococci then comes to the anaerobe anaerobe is a an anaerobic uh, organism that does not grow in a normal atmospheric oxygen but it lacks the metabolic enzyme system for using oxygen in respiration microbes killed or are inhibited by the oxygen are called strict or obligate anaerobes so what is anaerobic organism so they does not grow in normal atmospheric oxygen as the name suggests anaerobe means they do not need or uh, the proper oxygen right atmospheric oxygen they do not need but it lacks the metabolic enzyme system for using the oxygen in respiration so in respiration also they do not uh, need oxygen right so microbes killed or inhibited by oxygen are known as are called strict or oblate anaerobes so the example as are clostridium tentini so these are certain examples of anaerobic or anaerobic you can say organ anaerobic organisms now coming to the very important that is temperature so as stated earlier also for the proper growth of microorganism temperature play a very important role so most of the bacteria uh, you can say have a narrow range of temperature that is required for their optimum growth so beyond the ideal uh, beyond the ideal uh, range of temperature the growth is either reduced drastically or bizarre uh, or bizarre and are irregular morphological form are produced most of the bacteria have a narrow range of temperature requirement for their optimal growth beyond the ideal range of temperature the growth is either reduced drastically or bizarre and irregular morphology form are produced on the basis of the temperature required there are three groups of bacteria that are recognized so in this we have seen that most of the bacteria they need a very normal range for the growth for their optimal growth so beyond the ideal range of uh, the temperature so either the growth is drastically you know it uh, bacteria cannot survive or they can survive so depending upon the type of bacteria their uh, temperature uh, depends so most of the bacteria have a very narrow range uh, that is you can say 
uh, they have a very rare normal range for their growth. So depending upon this, they, we have the first category is psychrophilic. So psychrophilic uh, is an organism, is a microorganism that grow optimally below 15 degrees centigrade and is capable of growing at zero degrees centigrade. So psychrophilic are those organisms that grow optimally below 15 degrees. 15 degrees uh, below, they can grow. And they are capable at a zero degree temperature also. It is obligate with respect to the cold and generally cannot grow above 20 degrees centigrade. So they cannot grow up, up uh, if the temperature is raised from rise from 20 degrees centigrade. Above 20 degrees centigrade, they cannot grow. Room temperature is lethal to the organisms. So uh, then comes storage in the refrigerator, storage in the refrigerator incubates rather and then inhibits. They are really if ever pathogenic to men. Now uh, the next is the mesophiles. So mesophiles are those organisms that grow at a moderate temperature. Psychrophilic below 15 degrees centigrade up to two, uh, 0 degrees centigrade. They can grow. But mesophilic are organisms that grow on a very moderate temperature. So the optimal range is 20 to 40 degrees centigrade. Most of the human pathogens fall on this group. Then comes the thermo and uric microbes that can survive a short exposure to high temperature. But normally mesophiles are, are a common uh, contaminant of uh, heated or pasteurized food. Thermophile uh, again uh, is a thermo as the name suggests thermal means they these microbes that grow optimally at a temperature uh, that is greater than 45 degrees centigrade. Such heater loving microbes in, so in soil and water associated with volcanic activity and, uh, and in inhabited directly exposure to the sun. Most of the thermophiles are spore forming speci species of bacillus and clostridium and a smaller larger are the pathogens. So we have seen three types of microorganisms that grow in different kind uh, uh, range of temperature. So if uh, cyclophilics are those that grow uh, below uh, 15 uh, degrees centigrade up to 0 degrees centigrade. right? Then comes the mesophiles. So these organisms can easily grow uh, in the optimal range of being for 20 to 40 degrees centigrade. Thermophile is another microbes that grow, uh, uh, grow at a temperature greater than 45 degrees centigrade. So different temperature is needed for the microorganism to grow. And the last is the pH. As temperature is playing a very important role in the uh, growth of a bacteria, in the growth of any microorganism, in the survival of any microorganism, same as with the pH. So the pH of the medium of growth of bacteria has profound effect effect upon the multiplication of organisms. Most pathogenic bacteria require a pH of 7 to 7.2 to 7.6 for their optimal growth. Some bacteria can furnish in the presence of considerable degree of acidity and are termed acidophilic. Example are lactobacillus species, some are very sensitive. So this is all about the pH means most of the pathogenic uh, bacteria can grow up to 7.2 to 7.6 degree for their optimal growth. Some are considered as acid, uh, uh, degree of acidity and are known as acidophilic. So uh, lactobacillus species is another example of uh, this acidophilic and uh, they have a, uh, some are very sensitive to the pH. So this is all about uh, uh, the growth uh, and um, nutrition of uh, any microorganism. So this is the part one. So in the part two, we will going to uh, discuss about the bacterial growth curve, how bacteria is growing, how what is the curve, how uh, bacteria is uh, preparing themselves for the growth, what are the nutrients that are needed for the growth of bacteria. So hope you have understood the lecture. If any doubt uh, is there, please do uh, comment, uh, do provide a com uh, do provide your queries in the comment section below. Shape and sizes of bacteria. Bacteria are found mainly in the nature in the three sizes, three shapes, right? First shape is cocci co shape, second is bacilli shape, and third is spiral that is called as a spore acido chain. Cocci are the two spheres with a diameter ranging from 0 0.75 to 1.25 micrometer. On average is one micrometer. And cocci is a round circular shape. In our next slide, we are going to see the, how the size shapes are there. Coco bacillus is very short bacillus, and bacilli is ranges from two to ten times of their breadth. Whatever their uh, length is, length is two to ten times from their breadth, right? Vibrio is a comma shaped bacteria and spirochet is a spinal shaped bacteria. In this slide, we can see how the cocos is purple till this cocos. And the second one is a, a slight bigger than a cocos is a coco bacillus. And the, then bacillus, that is a cylindrical shape. Vibrio is a comma shaped bacteria. Spiral is a spiral. And the spirochet has a many coils are there. You can see many coils are there. That is a spirochet. This is a long curve bacteria. And they have, they can have as many as 20 coils in them, right? Various forms of bacteria. So this slide, we can understand so how the bacteria, various types of bacteria. This, the first, uh, thing that is a uh, bigger number A, you can see the diplococcus. Diplococcus means the cocci is present in a two form. Two uh, cocci are joined to form a diplococci. And streptococci is a chain of cocus. Streptococcus is a mass of cocci and bacillus is a cylindrical bacteria and coco bacillus. It is a cylindrical form but the shape is slight uh, spherical. Fusiform bacteria, the edges are fused together. Filamental bacteria, the filaments are present in the bacillus. And Vibrio, we already know it is a comma shaped bacteria spiral. Here also, the ends are fused somehow and it should look like a spiral. Right? Coils are present in them. And in the J, J figure, you can see in the J figure, Sarcina, it is a cluster of cocci, you know, four, four cluster, four cocci are joined to form a Sarcina. Sarcini. 
morphology of bacteria. This is the general morphology of bacteria. Here we can see the cell wall, plasma membrane, capsule, the basal bodies are present and therefore their movement, fragilized presence, ribosome, cytoplasmic pili, cytoplasmic exclusions, and of course the heart is nucleus, nucle nucleoid. That in this nucleoid, the DNA or the genetic material is present. In, for, in elaborated form, we are going to learn this element. In this chapter, as shown in a figure, bacteria have a cell, the surface adherent that is known as a capsule or a slime, appendages that is fragile and fibrinae, cell walls, cytoplasmic structures that is a plasma or a cytoplasmic membrane, mesosome, ribosome, polyamine, cytoplasmic granule, nucleus, etc. So, we are going to learn in detail about this uh, uh, morphological forms which are present in bacteria. First, we, learn, we are going to learn about the appendages. Right? Appendages uh, is uh, in bacteria, two types of appendages are present. First is fragilla. This is also called as an organ of locomotion. Organisms which are motile through fragilla, the organisms which are motile through fragilla are the brio, spiral, and spiral sheets. A bacterial fragilla is made up of several thousands of molecules of unit called as a fragilla. Fragilla is made up of locomotion. And this fragilla is made up of vibrio, spiral, and spiral sheets. Fragilla is made up of fragilla. It is made up of thousands of thousands of proteins of unit, which thousands of molecules of milk. That is a fragilla protein. And this is made up of bacterial fragilla. Bacterial fragilla is made up of bacterial fragilla. That is 3 to 20 micrometer. And this is made up of diameter. That is a dia. 0.01 to 0.013 micrometer. The fragilla antigen. होते हैं डेट एंटीजन इस ओनर से एच एंटीजन और हाउच एंटीजन राइट उसके बाद हम देखते हैं how the fragilla look like anatomy dekhte hain iski fragilla mein ye jo first part hai this is whole the whole structure is a fragilla fragilla mein ek hook hota hai the upper jo bahar nikla hua hai that is the hook structure ye capsule aur cell wall ke andar ja ke ye andar gada hua hota hai taki wo strength de edam nikal na jaye strength de and that is a hook hook ke andar mein ek outer ring hoti hai aur ek inner ring the outer ring you can see in the green color and inner ring in the pink color ye up to cytoplasmic membrane tak gadi hui hoti hai andar mein to ye kya hai embedded rehta hai aur ye jo filament hai ye bahar ki taraf nikla hai and this is the organ of locomotion अरेंजमेंट और बैक्टीरिया के फ्रेजिलम के अरेंजमेंट के अनुसार भी हम बैक्टीरिया को डिवाइड करते हैं कुछ कैटेगरीज में अगर उसमें एक फ्रेजिला है देन वी विल कॉल एज अ मोनोट्रिकस अगर पूरे फ्रेजिला उस बैक्टीरिया को सराउंड किया देन इट इज नोन एज अ पेरिट्रिकस अगर एक एक एंड पे ही सारे बहुत सारे फ्रेजिला प्रेजेंट है देन इट इज अ लोफोट्रिकस लोफोट्राइकस एंड अगर दोनों साइड में एक एक प्रेजेंट है देन इज अ एम्फीट्राइकस और अगर एक भी प्रेजेंट नहीं है फ्रेजिला में तो एक ट्राइकस इन दिस वे वी क्लासीफाई बैक्टीरिया ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ फ्रेजिल फ्रेजिलम प्रेजेंस इन दैम राइट और अगर पोलर फ्रेजिलेटेड बैक्टीरिया है तो उसकी जो मोबिलिटी है वो बहुत ज्यादा रहेगी विब्रियो के केस में वो बहुत फास्ट मूव करता है ट्वेंटी माइक्रोमीटर की जो डिस्टेंस है वो एक सेकंड में वो पूरी कर लेता है और हर एक फ्रेजिला जैसे ही हर एक जेंड्रा में बैक्टीरिया का कोई भी जेंड्रा है जेंड्रा टू जेंड्रा फ्रेजिला का जो केमिकल कम्पोनेंट है वो डिफेंट करता है यही बनाता है उसको एंटीजेनिकली डिफेंट एक बैक्टीरिया दूसरे बैक्टीरिया एंटीजेनिकली डिफेंट फ्रेजिला के केमिकल कम्पोनेशन के बेसिस भी भी होता है पिलाई के नाम से भी जानते हैं और इसको पिलस भी कहते हैं इट इज अयर लाइक स्ट्रक्चर अभी हमने देखा कि फ्रेजिला बहुत बड़ा लंबा सा एक स्ट्रक्चर है जो कि लोकोमेशन के लिए हेल्प करता है पिलस भी है तो पिलस पूरे बॉडी में छोटे 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 जैसे आप देखते हैं ब्रश में छोटे छोटे निकले रहते हैं ब्रश के तार वैसे ही सेम पिलस रहता है एक बैक्टीरिया के ऊपर में जनरली ये हमको देखने को मिलता है ग्राम नेगेटिव बैक्टीरिया में अभी आप लोगों को शुरू के लेक्चर्स में मैंने बताया हुआ था कि ग्राम नेगेटिव है ना ग्राम पॉजिटिव बैक्टीरिया तो ज्यादातर हमको पिलाई किसमें देखने को मिलता है ग्राम नेगेटिव बैक्टीरिया में द ओनली ग्राम पॉजिटिव बैक्टीरिया इच एज दिस पिलाई ऑनली बैक्टीरियम जनरली ज्यादातर पिलाई ग्राम नेगेटिव बैक्टीरिया में मिलते हैं ग्राम पॉजिटिव में नहीं मिलते हैं एक्सेप्शन है ग्राम नेगेटिव ग्राम पॉजिटिव में मिलते हैं कॉनी बैक्टीरियम जिन्हें दिन फिब्रने आर द ऑर्गन विच हेल्प बैक्टीरियन एडरिंग टू द सर्फिस ये एक फिब्रने एक ऐसा ऑर्गन है जो कि मूवमेंट तो कराता है या थोड़ा बहुत उसके साथ में ये सेल सर्फिस के एडरेंस में काम आता है अगर पिलाए है तो वो दूसरे बैक्टीरिया के अटैचमेंट में काम आता है तो ये बेसिक डिफ्रेंसेस होता है अगर ये फिब्रने है देन इट हेल्प टू अटैच द बैक्टीरिया इन द सर्फेस ऑफ एनीथिंग और अगर पिलाए है तो सिर्फ ये बैक्टीरिया से बैक्टीरिया के से अटैचमेंट करने में मदद करता है जैसे कि हमने देखा कि प्रजिला प्रजिलिंग प्रोटीन से बनाता है वैसे ही पिलाई पिलिंग प्रोटीन से बना होता है पिलाई ऑफ डिफरेंट बैक्टीरिया एंटीजेनिकली प्रजिला में भी वैसे ही था डिफरेंट बैक्टीरिया में एंटीजेनिकली वो डिस्टिंट होते थे और जब भी वो किसी बॉडी एंटर करते हैं तो ये फॉर्मेशन एलिसेट करते हैं एंटीबॉडी फॉर्मेशन में किसी भी पोस्ट के अंदर पर ज्यादा फंक्शंस ऑफ पिलाई पिलाई के मेनली फंक्शंस होते हैं एडिशंस में चिपकने के लिए ताकि वो न्यूट्रिशनल जो न्यूट्रिशन कंटेंट है या कंपोजिशन है वो दूसरे से या एनवायरमेंट से ले सके अंदर में और इनका एक और है जेनेटिक ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन एक बैक्टीरिया से दूसरे बैक्टीरिया में कॉन्जुकेशन और कॉलोनाइजेशन अगर बैक्टीरिया को अपनी कॉलोनी ग्रोथ करनी है तो उसको एक जगह नहीं चिपकना होगा नहीं तो वो बह जाएगा या कहीं पर जो डिस्ट्रॉय हो जाएगा नीचे फॉर कॉलोनाइजेशन ऑफ बैक्टीरिया ऑल्सो पिलाई हेल्प सेल वो सेल वोल क्या काम करता है सेल वोल जो है मेनली इज आउटर सर्फिस ये एनवलप है पोर्शन ऑफ सेल एनवलप और ये एक्सटर्नल में साइटोप्लाजमिक मेम्ब्रेन में और इंटरनल में कैप्सूल से बना हुआ है ग्लाइकोपैलिस को कहते हैं केमिकल कम्पोजिशन जो होती है मेनली फॉर्म ऑफ ग्लूकोपेक्टाइल और
मेजर अटैचमेंट ऑफ पेप्टीडो ग्लाइकिन इंक्लूडिंग द टेकोइक एसिड और यही सब चीजें ग्राम नेगेटिव बैक्टीरिया में प्रेजेंट तो रहते हैं डिस्टेंट थोड़ा सा डिफरेंट रहता है पर लूजली अरेंज रहते हैं ग्राम पॉजिटिव में ये बहुत ज्यादा मात्रा में और अच्छे से अटैच रहते हैं और ग्राम नेगेटिव में दे आर वेरी डिस्टेंट एंड लूजली अरेंज लिया ये एक बेसिक डिफरेंस है ग्राम पॉजिटिव और ग्राम नेगेटिव के बीच में और इन दिस वे वी क्लासिफाई ग्राम पॉजिटिव एंड ग्राम नेगेटिव बैक्टीरिया ऑन द प्रेजेंस ऑफ द सेल वॉल देखिए इसमें आप देख सकते हैं कि जो सेल वॉल है इसमें आपको दिखेगा एक लेयर लेयर ग्रीन जो लेयर आपको दिख रही है फर्स्ट वाला देखिए पैक्टीडो ब्लैक एंड रेड उसके बीच में जो व्हाइट एक रेड और ग्रीन के बीच में पेरी प्लाजमिक स्पेस एंड जो रेड वाला है साइटो प्लाजमिक मेमरी जो थर्ड थर्ड फिगर है उसमें देखिए ए एंड बी सेल वॉल ए इज ग्राम पॉजिटिव सेल वॉल एंड बी इज ग्राम नेगेटिव इसमें आप ऊपर वाली लेयर देखिए उसमें देखेंगे कि आप जो क्रॉस लिंक है पर्पल कलर से थर्ड सेकंड वन इज पेप्टीडो ब्लैक एंड ग्रीन कलर से सेल वॉल इज सेल मेम्ब्रेन इज अ रेड कलर अब इसमें देखिए ग्राम नेगेटिव में ऊपर वाली जो लेयर है लिपोपोलिसेड उसके बाद पॉसिबिलिपेड आता है उसमें फिर लिपोपोलिस पेप्टीडोग्लाइकिन जो है वो बहुत कम है इसमें बहुत थिक है इसमें बहुत थिन है और जो सेल मेम्ब्रेन है उसमें भी एक बराबर ही है पर मेनली द डिफ्रेंसेज ऑफ करे ना पेप्टीडोग्लाइकिन से कोई कैसे प्रेजेंट है ग्राम पॉजिटिव में ग्राम नेगेटिव में नहीं है उसकी जगह में क्या है लिपोप्रोटीन है पॉसिबोलिपेड है एंड लिपोपोलिसेड इट दिस आर दी बेसिक डिफ्रेंस बिटवीन अ ग्राम नेगेटिव एंड अ्राम नेगेटिव ग्राम पॉजिटिव सेल वॉल ऑफ अ बैक्टीरिया अब ये कैरेक्टरिस्टिक है जो मैं आपको बता चुकी हूँ कि पेप्टीडो ग्लाइकिन ग्राम पॉजिटिव में थिक रहता है ग्राम नेगेटिव में थिन रहता है और ऐसे फास्ट बैक्टीरिया जो रहते हैं ये ऐसे फास्ट बैक्टीरिया इसलिए है क्योंकि ये एक ऐसे फास्ट ट्रेनिंग है जो अपने अंदर लेते हैं ना ये वो ग्राम स्ट्रेनिंग ग्राम पॉजिटिव की तरह होते हैं ना ही ग्राम नेगेटिव वो थोड़े डिफरेंट बैक्टीरिया होते हैं ठीक है उसके बाद में है लिपिड ज्यादातर टीवी टूबोक्लोसिस के जो बैक्टीरिया होते हैं ऐसे फास्ट बैक्टीरिया लिपिड लिपिड लेयर जो रहती है थिन लिटिल रहती है आउटर मेम्रेन पॉजिटिव बैक्टीरिया में प्रेजेंट नहीं रहेंगी नेगेटिव बैक्टीरिया में प्रेजेंट रहेंगे वेरी क्लासिक स्पेसिस जो है वो ग्राम नेगेटिव बैक्टीरिया में प्रेजेंट है ग्राम पॉजिटिव में नहीं प्रेजेंट है और ऐसे पास में भी नहीं प्रेजेंट है सेल शेप बहुत रिजिड रहता है और ग्राम नेगेटिव का बहुत फ्लेक्सिबल रहता है थोड़ा रिजिड कभी कभी वो फ्लेक्सिबल भी रहता है पर हमेशा ग्राम पॉजिटिव हमेशा रिजिड रहेगा एंजाइम डाइजेशन इसके होता है प्रोटोप्लास इसमें है स्पेरोप्लास और डिफिकल्ट ऐसे पास बैक्टीरिया है वेरी वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू डाइजेस्ट सेंसिटिव टू एंटीबायोटिक एंड गाइस तो सबसे ज्यादा जो रहता है सेंसिटिव है ग्राम पॉजिटिव एंड ग्राम नेगेटिव उसके बाद में ऐसे पास फंक्शन ऑफ सेल्फ सेल्फ का क्या फंक्शन है ये तो सबसे पहले बैक्टीरिया को एक शेप प्रोवाइड करता है इसके बाद एक रिजिडिटरी देता है एक ऑर्गेनिज्म को एनवायरमेंटल जो हर हाल एनवायरमेंट है उसे वो प्रोटेक्ट करता है ठीक है उसके बाद में ये रिसेप्टर साइट है किसी भी फेजिस के लिए और ये ये एक्शन साइट है एंटीबॉडी के एक्शन एंटीबॉडी एंटीजन का जो एक्शन रिएक्शन होता है इसलिए ये साइट है सेल्फ और ये प्रोवाइड करता है अटैचमेंट टू भी कॉम्प्लीमेंट अगर हमारी बॉडी में चला गया तो कॉम्प्लीमेंट सिस्टम जो अटैच होगा एक्जिलेट होगा उसके लिए ये अटैचमेंट का प्रोवाइड करता है कंटेन अ कम्पोनेंट टॉक्सिक टू द होस्ट और इसमें कुछ कंपोनेंट ऐसे प्रेजेंट रहते हैं अगर किसी होस्ट अंदर में घुस गया है तो ये टॉक्सिक सब्सटेंस रिलीज करता रहेगा डिटरमाइन द ग्राम स्टेनिंग कैरेक्टर ऑन दिस बेसिस ऑफ द सेल वॉल हाउ द सेल वॉल इज उसके बेसिस पे हम ग्राम पॉजिटिव ग्राम नेगेटिव बैक्टीरिया को डिस्ट्रीब्यूट कर सकते हैं ग्राम स्टेनिंग का कैरेक्टर यही बताता है द साइट ऑफ एक्शन ऑफ अ कोलिशिन कोलिशिन के एक्शन के लिए भी सेल वॉल में ही सेल वॉल के ऊपर ही ये कोलिशिन का एक्शन होगा साइटोप्लाज्मिक स्ट्रक्चर नाउ वी आर गोइंग टू लर्न अबाउट द साइटोप्लाज्मिक स्ट्रक्चर इट इज अ डेलिकेट स्ट्रक्चर्स विच सेपरेट द रिजिड सेल वॉल फ्रॉम द कंटेंट ऑफ साइटोप्लाज्म ठीक है ये जो साइटोप्लाज्म है उसमें एक फ्यूचर स्ट्रक्चर रहता है जो भी कंटेंट प्रेजेंट है साइटोप्लाज्म के अंदर में उसको वो अलग करता है अब इसमें क्या रहता है प्लाज्मा मेम्ब्रेन आर टाइम में कॉन्स्टेंटली चेंज रहती है जो उसके ऊपर चीज बनी हुई है प्लाज्मा मेम्ब्रेन की सेलवॉल के अंदर में ये बहुत चेंज होती रहती है जिस हिसाब से बैक्टीरिया मूवमेंट करेगा उस हिसाब से कॉन्स्टेंटली चेंज रहती है ये ट्रांसपोर्ट को रेगुलेट करता है इन एंड आउट ऑफ द सेल और सिंथेसिस ऑफ सेल वॉल कंपोनेंट में भी हेल्प करता है सेलवॉल का अगर भी डैमेज है सेलवॉल तो उसके सिंथेसिस के न्यू कंपोनेंट के लिए भी हेल्प करता है डीएनए एप्लीकेशन में मदद करता है अपना साइटोप्लाज्मिक स्ट्रक्चर कुछ प्रोटीन से क्रिएट करता है रेस्पिरेशन उनके अंदर में होती है कैप्सल एनर्जी इन और एनर्जी को वो अपने अंदर में लेता है एटीपी जनरेशन जब भी होगा तो वो कुछ एनर्जी रिलीज करेगा उस एनर्जी को कैप्चर करने में भी साइटोप्लाज्मिक स्ट्रक्चर हेल्प करता है साइट ऑफ सटन एंटीबायोटिक्स दट इज पॉलिमिक्सिन ये बहुत सारे एंटीबायोटिक की एक्शन साइट्स होती हैं जैसे कि पॉलिमिक्सिन मिजोजोम्स मिजोजोम्स प्रिंसिपल साइट है रेस्पिरेटरी एंजाइम्स के लिए ये एनालॉगस है मतलब माइट्रोकॉन्ड्रिया के जैसे ही प्रेजेंस है ये साइटोप्लाज्मिक स्ट्रक्चर्स का एक पार्ट है दिस आर दी एसेंशियल इन ब्रिंगिंग अबाउट अ सेल डिवीजन मिजोजोम्स के थ्रू हम सेल डिवीजन का जो एक्शन है
polyamines. This type of poly, uh, the type of polyamine presents in the bacteria, the protein, is myridine, is myridine, and is permine. And these uh, are the polyamines, these are the produced by the bacteria, they present in the bacteria, mein, and uh, found associated with the bacterial DNA, ribosomes, and cytoplasmic membrane. So, polyamines are the same as bacterial DNA, they are the same as ribosomes, and cytoplasmic granules. Se. And cytoplasmic membrane is the same as cytoplasmic granules. Ke mein. Cytoplasmic granules are important in bacteria, and they are the same as cytoplasmic granules. And they are the same as cytoplasmic granules. They are the same as cytoplasmic granules. They are the same as cytoplasmic granules. They are the same as cytoplasmic एंड बेस अनरेस्ट वॉल्यूम ग्रेन्यूल्स ये जो ग्रेन्यूल है ये फूड रिजर्व्स के नाम से जाने जाते हैं मतलब कि अगर बैक्टीरिया को अपना फूड रिजर्व करना है तो दे आर इन दिस फॉर्म ग्लाइकोजन के फॉर्म में रहेंगे पॉलीहाइड्रोक पॉलीबीटा हाइड्रोक्सी ब्यूटरेट के नाम से ये बैक्टीरिया के बॉडी के अंदर में प्रेजेंट होते हैं व्हेनेवर दे नीड अ फूड मतलब अगर कुछ क्राइसिस कंडीशंस में है तब ये इसको यूटिलाइज करते हैं फॉर देयर सर्वाइवल न्यूक्लियर एपरेटस ये बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट है न्यूक्लियर एपरेटस इसके थ्रू क्या होता है बैक्टीरिया का अगर रिप्रोडक्शन हो रहा है तो एक जीनोम दूसरे जो एक जो बैक्टीरियल जीनोम है या बैक्टीरियल जेनेटिक मटेरियल है वो दूसरे बैक्टीरिया में ट्रांसफर होता है ठीक है वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट पार्ट ऑफ बैक्टीरिया बैक्टीरियल जीनोम कंसिस्ट ऑफ सिंगल मॉलिक्यूल और डबल स्टैंडर्ड डीएनए अरेंज इन सर्कुलर फॉर्म जो बैक्टीरियल जीनोम है उसके अंदर में डबल स्टैंडर्ड डीएनए प्रेजेंट रहेगा ये लीनियर फॉर्म में नहीं रहता है हमेशा कौन से फॉर्म में रहेगा सर्कुलर फॉर्म में रहेगा इन सर्टन कंडीशन अराउंड वन थाउजेंड माइक्रोमीटर एंड लेट द न्यूक्लियर रीजन इज बैक्टीरिया इज नॉट ऑर्गेनाइज कभी भी जो न्यूक्लियर रीजन रहता है वो नॉट एकदम फुली ऑर्गेनाइज स्ट्रक्चर नहीं रहता जैसे कि हमारे अंदर में रहता है कि वो राउंडेड है सर्कुलर फॉर्म में और हिस्ट्रोन के ऊपर में वो राउंड है नहीं रहता है
जो माइक्रोस्कोप्स यूज होते हैं माइक्रोबायोलॉजी लैब में दे आर हैविंग डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ डिफरेंट प्रॉपर्टीज होती है मेनली रिजोल्विंग पावर है रिजोल्विंग पावर एक ऐसा ऑप्टिकल सिस्टम है या फिर एक ऑप्टिकल ऐसा पावर है जो कि दो से दो ऑब्जेक्ट को डिस्टिंग कर सकता है अगर सेलवॉल है और साइटोप्लाजमिक मेमरीन है उस दोनों को क्या करेगा वो जितना अच्छा उसका रिजोल्यूशन प्रॉपर्टी रहेगा हम उसको रिजोल्व कर सकते हैं देख सकते हैं कितना मोटा हमारा सेलवॉल है सेल मेमरीन है और कितना हमारा साइटोप्लाजमिक मेमरी इन दिस वी वी कैन रिजोल्व तो अलग अलग माइक्रोस्कोप अलग अलग चीजों के लिए यूज है यू कैन सी इन द कम्पेरिजन बॉक्स इसमें ब्राइट फील्ड माइक्रोस्कोप है जिसकी मैंगी वेकेशन टू थाउजेंड एक्स है और उसके बाद में फिर ट्रांसमिशन इलेक्ट्रॉन माइक्रोस की जो मैंगीफिकेशन है दट इज अवन लैक और उसके बाद में फिर स्कैनिंग है तो स्कैनिंग का वन लैक है दट इज अटेन लैक ठीक है तो इस दिस वे जो माइक्रोस्कोप है अलग अलग माइक्रोस्कोप अलग अलग यूज के लिए हम यूज यूज करते हैं अलग अलग बैक्टीरिया के लिए अलग अलग अपना जिस टाइप की हमारी स्टडी है उस टाइप का माइक्रोस्कोप यूज करते हैं अब माइक्रोस्कोप अगर नॉर्मली हम लोगों ने उसको फर्स्ट रंग या जामेशन तो कर लिया अगर हमको कुछ स्पेसिफिकली देखना है तो हम उसको क्या करते हैं स्टेन करते हैं ये बैक्टीरिया को हमको जानना है कि अगर हम बिना स्टेन किए या बिना उसको कलर किए हम देखेंगे तो हमको एक बैक्टीरिया नॉर्मली सब बैक्टीरिया सेम देखेंगे पर अगर हमको बेटर रिजोल्यूट वे में क्लासिफिकेशन करना है तो हम क्या करते हैं माइक्रोबायोलॉजी में स्टेनिंग करते हैं तो सबसे पहले स्टेनिंग करने के लिए हमको क्या चाहिए कल्चर चाहिए कल्चर को हम स्मेयर बनाते हैं स्मेयर जो प्रोसेस है इसमें क्या होता है सबसे पहले इस प्रोसेस को रॉबर्ट कोश ने डेवलप किया था और ये हम बनाते हैं कि कोई भी रिपिट सस्पेंशन है जिसमें कल्चर मीडियम है उसको स्लाइड के ऊपर रखे हम फिर लेयर बनाते हैं उसको एयर डाई करते हैं प्रोसेस होता है स्मियरिंग उसके बाद हम फिक्सेशन करते हैं फिक्सेशन क्या है फिक्स करते हैं ताकि वो जो बैक्टीरिया वो बहे नहीं उसमें कोई दूसरा बैक्टीरिया आकर रहे नहीं तो इसके लिए हम उसको फिक्स करते हैं फिर दिस प्रोसेस इज नॉन हीट ड्राइंग जो होता है हीट ड्राइड स्मियर जो होते हैं उसको हम द प्रोसेस होता है फिक्सेशन फिक्सेशन के बाद हम स्टेनिंग में आते हैं स्टेनिंग एक प्रोसीजर है जिसमें हम कलर केमिकल डाइट डालते हैं स्मियर के ऊपर में और जिस तरीके की वो डाइट लेता है उस तरीके की बैक्टीरियल क्लासिफिकेशन हम कर देते हैं बेसिकली जो स्टेनिंग टेक्निक है डिपेंड अपन द पॉजिटिव एंड द नेगेटिव स्टेनिंग पॉजिटिव स्टेनिंग में क्या होता है कि कलर बाय डाई और नेगेटिव स्टेनिंग में इट्स अ कलरलेस बैकग्राउंड जो रहेगा वो स्टेन नहीं रहेगा पर नेगेटिव स्टेनिंग में जो बैकग्राउंड है वो कलर रहेगा आपका जिस तरह है वो कलर नहीं रहेगा डाई यूज बेसिक डाई यूज करते हैं नेगेटिव स्टेनिंग में एसिडिक डाई यूज करते हैं टाइप ऑफ स्टेनिंग बहुत टाइप के स्टेनिंग है पॉजिटिव स्टेनिंग करने के लिए नेगेटिव स्टेनिंग के लिए कुछ फ्यू टाइप्स है तो सिंपल स्टेन रिक्वायर सिंपल डाई एक अगर सिंपल स्टेन हमको करना है तो एक डाई करना है और एक डिफरेंशियल स्टेनिंग अगर है तो उसमें दो डिफरेंट कलर की डाई यूज होती है प्राइमरी डाई और काउंटर स्टेनिंग डाई ठीक है तो सिंपल स्टेनिंग में सिर्फ एक सिंगल डाई यूज होती है डिफरेंशियल स्टेनिंग में हम दो टाइप की कलर डाई यूज करते हैं पहला जो है दट इज अ प्राइमरी डाई और द सेकंड वन इज अ काउंटर स्टेनिंग And this way we perform the gram staining or acid fast staining procedure. सबसे पहले अगर gram staining को मैं आपको explain करूँ gram staining में crystal valine डाले crystal valine डालने के बाद में जो पूरा bacteria अगर उसमें present है तो वो कौन से color ले लेगा violet color ले लेगा फिर इसमें gram iodine डाले gram iodine डालने के बाद में कुछ bacteria हैं उस देखिए आप उसमें purple दिख रहे हैं और कुछ वो wash out हो रहे हैं उसके बाद acetone डालते हैं alcohol डालते हैं उसके बाद हम counter stain डालते हैं that is a methylene red. अब इसमें जो है purple color का जो आपको दिख रहा है iodine डालने के बाद में कुछ purple stain हुए हैं that is a gram positive और जो pink stain है methyl red जो ले रहा है that is a gram negative bacteria. तो एक culture में हम gram positive और gram negative bacteria gram staining के through देख सकते हैं और अभी ये है सेकंड जो प्रोसीजर आप देखेंगे दैट इज एसिड फास्ट स्टेनिंग इसमें हम स्लाइड लेते हैं स्लाइड के बाद में इसमें जो डालते हैं पहला जो डाई है कार्बर कार्बोल फ्यूजिन उसके बाद में हम स्ट्रीम करते हैं उसको हिलाते हैं स्मियर को उसके बाद एसिड एल्कोहल डाले फिर मिथिलीन ब्लू डाले एयर ड्राई किए अगर इसमें पिंक कलर का आपको देखेगा देन इट इज एसिड फास्ट बैक्टीरिया अगर आपको ब्लू कलर का दिखने लगे दट इज नॉन एसिड फास्ट बैक्टीरिया इन दिस वे क्लासीफाई दी एसिड फास्ट बैक्टीरिया एंड नॉन एसिड फास्ट बैक्टीरिया so today in this lecture we will going to continue about nutrition and growth of bacteria that is part 2 of the previous lecture so in the previous lecture we have seen what is nutrition what are the different sources of nutrition and which type of nutrition does microorganism need what are the different types of nutrients that are present and according to the characteristics that is whether it's a physical characteristics or the chemical characteristics different microorganism needs different mode of nutrition so in this particular lecture we will going to study about the second part that is a growth of bacteria so bacteria so let's see the introduction part bacteria do not have an obligatory life cycle so whenever adequate nutrition and conductive environmental factors are available a bacterium enlarges and eventually divides by binary fission to form two daughter cell the conversion of a parental cell into two daughter cell constitutes the bacterial life cycle and the time taken to complete one cycle is known as generation time or doubling time or replication time so we all know that this bacteria He, it has a very obligatory life cycle whenever uh, there is a adequate nutrients uh, or you can say nutrition and uh, um, the conductive environmental factors are there so it divide eventually it start dividing itself and it divide uh, through binary fission and it forms a two daughter cell right the conversion of parental cell into two daughter cell constitute the bacterial life cycle and the time taken to complete one cycle
two daughter cell right so if this is a bacteria so the bacteria has a cell wall it has a cell membrane and it has a elongated nucleotide so this nucleotide start dividing itself and the cell wall and membrane begin to form a transfer spectrum like this this is a bacteria it from here it is dividing itself and it is divided divide start dividing into a transfer septum then this transfer septum become a complete you are seeing this part this is a transfer septum and this is becoming a very complete one and further it is divided into two cells that is known as a daughter cell so the time taken from here to here is known as generation time or doubling time means this is one bacteria it will start dividing itself into two bacteria now how many bacteria are there one two three right so every time what it is doing it is doubling the population of the bacteria by dividing into two separate daughter cell and this whole process is known as binary fission of bacteria then coming to how fast do bacteria grow means how fast uh, the bacteria grow so compared to the growth rate of most of the other living things bacteria are notoriously speedy the average generation or you can say doubling time is 6 30 to 60 minutes under optimum condition longest generation time occurs in mycobacterium leperi that is 10 to 30 days most pathogens have relatively shorter doubling time salmonella enterides and spectrocococcus aureus both cause a food poisoning doubling in 20 to 30 minutes so how fast bacteria grow so as stated earlier also this microorganism whether it's a bacteria whether it's a fungi whether it's a, any microorganism so they are present in a very large amount on this earth right but as compared to other microorganisms this bacteria has a largest uh, you know doubling rate so they are present in a very huge amount you can say huge population of bacteria are there if you see the skin of your if you see the hand of your skin if you see the table if you see a wall atmosphere they, these all are surrounded we all are surrounded with the microorganism especially you can say bacteria right so this bacteria as compared to other microorganisms so it has a very uh, you can say a very uh, speedy doubling rate so if we take the average doubling rate so uh, a very average uh, doubling rate is 30, uh, 30 to 60 minutes in 30 to 60 minutes a single bacteria through binary fusion it doubles under the optimum condition and the longest uh, generation time is the mycobacterium um, lep lepari that is uh, is 10 to 30 days the maximum time is 10 to 30 days means a uh, one month it takes to double and what is the very shortest period is 30 to 60 minutes so most pathogen have relatively shorter doubling rate so as compared to any other uh, you can say bacteria uh, means all the pathogens all the microorganisms have relatively a very shorter doubling rate means 30 to 60 minute or 60 to 1 hour right salmonella entities and Spectrophylococcus or is both causes food poisoning and its doubling time is 20 to 30 minutes. Just imagine. So both these microorganisms they cause a food poisoning, right? And their doubling time is 20 to 30 minutes. So uh, to up to which extent this bacteria is doubling itself it means the minimum you can say time is 20 to 30 minutes. Means within a half an hour or within 20 minutes, the bacteria start doubling itself, right? <coughs> Now moving to the bacterial growth curve. So this growth curve is very important. This shows how bacteria, you know, grow. How bacteria, um, uh, this bacteria have a tendency to grow. So if you see this uh, bacterial growth in the presence of the fresh growth medium, bacteria show following four phases during the growth. The first one is the lag phase. Second is the logarithm, you can say log phase. Third is the stationary and last is death phase. So uh, I'm showing on the blank screen. So basically bacteria grow through four stages. If... Uh, if I draw a diagram for you, so if this is a curve, then bacteria grow like this. So this phase is known as the lag phase. This is known as log. This is stationary, stationary, and this is a death phase, or you can say the decline phase. So basically, bacteria is growing through four phases: lag, log, stationary, and death phase or you can say the decline phase now what are lag phase what is log phase what is a stationary and death phase let's discuss this so as we have seen this is a time and this is the bacteria then this is lag phase this is log phase log phase is also known as the growth phase this is a stationary phase and this is the death phase now let's see what is a lag phase so lag phase is the phase where organisms are getting used to the medium and physical condition that is they are inducing the necessary enzyme for the growth so lag phase is also known as the preparation phase okay so what is lag phase lag phase is nothing but it is a preparation phase and uh, in this lag phase uh, this um, microorganism or you can say this bacteria start using the, the uh, medium 
or you can say the physical condition it is a very preparative state where they utilize the uh, 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 any source of nutrition or they are getting ready just like a student before exam is getting ready for for, for the exam means he is doing preparations for the exams right so it is that phase where bacteria is ready to grow uh, show growth and it is a preparative uh, phase or where it uses the nutrients after this then comes the log phase log phase is also known as the growth phase so in this phase where the generation time is measured the more ideal condition the faster the growth up to the maximum growth rate for the species in this growth phase now bacteria is about to grow and in this particular phase it grow a very exponential uh, rate it grows a, in a very exponential rate right and and this uh, phase let me draw a uh, diagram for you in, like this so in this particular this you are seeing or i'll just show this in this phase means during the this rate the bacteria is of maximum growth here the maximum growth of bacteria take place so in examination also a question may arise in which phase the generation time of bacteria, bacteria or you can say in which phase bacteria growth becomes maximum so it is the log phase or you can say the growth phase now comes the stationary phase so during the stationary phase the number of new cells equals to the number of the dead cell means the number of new cell jitna number of new cell hoga is equal to the number of the dead cell so here the population or you can say the growth of bacteria uh, become uh, very means become equal means there is no increase in the viable cell right so here bacteria is uh, equal uh, the rate of bacteria is now very stationary there is no increase or decrease means both growth and death becomes equal so uh, this says during this phase the number of new cells equals equals uh, equals to the number of the dead cells so that there is no net increase in the viable cell uh, nutrients are becoming uh, depleted ph uh, ph is changing toxic waste are building up oxygen level are depleting because in the log phase because in the log phase maximum number of uh, you can say uh, this uh, uh, oxygen is used up so now in this particular phase there is no uh, you can say there is no uh, use of oxygen means the oxygen level is now becoming less means the oxygen is now completely it is now completely what it is doing this depleting now comes the last the one that is the death phase so the rate of death phase is faster than the generation means death may accelerate and become exponential so in the death phase the rate of death is faster than the regeneration means death becomes more as compared to the uh, the new uh, growth of the cell so here you can see ki, uh, the rate of the uh, cell uh, rate of the bacteria uh, uh, as for the death becomes more as compared to the generation uh, of the bacteria so in the, so this is about the uh, growth phase now let's discuss what are the most frequently asked question so the most frequently asked questions are the first one is what are the four phases of bacterial growth curve so this question has a maximum maximum chances in the examination in the interviews point of view also this question play makes it's uh, you can say a place where uh, you know uh, where this question may ask in exams uh, uh, that uh, what are the four phases of the bacteria you need to draw a diagram that is a graph and you have to explain all the points now moving to the next that is what does the bacterial growth curve show means this bacteria growth curve what it is showing so you need to know what this growth curve is showing it is just showing how bacteria is doubling its rate right so you must be aware of this uh, term that is uh, how bacteria is growing now moving to the next that is what are the things need to grow means what are the things need uh, things bacteria need to grow means of course bacteria needs a environment a suitable environment where it uh, you can say where it gets uh, uh, more amount of uh, uh, resources more amount of uh, uh, you can say more amount of nutrition is needed and um, here bacteria bacteria grow very well and um, so in this way bacteria grow themselves so these are this these are the important questions from this lecture that will be asked in the interview so this topic is fully based on how bacteria is dividing itself what is binary fission of bacteria how fast do bacteria grow sometimes they can ask you in mcqs also uh, uh, name the bacteria um, that takes the largest generation or you can say the longest generation time that is a mycobacterium leprae and name a bacteria that uh, you know uh, causes food poisoning and takes the shortest uh, doubling um, you know, sorry generation time then you have the spectro look pylococcus or release so these are some 
important questions that can be asked in the interview we will going to study about bacterial genetics so this bacterial genetic is a vast topic of medical microbiology since in medical microbiology we have studied about the history of medical microbiology the scope of medical microbiology and now we are seeing the genetics that is bacterial genetics so this bacterial genetics has a very vast topic in itself and it is very interesting topic so let's get started with the topic and let's see the introduction so genetic is the science of heredity it includes the study of what genes are how they carry information how they replicate and pass information to future generation in 1944 three american microbiologists that is oswald colin and macklin discovered the that a substance called dna that is dioxyribonucleic acid it is a material to which genes are made in 1953 james watson and franz crick determined the physical structure of dna dna and another substance called ribonucleic acid that is rna are together called as nucleic acid because these were first discovered in nuclei of cell so this genetics is the science of heredity we all know that we have a heredity means we have genes that we carry from our ancestors that we carry from our parents right so So this genes shows that how an individual be look like whether an individual is having a gene of their father or a mother because whenever a offspring is born so it has a characteristics of both of their parents mother and father right and genes it it carries the information informations like the heredity how they replicate how they pass the information from past to the future generation so in this three american microbiologists that is oswald colin and macklin they discovered a substance that is known as dioxyribonucleic acid that is dna so dna it is a material of which genes are made so in 1953 james watson and franz crick determined the physical structure of dna so there's two scientists watson and crick they determined the physical structure of dna and we all know that dna look like this and we all have dna in our body right so they determined the physical structure of dna and dna and other substance that is rna that is ribonucleic acid together are called as nucleic uh, nucleic acid because th this acid was first discovered in the nuclei of the cell so in exams they can ask you about the uh, 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 james and watson uh, watson and crick how they discovered what they discovered and uh, what uh, rna plus dna together known as what so this is the bacterial genome and a double helix structure of dna so what is this this uh, this is the double helix structure of uh, uh, dna so it looks like this so uh, it is a structure it is a one strand and further after division it get divided into two it is a parent and it is further divided into two daughter then comes the structure of rna so ribonucleic acid that is rna the second principal kind of nucleic acid differ from dna in the following ways dna is a double stranded rna is usually a single stranded the five carbon sugar in the rna nucleide is ribose as com compared to a dioxy uh, deoxy ribose in dna one of the rna's bases is uracil that is u instead of thymine i mean the other three bases a g c are same as in the dna at at least three kind of rna that is ribosomal R, uh, ribosomal rna uh, messenger rna and transfer rna are involved in protein synthesis so this ribonucleic acid that is rna it is a, it has a second principal kind of the nucleic acid that has very that is very different from dna right so dna is a double stranded rna is single stranded if you see the structure of dna so it has two strand and if you see the structure of rna then it has only one strand so rna have five carbon sugar a nucleotide uh, 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 that is uh, as compared to dna so whenever it comes to rna so they have a five carbon sugar and uh, if uh, you compare with dna one of the rna base is uracil instead of thymine the other three are a g c and are same as in dna so whenever you are considering a uh, dna right so dna has a g c t but in uh, uh, rna i am writing here in the blank state if if you see dna so dna has a g a c g t if you come rna then a c g instead of thymine it has uracil right so it is a basic difference between rna and dna so at least three kind of rnas are there when it come, uh, comes to rna so the rna is of three kind that is ribosomal rna means r rna i am writing it here r rna mrna and tRNA so uh, whenever i am saying rRNA so rRNA is a ribosomal RNA mRNA is a messenger RNA that uh, uh, you know that uh, transfer information from one RNA to another RNA and the last one is 
द the uh, messenger rna transfer rna and the ribosomal rna so these all rnas what they are doing they are helping uh, involved in the synthesis of protein now comes a gene a gene can be defined as a segment of dna that is sequence of nucleotide in dna that codes for the functional product a dna molecule consists of a large number of genes each of which contain hundreds of thousands of nucleotide so what is genes so gene can be defined as a it is a segment of dna and that codes for functional product so a dna molecule it consists of a very large number of genes which contain a thousand and thousands of nucleotides the length of dna is usually ex expressed in kilo bases that is 1 kb is equals to 1000 base pair and bacterial dna is about 4000 kb in length then comes the genotype so genotype of an organism is the genetic makeup the information that codes all the particular character of the organism the genotype represent the potential properties not the pro properties themselves phenotype refers to the actual expressed uh, properties phenotype is the manifest of the genotype so genotype uh, it uh, 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 of an organism is a genetic makeup means it uh, has a information that codes all the particular characteristic of a organism means or, uh, in an organism we have a various characteristics so which type of gene codes uh, are expression that is a genotype whereas phenotypes uh, Uh, refers to the external characteristics of the person. What is the color of a person? What is the hair color? What is the eye color of a person? So genotype and phenotype is differ in in this form. So in exams, <coughs> these questions also come. What is the difference between genotype and phenotype? So genotype is the genetic makeup means uh, uh, the uh, it uh, carries all the genetic information of the person, whereas the phenotype carries the external characteristic of a person. Now comes the DNA replication. So DNA replication is nothing but it is the multiplication of DNA. How our uh, DNA uh, you know divide and forms a same to same DNA. So it says. A semi semi conservative model for the replication of DNA ensure transmission of genetic information present in the parent is faithful transmitted to the progeny. It also means that uh, that after one generation DNA is present in a hybrid form which contain half old and half new DNA. It was it was also found that replication of DNA occur at a growing point that moves linearly from an origin to uh, terminus usu uh, usually in both the direction. so this is the semi conservative model says that the replication of dna ensures the transmission of genetic information that is present in the parent and that will transmitted to the progeny ab here progeny means progeny means child right so this progeny means child means the genetic information that parent carries that information that is carried from parent to the child right so it also means that after one generation after completing one generation so dna is present in the hybrid form hybrid in the sense it contain half old and half new dna so it uh, it was also found that replication of dna occurs at the growing point so growing point is known as fork that moves linearly from origin to the trimus usually in both the direction now coming to let's see what is dna replication so if you see it is a original dna so this original dna it is replicating replicating so it is replicating into two st other strand so this is the leading strand and this is the original strand and there are different types of enzymes that are involved in this there are different types of uh, like helicase is there helicase is an enzyme right that helps in uh, the uh, breaking of the dna right so this and dna polymerase is there so a uh, dna polymerase is also an enzyme that play an important role in dna replications so original dna is divided into two form two hybrid one containing a new dna and other containing a old dna that is the original dna strand now comes the genetic code so genetic code is the information which resides in the nucleic acid of the organism from dna it passes to mrna through which it is translated to the primary structure of protein so what is genetic code so genetic code it is a type of a information right we do coding right so coding code means it is carrying information right information from one organism to another organism or you can say from one parent to the child to the progeny so dna from dna it passes to mrna mrna right so dna to rna when uh, transcribe when dna changes to rna then it is uh, through transcription when rna changes to protein that is through translation so this is known as central dogma you can i am also writing here it is a central dogma where where dna to rna and rna to protein so dna to rna transcription rna to protein is translation right so it is a genetic code how the information is changed between the two now comes the mutation so mutation can be defined as any change in the sequence of base of dna irrespective of detectable changes in the cell 
phenotype mutation may be spontaneous or induced by mutagenic agent so what is mutation if there is a sudden change in the sequence of dna whenever uh, see dna has a g c t right if the sudden change in the sequence or uh, basis of dna irrespective of uh, the detectable changes that is uh, al always there in the cell phenotype so this is known as mutation means sudden changes in dna is known as mutation so mutation can be spontaneous or induced means induced or spontaneous ekdam se ya karai jaye or it is caused by muta mutagenic agent so those mutation which do not express phenotypically are known as silent mutation this is very important so those mutation i am marking here just a second so those mutation which do not express phenotypically is known as silent mutation point mutation it consists of a change in single nucleotide right then comes the frame shift mutation frame shift mutation consists of insertion or deletion of single nucleotide frame shift means whenever you are inserting anything or deleting a single nucleotide means you have nucle like uh, i'm writing you if you have nucleotide a g c t here also a g right so whenever you are shifting this from here to here so this is known as new uh, frame shift mutation where you are deleting uh, uh, any single nucleotide like if you are deleting thymine or if you are uh, deleting c if you are deleting a to so adenine so this is known as frame shift mutation <clears throat> now moving to the next that is mutation how mutation occur so this is very important that how mutation is occurring so mutation is occurring spontaneously or it is in uh, occurring by induced so in, uh, spontaneous mutation occur in the absence of any mutagen spontaneous means achanak suddenly ekdam se so spontaneous mutation occur in the absence of any mutagen when there is no mutagen is there and appear due to error in base pairing during a dna replication so there are chances when the base pairing uh, you know when uh, occur, when any occur, error occurs in base pairing of dna replication so in that case mutation occur in the absence of any mutagens and that is known as spontaneous induced mutagens uh, mutations are mutation that is produced by agent called as mutagens so these are uh, which type of agent are these so the first says agent which alter the pyrimidines and or purines so as to cause error in base pairing these include nitrous acid and alkylating agent agents which interact with dna and its secondary structure producing local disorientation in the helix helix so there are basically two types of agent that uh, cause uh, uh, you know uh, mutations in induced mutation how which uh, which are these agent which alter the purine or pyrimidines by causing a error in the base pairing second when the agent itself interact with dna then cause the mutation now comes what is a gene transfer so this is very important how genes are transferred so unlike eukaryotes where the gene transfer take place through sexual reproduction a mechanism which does not exist in the in bacteria following four method result in the transfer of gene genetic material in bacteria so whenever anyone ask you what is gene transfer how genes are transferred from one person to another right what is gene transfer so gene transfer is the process of transferring the genetic material means dna or rna into a person so you can do it with a uh, uh, do it with a three method that is transformation second is transduction transformation transformation transduction conjugation and protoplast fusion so gene transfer take place through four methods so what is gene transfer gene transfer is Uh, anything uh, uh, any information that is being transferred from one person to another is known as gene transfer where the genetic material is passed between the generation right so uh, uh, again gene transfer uh, in this uh, the introduction of new dna into an existing organism cells take place this is usually uh, ca caused by uh, uh, vectors such as plasmids or uh, when you modified any viruses right so what are the different uh, method through which you can this uh, uh, gene transfer take place the first is transformation second is transduction third is conjugation and the last is protoplast fusion so this uh, uh, in this uh, this human gene uh, transfer or you can say human gene therapy is the process uh, of transferring genetic material from one person to another and in this uh, is uh, in this heading it also comes the gene therapy so gene therapy you have all we all know about gene therapy so gene therapy what is it it is a medical invention based on the modification of genetic material of living cell which is then given to humans so in this you modified the genetic material of the any person by uh, you know forming a recombinant dna recombinant dna means a dna which has been altered from its original form any dna when you are altering it 
altering it from its original form how you are altering by joining the genetic material from two different sources so you are making the you are you know you are uh, 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 altering the uh, original form of the dna so that is known as uh, recombinant dna so recombinant dna uh, usually uh, uh, involves uh, uh, by uh, putting a gene or a part of a gene obtained from one organism into a genome of a different organism so this is how uh, this uh, gene transfer method uh, take place so as far as this topic is concerned we have uh, uh, discussed about uh, uh, the uh, <clears throat> what is genetics we have uh, seen uh, uh, the bacterial uh, genome and double helix structure of dna we have talked about the structure of rna what are the nucleotides what are the three kinds of rna that is present we have seen the difference between genotype and phenotype what is dna replication how does it take place we have uh, talked about the genetic code different we have studied about the mutation different types of mutation and how mutation occur and this topic that is gene transfer how, what is gene transfer and how our uh, gene transfer take place so hope you have understood the lecture in this lecture we will going to continue our bacterial genetics so this bacterial genetic is a continuation of what we have seen in part one so in part one we have discussed about what is bacterial genetics what actually genetic is what are the difference between DNA and RNA? We have seen different types of RNA like mRNA, tRNA, ribosomal RNA. What are their functions? Even we have seen the types of mutations. What is mutation, different types of mutation and how mutation occurs. We have talked about genetic code. And in this particular lecture, we will going to study about genetic engineering. So genetic engineering are the techniques in which DNA is manipulated artificially to identify and drive useful genes and genetic product. The most prominent of the technologies in this field involves recombinant DNA and gene cloning. So whenever we are talking about genetic engineering, so it is a technique in which DNA is manipulated. Can you see in this image? In this, what is, what is, doing, what is done here? The DNA is manipulated by artificially right so a strand of a dna is eliminated and a new uh, gene of interest is inserted in this so genetic engineering it is a technique in which dna is artificially manipulated there are different techniques through which you can manipulate uh, the dna and uh, artificially manipulated why we are doing this to identify and drive useful genes and genetic product means a desired product you want like for example if you want to uh, you know want a useful gene or a desired product so what you do you alter some changes in this dna by doing artificially so there are different types of methods like transcription translation and uh, uh, sometimes there is a, a chemical method not, not transcription and translation Tran there are different types of method like physical method uh, uh, chemical method uh, in physical uh, method micropeptide is a method and uh, electroplating is another method so the most prominent of technologies in this field involves recombinant dna and gene cloning so genetic engineering mainly deals with the recombinant DNA and gene cloning. Recombinant means our DNA technology where you manipulate the parent or you can say uh, the old DNA and uh, in gene cloning means where you are making a clone of a gene by inserting a gene of interest. Now moving to the applications of genetic engineering. So genetic engineering has uh, various applications. For example, it has applications in medicine, research, industry, agriculture and uh, let's see medicine research industry and agriculture are few sectors where genetic engineering applies it can be used on various plants animal and microorganism the first microorganism to be genetically modified is bacteria so genetic engineering play an important role where it is concerned with industries like medicine where uh, industries are or of agriculture or um, any research industries so uh, the first uh, um, and uh, it uh, can be used on various plants uh, and uh, various plant various uh, uh, animals even the microorganism you have seen a genetic uh, modified uh, organisms like uh, you have seen the dolly sheep you have seen the bt cotton right so what are these they are the genetically modified organism or product you can see so plant can also be you know uh, their, their genes can also uh, the dna or the genes of the plant or the mechanism of the plant can also be altered uh, the even the animals the dna of the animals can also be artificially altered by inserting any gene of interest same with the microorganism the, the first microorganism to be genetically modified is bacteria in, in exams or in interviews also they can ask you that uh, name the first microorganism to be genetically modified that is a bacteria then comes in medicine so genetic engineering can be applied to first is manufacturing of um, drug second is creation of model animals that mimic human conditions and gene therapy human growth hormones follicle stimulating hormones human albumin monoclonal antibodies and vaccine so this genetic engineering can be uh, can be applied uh, in uh, the manufacturing of different kinds of drugs so in market in our markets there are different kinds of drugs so genetic engineering is uh, play a very vital role in manufacturing of the different kinds of drugs even 
the in gene therapy they play a very important role in a uh, growth hormone human growth hormones in uh, in forming uh, monoclonal antibodies in uh, uh, in the manufacturing of vaccines so just this genetic engineering plays a very important role in the medical sector now moving to the next that is in research <coughs> genes and other genetic information from a wide range of organism can be inserted into bacteria for storage and modification creating genetically modified bacteria in the process so whenever you are doing any research so genes and other genetic information of a very wider um, from a very wider range of organism can be inserted into bacteria like you uh, in bacteria you can insert a gene of interest and you can store uh, that um, uh, you can uh, modify the bacteria by inserting a gene of interest and that to creating a genetically modified bacteria right so whenever anything any you can say any gene of interest is inserted in any animal plant or microorganism then a particular product that is derived from that is known as the genetically modified product gmo you can say a gmo orga organism or GM gmo product then comes in industries transformation of cells in organisms with a gene coding to get a full protein medicine like insulin human growth hormone vaccine supplements such as tri to fan it is in the production of food like uh, in cheese making and a few are produced using such techniques so after research genetic engineering play an important role when it is concerned with the industry so transformation of cells in organisms with a gene coding to get a useful proteins right so this protein can also be used in the manufacturing of different types of drug like insulin like a human growth hormone like in vaccine or uh, there are different kinds of sub uh, supplements and um, some types of food production like uh, making of cheese so this genetic engineering is present everywhere so nowadays genetic engineering is becoming a very uh, uh, advanced field in manufacturing of different kinds of product that to of your desired wish now coming to the agriculture so this genetically modified crops are produced using a genetic engineering in agriculture such crop are produced that provide protection from insects pest it is used or can be used in the creation of fungal and virus resistant crops so in agriculture if i if i give my opinion so genetic engineering apart from a medicine play a very vital role where agriculture is concerned since in agriculture this genetically modified crops are produced right how they are produced again by altering the dna and using the genetic engineering so in this the crops that are produced through genetic engineering is known as genetic engineering crop right so sometimes they why they are using the genetic engineering so that they can uh, give protection from the insect or pest so they create a plant that has its own resistance to pest and insect so that helps the plant to grow fast that helps plant to you know uh, get a, uh, away from any sorts of insect or pest so it can be used um, uh, or can be used in the creation of fungal or virus resistant uh, crops also so uh, it is also uh, eliminating uh, the chemical uh, pesticides or weedicides that is uh, uh, that is given to the crop to avoid any sorts of uh, viruses or fungal or insect or pets so in agriculture it plays a very important role right so genetic engineering can be applied to other areas as well that is a conservation natural area management and micro art but it plays a very important role in agriculture medicines right now moving to the next that is a benefit of genetic engineering so there, there are various benefit of genetic engineering engineering the first is the production of genetically modified crop is a boon to agriculture the crops that are uh, drought resistance disease resistant can be grown with it as described earlier genetic disorder can be treated the disease such as malaria dengue can be eliminated by sterilizing the mosquitoes using genetic engineering it also play an important role in therapeutic cloning so this genetic engineering if you see the first benefit so it is boon it genetic modified crop is a boon to agriculture why because they are creating a plant that is a that is a disease rare, that is a, a virus resistant that has a um, insect resistance uh, the fungal uh, resistance plants are being grown through this technology then the crops that are drought resistance the second disease resistant can be grown to it so what it is doing it is a boon to agriculture and uh, uh, genetic disorder if a person is suffering from genetic disorder so genetic engineering play a very important role in treating a genetic disorder now comes the diseases such as like uh, malaria uh, disease like uh, like uh, uh, dengue can be eliminated how they are how they can be eliminated by sterilizing the mosquitoes using our genetic engineering then the last is the therapeutic cloning so this is the benefit of genetic engineering now comes what <clears throat> what are the challenges that genetic engineering face see any technology whether it is a new technology or whether it's a old technology every technology you know have certain uh, you can say uh, challenges in themselves have some beneficial effects some uh, have disadvantages so what are the challenges that a genetic engineering uh, engineering faces 
though the first is the production of genetically engineered entities may result in the adverse manners and produce undesired result which is unforeseen with the product with the introduction of a genetically engineered entity into one ecosystem for a desirable result may lead to the distortion of the existing biodiversity genetically engineered crops can also produce adverse effect the, the concept of genetic engineering is derivated for its bioethics where community against it urge over the right disordering and warning the nature as per our need so if we talk about the genetic engineering so the first and the foremost um, the challenge that it faces sometimes the desired product that you are inserting a desired uh, uh, gene of interest sometimes the result is not what you want right sometimes the uh, uh, result is very adverse second is it is sometimes it is disturbing the biodiversity and uh, this uh, see whenever anything is natural so they do not have any health hazard right or they do not uh, impact our health not health hazard they do not impact our health because it is natural right but whenever you are inserting anything means you are altering the nature you are just uh, you know uh, you can say you are disturbing the nature for your for your own desire to the result may be adverse so they can impact the health as well and the concept of genetic engineering is uh, sometimes people think it is up it is against our bioethics when some communities are against it because they urge that what is natural is natural don't play with nature don't uh, uh, produce a crop by you know by altering its original identity right so there are certain challenges that uh, genetic engineering faces now comes which are the genetically modified crops in india so as told you earlier bt cotton is genetically modified crop that is under the cultivation in india uh, bt brinjal was initially approved but later was uh, blocked from the production second is gm mustard is yet to be allowed for cut uh, cultivated it can be the first genetically modified food crop in the country so um, if we talk about uh, the genetically uh, modified crop that is grown in india the first one is the bt cotton so bt cotton is a genetically modified uh, crop uh, that is under the uh, the cultivation in india second is bt brinjal again but uh, bt brinjal uh, was initially approved but uh, later on uh, the production was blocked second is the mustard uh, gm mustard is yet to be allowed for cultivation but it will be the first genetically modified food crop in the country so uh, the approval is only given to the bt cotton yet bt brinjal was approved earlier but after some times the population has not accepted the bt brinjal so the production of bt brinjal was blocked now comes the mustard that is uh, uh, genetically modified mustard is yet to be allowed to cultivate it all the theories all the production of the uh, this uh, bt uh, mustard was uh, made is allowed but but again the cultivation is still pending so it will be the first if bt uh, uh, mustard is allowed to be cultivated and it if the production is accepted by the population then bt uh, uh, that is genetically mustard will be the first genetically modified food crop in the country i am just talking about india now next is faqs about the genetic engineering so as far as this lecture is concerned we have uh, uh, studied about what is genetic engineering we have seen uh, uh, how genetic engineering is done what are the applications of genetic engineering genetic engineering plays a very vital role in medicine in agriculture what is uh, uh, name the first or the microorganism to be genetically modified that is a bacteria second is uh, it plays a very uh, vital role in research in industries in agriculture in genetic engineering so apart from this uh, we have discussed the benefits of genetic engineering so what is the, what are the benefits of genetic engineering now comes the what are the challenges of genetic engineering if we talk about the challenges so what are the different challenges that genetic engineering faces and at last we have discussed about which are the genetically modified crops in india now comes the faqs the first is what are the some examples of genetic engineering so what are the first uh, some examples of genetic engineering second what are the pros pros and cons of genetic engineering as already told you genetic engineering has so much benefit but as well as it faces certain challenges that we have discussed what is genetic engineering and mention any two application of genetic engineering apart from this one question can be asked name the microorganism that was first genetically modified so the microorganism is bacteria and apart from this one question can be asked that is uh, name the techniques through which this genetic engineering um, process take place so it has some physical or chemical method like uh, if we talk about the physical micropeptide bombardment or the second is electro plating is another method so by doing this you can alter the dna and you can insert a gene of interest gene of interest means gene of your interest what you want so this is some uh, types of questions that can be asked 
I hope you have understood the lecture. So today in this lecture, we will going to study about bacteriophage. So bacteriophage is a broad topic of uh, medical microbiology. It deals with uh, different types of bacteriophage. It deals mainly with the virus that uh, you know infect or replicate within bacteria and archaea. So bacteriophage is a very interesting as well as a very broad topic of medical microbiology. So let's get started with the definition of bacteriophage. The bacteriophage, phage means to eat, are the virus that infects bacteria. They are usually called up, called as phage. These have been used extensively in basic molecular research and epidemiological tracing. So bacteriophage is also known as phage. Phage means to eat, and they are uh, the group of viruses that infect the bacteria. So, bacteriophage was uh, discovered with the, uh, by Frederick and W. Watt uh, in uh, Great Britain. So, and uh, D. Horley uh, was a scientist who coined the term bacteriophage, means bacteria eating. So, bacteriophage, the main uh, is, no, bacteriophage means bacteria eating. So, if we see the structure of bacteriophage, then the outer side uh, is known as the capsid head. Inner side, this part is known as the nucleic acid. This is the, known as collar. This is the whisker. This is the shield. This is the base pl plate. And this is the tail fiber. And this is the spiker. So, this is a, a 3D bacteriophage. So, what is a bacteriophage? Bacteriophage are the viruses or a group of uh, any group of viruses that infect bacteria. The word bacteriophage is known as bacteria eating. And it is also known as phage. Morphology of phage. If you see the morphology or you can say the structure of uh, phage. So bacteriophages, um, one thing to understand that this bacteriophage also infect the single cell prokaryotic organism known as RK bacteria or you can say RK. So if you see the morphology, <coughs> so the phage have a simple structure comprising of a genome which is surrounded by a protein covering known as a phage capsid. We have seen the capsid. Capsid. So this capsid is a phage. Uh, you can say uh, I'm drawing it, or you can see uh, this uh, diagram. So this capsid uh, head, you can say they uh, um, they have a very simple structure, as you can say capsid head is looking like this. So it is a very uh, you know basic structure, or you uh, they have a very simple structure that is comprising of a genome. Genome in which uh, 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 of which is surrounded by a protein covering known as the phage capsid. The genome usually comprises of singular linear double stranded dna molecule large phages generally consist of a head and a tail so now comes the head so you can see this the head of bacteriophage so the bacteriophage the head is a hexagonal if you see the it is a hexagonal one two three four five six six side is there so the head is a hexo has a hexo uh structure which comprises the genome the head consists of a tiny packed core of nucleic acid surrounded by a protein core or caspid capsid and measure the size of 28 to 100 nm nanometer so if you if you can see the structure of this so this consists of the nucleic acid and it is a hexagonal stru structure and it is surrounded by a caspid head caspid head it is a very uh, it has a very protein it is a, a protein coat or you can say or the measure the size measure is 28 to 100 nm then comes the tail the tail it is a cylindrical structure which is used as an organ of attachment as well as the conduct through which the phage dna passes to into the host cell the, it consists of a hollow core and surrounded by a contractile shield and terminal base pl plate to which are attached pins and tail fibers or both as you can see this. This is a shield. It is protecting it. So now this is a clear diagram. This is a caspid head made up of protein. It, it consists of a DNA or you can say nucleic acid inside. It is a collar. It is a protecting shield. Right. So this part is known as the head part. This is known as the tail part. So they have the spiker. They have a tail fiber and it has a base plate. Now moving to the features of bacteriophage. So bacteriophage, they have a high host specificity. They passes through the filter which hold back the bacteria. They have a lytic phase uh, phages, lysed bacteria, best during the active phase of bacterial growth. Boiling inactivates the phages, means whenever you boil it, so the phage get inactivated. Lytic phage uh, phages can be propagated indefinitely in associated with growing bacteria culture. Intestinal bacteria flora of men and animal is commonest habitat. Phage lysis is also seen in anti 
genomycetes, bacteria, and some yeast. So whenever we are talking about the CAR features, so they have a very high hosting specificity. They get inactivated when it is considered with boiling. So there are the thousands of uh, varieties of phages that exist on this earth. So each of uh, uh, each of which may infect one or different types of bacteria, including the uh, prokaryotic organism like a single cell that is a archaeobacteria. So uh, the phages are classified in a number of viruses family. Some uh, examples includes uh, are microviride or rudoviride, right? So, like all the viruses, unlike all the viruses, uh, these phages are um, a very simple organism that consists of a core genetic material that we have seen in the uh, figure that it uh, it uh, consists of a nucleic acid. So, nucleic acid is what? It is a genetic material that carries all the information, right? And apart from the gen nucleic acid, this nucleic acid or you can say this genetic material is surrounded by a protein. Right? Have you seen this diagram that uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, protein or you can say a DNA or a nucleic acid, a genetic material, it is surrounded with a capsid head. Capsid head is uh, made up of protein. So, this the nucleic acid may be either DNA or RNA or it may be double stranded or single stranded. Right? So, basically, uh, in short, uh, what uh, we have seen, so these phages have a very basic structure, means they have a head, they have a tail and they have a filament, uh, the tail is in the form of a filamentous. Now coming to the life cycle of the phages. So whenever the phage is considered, so whenever it's a life cycle of bacteriophage, so during the infection, uh, a phage uh, is attached to a bacterium or uh, you can say uh, they are uh, attached to uh, insect, uh, it's genetic material into the cell that we have seen in the diagram. So after that, the phage usually follow two cycles. First is lytic cycle and second is lysogenic cycle. So basically phage exhibit two types of life cycle. So, the first one is the lytic cycle, second is the lysogenic. So, whenever it's a lytic cycle, so uh, in which it is an intracellular multiplication of the phage that result in the lysis of the host bacterium and release of progeny virulon, it is also known as virulent cycle. So, this lytic cycle is also known as the virulent cycle. Why? Because in lytic cycle, um, uh, they... Uh, uh, they lysis the host bacteria and after uh, lysis means after breaking it, they release the progeny virulon. Or you can say this lactic uh, phages take uh, uh, over the machinery of the cell and to make the phage component. Then what they do, they destroy the bacteria or you can say they uh, break down the cell and the cell releasing a new phage particle. Then comes the lysogenic cycle. So lysogenic cycle in which DNA, in which the phage DNA become integrated into a bacterial genome and replicate with uh, with the bacteria without causing any harm to the host cell. This is known as temperate cycle. So whenever it's a lysogenic cycle, so lysogenic phage, uh, what they do, they incorporate uh, their nucleic acid into chromosome of the host cell. Then what they do, they replicate with the uh, uh, with it as a unit without destroying the cell in lytic cycle or you can say lytic phage what they are doing they are destroying the bacteria or you can say they are destroying the cell here then in the lysogenic they are not destroying the cell under certain conditions so this lysogenic phage can be introduced to follow a lytic cycle so moving to the next that uh, sorry moving to the next that is the uh, lysogenic cycle uh, we have seen the uh, features we have seen the uh, morphology now let's see what is the role of i'm writing on the blank uh, page what is the role of this bacteriophage in the laboratory research La right so if we say the uh, the role uh, the question one question can easily ask uh, in the examination that uh, role of bacteria you can say phage in lab Right. So they, they uh, like uh, so this uh, uh, this question can be asked. So uh, these phages uh, have played a very important role whenever there is any research is considered. The uh, means uh, first phage uh, is studied where the, those uh, designated type one or type seven or T uh, T even uh, phages. They uh, they have a very important role whenever there is uh, uh, there there, uh, there is uh, any uh, you know uh, therapies consider, uh, considered. So uh, phages play a very important role in different types of uh, you know, studies um, that uh, is there. Uh, apart from this, bacteriophage, we have, uh, if, we, if we see the classification of bacteriophage, then uh, bacteriophage uh, is uh, classified uh, on the basis of the nucleic acid, or you can say the morphological characteristics. So uh, you won't imagine, but there are 19 families of bacteriophage found, one uh, found of which two families are of RNA bacteriophage. So I am writing here. So uh, the, there are total 19 families of bacteriophage 
and these among these 19 families there are two uh, families or uh, that are of rna bacteriophage so if we uh, um, in examination or in the interview if they ask you uh, uh, name any uh, uh, one or two types of bacteriophage then it is t4 that is uh, ascheria virus that is uh, a myoviridae family uh, of phage so there are different types of uh, micro uh, uh, bacteriophage that are present so we have seen the life cycle of bacteriophage now comes the importance of bacteriophage if we write here means what is the important importance importance of bacterio bacteriophage so if we see the importance of bacteriophage then the first is the phage therapy means they are used as a antibiotic against bacteria due uh, due to some mode of action so in in phage therapy they play a very important role why because they act as a antibiotic against the bacteria then uh, the second is they are used in food industries to kill bacteria in meat or cheese product so as we have seen the definition bacteriophage is known as a bacteria eater right so it play a very important role in the food industry as they kill bacteria uh, in different uh, in different meat or cheese product then the third point says bacteriophage are uh, used for diagnostic purposes then the third point says they act as a model in research and studies and uh, last if we say they are used as a cloning vector in genetic recombination that technique so in our previous lecture we have seen the genetic recombination technique like we have uh, studied about the genetic engineering right well, so uh, in genetic engineering they act uh, as a uh, you know combination or uh, they can act as a cloning vector so bacteriophage uh, play a very important role uh, in this form one thing uh, i would like to you know add here that what are the different uh, you know um, in la lactic cycle uh, let's go to the lactic cycle of uh, yeah, yes this lactic cycle so whenever there is a lactic cycle so lactic cycle uh, is based on the three uh, steps or oh, sorry five steps the first uh, i'm writing on the uh, blank page lactic acid have uh, for the steps that they have a five steps lactic cycle so the first one is adsorption adsorption is the first step so this adsorption it is a encountering uh, of a bacteriophage to a bacterial cell uh, wall with the help of their tail fibers that you have seen in the figure then the second is penetration so the second step in the lactic cycle is penetration since there is no space so i am uh, rubbing the, these two now uh, the next uh, is replication and synthesis replication is the next uh, uh, step then comes the assembly and the last one is lysis or release Lys lysis and release so in exams they may ask you about the uh, about the different steps of the lactic cycle so lactic cycle have five adsorption uh, it has adsorption penetration replication assembly and last is lysis or release so uh, this is about uh, the bacteriophage so as far as this lecture is considered so we have seen the definition of bacteriophage we have seen the diagram we have seen the morphology of phage means uh, about the diagram about the head tail and uh, we have seen the features of bacteriophage as well as we have seen the importance of bacteriophage then uh, at last we have seen the cycle of uh, phages means uh, phages uh, have uh, two cycles that is lactic cycle and lysogenic cycles so in exam they may ask you the difference between these two cycles and uh, what is the difference between the lactic cycle or lysogenic cycle lactic uh, in mcqs they can ask you about lactic cycle is also known as dash means uh, you have to take though it is known as the virulent cycle then lysogenic cycle it is also known as the temp uh, temperate cycle so this is about uh, the questions that can be asked in the examination in this lecture we will going to study about in vitro cultivation of bacteria in the previous lecture we have complete bacteriology now we will going to see what is in vitro cultivation of bacteria so if we see what is bacteriological media a substrate on which the bacterial culture is done is known as medium which provide nutrition and ph to the organisms there are two broad groups of media liquid and solid both are extensively used in bacteriological laboratories to obtain a pure growth one has to use solid media because of the following disadvantages with the liquid media the first one is the growth does not show character on the basis of which a tentative diagnosis can be established if it is mixed culture of more than one organism their separation cannot be performed however once a pure growth has been obtained on solid media liquid media are used to perform further test because of the homogeneous growth in these media so whenever we are talking about any bacteriological media so simple what is a media or you can say what is a medium so medium is nothing but it um, it is the uh, you can say a area or it is a place where any substrate substrate on which a bacterial culture is done means it, there is a substrate and on that 
particular substrate a you know bacterial culture is done and this medium this is known as medium what is medium so medium it is the place or you can say it is a uh, area where, where the substrate on which the bacterial culture is done is known as medium and this medium what does it um, provide it provide nutrition as well as the ph to the organism so medium it provides nutrition for the proper growth as well as it provides a optimum ph for the organism to grow so there are basically two groups of media the first one is liquid and second one is the solid if we if ever in uh, exams they ask you different types of media then it's a liquid and a solid so both liquid and solid are extensively they are used in the bacteriological laboratories means in labs there um, there are basically two media that is used in a very extensively way like first one is um, uh, the liquid and second one is the solid so both are extensively used right so to obtain a pure growth one has to use solid media whenever you want to you know grow uh, obtain whenever you want to you know have a pure growth of our organism then you always use a solid media so why we are using a solid media and why we are not using the liquid media to obtain a pure growth so there are certain disadvantages that are um, uh, that is always associated with the liquid media the first disadvantage is the growth does not show a character on the basis of their tentative diagnosis can be established so the growth does not show the character right on the basis of which the tentative diagnosis can be established second if there is a mixed culture whenever uh, there is a mixed culture means more than one organism is there their separation cannot be performed in the liquid media so only a solid media is used whenever there is a mixed culture of any uh, organism and we all know that this mixed culture of an organism is the culture which have more than one organism so however once a pure growth has been obtained whenever there is a pure growth that is obtained on a solid media so liquid media are used to perform further test because of the homogeneous growth in these media so uh, uh, in that case you use the liquid media to perform the further test now moving to the next step, that is the different types of bacterial culture so as you can see in this image there is a emb agar this is a maco maconi agar this is lxd agar this is a blood agar this is a chocolate agar this is a nutrition nutrient agar this agar is the most extensively used agar as per other than that this blood agar is also used this maconi agar is also used so these are some uh, agars uh, that are used in the laboratories now let's discuss these in detail but before uh, moving to the different types of bacterial cultural media let's talk about what is agar so to convert liquid media which were uh, you, uh, in used in 80s uh, gelatin was used by some bacteriologists to make a solid media but the re but the real advancement was made by robert koch when he could make a stable solid media by adding agar agar to a liquid medium since then agar agar commonly called as agar has been used as a most effective solidifying agent so uh, firstly uh, we use the gelatin um, is used by certain by a bacteriologist to make a solid media so you can see it till 18 gelatin uh, is uh, was used by different microbiologists to make a solid media but uh, there uh, because there comes a real advancement that was made by robert coach robert coach was a bacteriologist he um, uh, made the solid media by adding the agar agar so earlier uh, uh, agar is known as agar agar two times agar so uh, to uh, any liquid media and hence the, the the from that day onwards it is the most effective solidifying agent so what is agar you can simply say agar is a solid defying agent what is agar it is a solid defying agent and it is most commonly used uh, by any uh, bacteriologist uh, since uh, it has a solidifying effect and it is used as a solid media now let's move on to the properties of agar now coming to the properties let's discuss the first one it is derived from a certain sea weights it means at 95 degree centigrade so whenever um, it uh, so the properties of agar says it is obtained from the seaweeds it uh, generally melt at 95 degree centigrade this question can be asked in the exams as well as in the interviews it means what is, i am writing the question in exams they can ask you about sorry so in exams they can ask you about uh, <coughs> the question what what is the melting and solidifying point or you can say temperature of agar so the answer for this is agar solidified at 
42 degrees centigrade uh, and it melts at 60 95 de degrees centigrade so this point number two is very important because in exams they can ask you about the properties of agar as well as in the interviews as well then comes agar remains firm at the temperature uh, of uh, incubation so uh, uh, during incubation or the incubation tem at incubation temperature uh, agar uh, remains the, uh, remains in a firm uh, condition so it is heat liable material can be added to it even at the temperature of 45 degrees centigrade that is the temperature where it gets solidified so uh, any heat liable uh, temp material can be added uh, at a solidifying temperature that is 45 degrees centigrade thus retaining their uh, potency then fifth point is bacteriological in they are bacterio bacteriological inert in nature then there comes the resistance to action of all the medically important bacteria then they are easily available they are economical so that means they are economical in the sense they are a very cheap uh, uh, as uh, in cost as compared to any other and it is very easily available in the market so nowadays uh, uh, the bacteria uh, any bacteriologist want an, a product that can be easily available as well as it should be a cost effective so both the properties agar holds then comes the types of culture media so if you talk about the types of culture media so some bacteria can grow with a minimum and ordinary ordinary available growth condition whereas many other are very specific in their demands these can be in liquid or solid state with or without oxygen so the uh, bacteria has a property that it can grow at a any temperature that is suitable for their growth like it can grow at a uh, minimum temperature it can grow in uh, at maximum uh, temperature it can grow on ordinary temperature or you can say optimum temperature so uh, the, they uh, can grow uh, with a minimum as well as ordinarily available growth conditions <clears throat> whereas there are some bacteria that demands the specific growth condition for their for their growth now, if we can see that uh, this, uh, so, uh, these can be, uh, what are the specific demands? Like they can either grow in the solid state or in a liquid state or some can grow with oxygen or some can grow without oxygen. So, there is a specific condition or you can say demands of uh, some bacteria to grow. So, some media have a simple composition whereas other um, have uh, either be synthetic or complex in composition. So, uh, so media uh, is also being classified like some they have a very simple composition uh, you know some can either be synthetic or complex so accordingly different types of media are available as per the bacteria demands media can be divided into two broad categories uh, so they are the defined synthetic media and second is routine uh, laboratory media so these are uh, the two types of media that have a broader group now moving to the next that is what is defined media synthetic media so if we talk about the defined synthetic media so these are prepared from chemicals and their exact composition is known these are used for research purposes and are two of types are so if we see the defined uh, synthetic media so these media you know uh, they uh, they um, uh, are prepared from a chemical and their composition are very exact uh, and they are basically used for the research purpose and under this they are again divided into two forms that is simple synthetic media and second is complex synthetic media if you see the simple synthetic media then simple synthetic media contain a carbon and energy sources and uh, organic source of nitrogen and various inorganic salt in buffered aqueous solution so whenever we are talking about the uh, simple synthetic media so th these type of media they contain a carbon and a energy sources so energy sources like it the source of nitrogen and various inorganic salt that are buffered in a aqueous solution then comes the complex synthetic media so these complex synthetic media uh, they uh, possess uh, in addition to a component of simple media means they have all the components that are that uh, is there in a simple synthetic media but apart from that they uh, have many other growth factors like depending upon the nature of the bacteria or organism for their growth requirements now moving to the next that is a routine laboratory media so these media attempts to provide nutrition and ph to the organisms which can which are akin to uh, that uh, to that it of tissues and body fluid many of these nutrients are supplied by aqueous exact of meat and peptone there are various type of these media so if we talk about the routine media so uh, the, these are type of media they are, have a nutrients as well as they have the aqueous extract of meat and peptone and uh, according to uh, based on this they are they are of various type of media are there the first one is basin media so these media nutrient in um, these uh, media includes the uh, nutrient uh, growth uh, so the basin media uh, includes the nutrient growth they include the peptine water peptone water uh, which are very simplest liquid if we see this peptone water so it is a very simplest form of liquid media and form and from form basis of all the other laboratory media addition to agar to the nutrient broth results in nutrient agar media which is a real solid uh, solid basin media now moving to the enriched media so addition to the substance such as blood and serum to the basal media results in the formation of enriched media which can be supported 
uh, the growth of these bacteria which are collectively or you can say comparatively extracting in their demands blood agar is an example of such medium then comes the selective media so these media contain substances that inhibit the growth of large number of bacteria and permit the growth of few selected bacteria this pro this property is the result of the addition of some chemical to the basal media meconi agar and uh, bismuth sulfite agar belong to this category so whenever since the name suggests selective media so selective media are those media that uh, contain a certain substances they, that they inhibit the growth of uh, any type of large number of bacteria or you can say they they permit the growth of certain or you can say selective bacteria and um, uh, McConkey uh, agar and bismuth sulfide agars are these examples of the selective media. Then comes the um, uh, enrichment media. So since the name uh, suggests enrichment, so what does it mean? So this means uh, these are the liquid media again. So enrichment media uh, again are the liquid media which are selectively favor the growth of certain organism or you can say they inhibit the growth of some bacteria and mixed inocula. So they favor the growth of certain organisms uh, okay and apart from that they inhibit the growth of some bacteria or you can say they um, uh, they uh, inhibit the growth of uh, of a certain bacteria from a mixed inocula uh, the example of this category of media are tetra uh, ter tetra thinoid broth and selenite f medium these culture however do not indicate the proportion of the selected organism in the mixture so if we talk about the enrichment media so uh, they uh, favor the growth of certain uh, you can say the uh, organism but uh, apart from that they also uh, they can also inhibit the growth of certain some type of bacteria then comes the in indicator media so what is indicator media so if we talk about the indicator media then when some substance is added to medium which would produce a visible change in the medium by the growth of certain bacteria it is designated as a uh, in uh, uh, indicator media so whenever some uh, uh, substance is added to any of this uh, medium they provide a visible change indicator means to indicate something so as, uh, as, uh, as uh, some substance are added to this medium that would uh, produce a visible change in the medium how they produce the certain visible change by the growth of certain bacteria it is designated as an indicator medium then comes the McConkey agar has a dye which is presence of lactose fermenting organisms changes the color of condition of colony stooping thus helping in identification of lactose fermenting bacteria blood uh, tenetrine agar is used for the isolation of C dipatrine is an another example so in exams they can ask you about this indicator media because it is very much important like how this McConkey agar uh, you, is used as a type why because um, in this mechanical key agar there is a presence of i am marking here uh, there is a presence of lactose fermenting organisms that changes the color of uh, color of the colonies to pink and thus identification is done done uh, of lactose fermenting bacteria so how what it is doing it is just changing the color right it is changing the color of certain types of uh, bacteria so this is the about the indicator uh, uh, media then coming to the transport media so transport media what is a transport media so the basic purpose of such medium is is to sustain the vi uh, viability of the organism when a clinical sample is to be transported from the periphery to the laboratory the medium prevents the growth of contaminant during the transmit uh, so total uh, transport medium and amines transport medium are the example of these media so the basic purpose to use this media is uh, uh, to uh, is uh, to sustain the viability of organism as well as when a clinical sample is to be transported from periphery from means from very basic to the laboratory then comes the storage media so uh, these storage media they help in preservation and storage of bacteria for a uh, considerable for a long period of time so they helps to preserve and store bacteria so these include the uh, dorset egg media nutrient agar stab blood agar slope is some example of these media then comes the media recommended for uh, the routine use in laboratory so the first says the large number of media are now available and that make it difficult to select few which can be used routinely uh, in the bacteriological laboratory ideally speaking such selection is done only on the basis of the type of workload in that particular laboratory however common experience suggests the use of the following media are almost all the clinical samples in the initial phase of isolation so media recommended for the routine use in laboratory so how the media is uh, you know recommended for the use the first is the nutrient broth second is the nutrient agar that is uh, still better uh, than a blood agar then a mechanical agar is there 
then comes a sensitivity test agar sensitivity test agar uh, so this uh, can be a nutrient agar for the most of the commonly used antibiotic except for sulfur or sulfur or sulfur containing drugs so in this way uh, uh, media is used in the laboratory for uh, you know performing the <coughs> Uh, experiments so uh, so the uh, the basic is that selection uh, of a, uh, any type of media is generally done on the basis of a type of the workload that to be performed in the laboratory means depending upon which type of work you are going to perform or you can say which type of uh, uh, agar is a, oh, sorry not experiment is going to be performed so on the basis of that you used the media uh, in the laboratory so this is all about the uh, lecture hope you have understood the lecture as far as the lecture is concerned so we have uh, seen um, what is a bacteriological uh, media? Uh, we have seen what is an agar, the properties of agar, types of culture media, like a defined uh, defined synthetic media, or you can say there is a routine media, laboratory media. And we have discussed the different types of uh, media like enrichment, indicator, transport, storage. So um, we have seen the example as well as which uh, type of media is used where. Today in this lecture, we will going to study about cultivation of bacteria. So in the previous lecture, we have discussed about in vitro cultivation of bacteria. We have seen different types of media, their properties. We have seen the properties of agar, what is agar. Like we have seen the types of media, like when selective media is used, when enrichment media is used, what are their characteristics and what are their basic examples of a particular bacteria, uh, media. And why uh, and what are the two different types of media that is liquid and solidifying media, solid media. And what is the basic difference between liquid media and solid media. Even we have also discussed why we are not using the liquid media in the large scale in the laboratory. What is the drawback that are associated with the liquid media and what are the advantages that are associated with the solid media. So in this particular lecture, we will going to see um, about the cultivation of bacteria. So the indicator for culture of bacteria include to obtain a pure culture. To characterize and confirm the isolate, to carry out antibiotic sensitivity test, to carry out other epidemiological marker studies, to estimate viable counts to store the bacterial isolate for future use. So now comes what is the indication for the culture of bacteria include means if we are saying the, what is the indication so basic indication for any culture of uh, bacteria it includes why it is done so just to obtain a very pure culture and to characterize as well as to is confirm the isolate means just to confirm and show their characteristic it has been used then to carry out the antibiotic sensitivity test it is used to estimate the viable count. So this is a most important uh, uh, thing that it is used to estimate the viable <coughs> count. Then comes to store the bacterial isolates for future use. There are um, uh, the procedures in the laboratories where the uh, bacterial isolates are stored for the future use. So it is done for that also. Now coming to the next that is in instrument for seedling bacteria. So what are the different instruments that are used for seeding, uh, seeding of media? So uh, uh, this is a selective selected according to the nature of the medium and inoculum. Penetinium, uh, penetinium and no, uh, no, nichrome wires are for different gauges are used. Nichrome is oxidizing and hence in some of the tests where this property of bacterium is to be tested. Example, oxidase test tested instead of nichrome, planetium. planetium Platinum, platinum wire should be used. This wire is sterilized by holding it vertically in the flame of the burner so that the whole length of the wire become red hot. It, uh, it is allowed to cool down before it touches any material suspected to having a bacteria to avoid heat killing of organism. Pre-sterilized disposable loops are now available commercially. The wire can be used as. So, um, so depending upon the type of nature um, or you can say depending upon the nature of the medium or the inoculum. So, uh, it is selected. The instrument of for seeding of uh, media is uh, selected. So, basically there are uh, two types of um, uh, instrument uh, is used uh, um, uh, for inoculum that is planet, uh, platin, uh, planet, pet, platinum and nichrome. So, uh, platinum and nichrome are the, uh, these are two wires of uh, different gauges that are basically used. So, plat uh, platinum and nichrome. So, nichrome is the oxidizing. Um, uh, so, uh, the nature of nichrome is, uh, it is oxidizing in nature uh, and that is the only reason um, uh, some uh, of the testers where the properties of bacteria is to be tested. Um, for example, oxidase test. So, instead of using nichrome, we use platinum. 
where to conduct the oxidizing test we don't use um, nichrome why nichrome is not used because of the oxidizing um, uh, because it has oxidizing in nature so example oxidase test to uh, to perform oxidase test which type of wire is used uh, platinum wire is used so uh, this platinum wire is um, uh, for before using so uh, uh, the in the laboratory it is uh, being sterilized how it is sterilized so it is sterilized sterilized by holding it vertical in the flame you uh, like this is your flame i'm just drawing here this is your uh, let's say this is your flame so how it is um, so this is your uh, if this is your uh, platinum wire so you you always touches this part to the flame just to make it red hot so that all the microorganism get deteriorated or it should kill stick okay? so you have to hold this wire till it becomes the red hot so after that you allow it to cool down before it touches any material that to be suspected of having a bacteria why just to avoid the heat killing right of the organism so the pre sterilized disposable loops are now available uh, commercially so there are some pre sterilized loops uh, for example that is a nichrome wire that we are talking about it is available in the market and it is pre uh, already it is pre sterilized disposable loops uh, that are uh, available in the markets so a wire can be used as how uh, so apart from this what are the other uses of the wire so it is used as the straight wires to stab the culture picking off single colonies as well as for inoculating the liquid media thick wire uh, which is useful for lifting the viscid material such as uh, sputum and wire loop which is usually of a diameter of 2 mm is most useful for all inoculating wire these are uh, preferred to uh, a seed a plate of medium as the straight wire usually cut the agar so the, it has um, different functions uh, for example the first use is um, the straight wire it is used to stab the culture or just to pick uh, uh, the single colony Uh, as well as for inoculating the loop uh, liquid media apart from this um, there is a thick wire uh, which is used uh, in lifting the viscid material viscid material as in such as uh, sputum apart from this the wire loop which is usually uh, of a diameter of 2 mm it is mostly used uh, as uh, for uh, as a inoculating wires and these are uh, much preferred to uh, seed a plate media um, which is, which is very straight uh, wire usually that is used to cut the agar now moving to the next this is something uh, the inoculating uh, loops and it will look like see i am talking about this part if you see in the diagram so i am talking about this part this part is the loop and you hold uh, this is the handle you hold this uh, uh, inoculating loop from here this is the shaft and this is the platinum wire sometimes this platinum wire is also known as the nichrome wire and this is the needle uh, or and when you are talking about the inoculating loop so this is the loop and you have to place this loop or this um, needle uh, in front of the um, uh, uh, some uh, Uh, red hot uh, uh, means uh, fire or uh, you have to place that uh, when uh, when it becomes the red hot right so till it becomes like a flame of a burner you place uh, this uh, part and this part in the in the flame of burner till it becomes the red hot just to sterilize us just to kill all the microorganisms that are associated here now moving to the next that is seeding a culture plate now how to seed a culture plate so there are three commonly uh, employed techniques for seeding a culture plate the first is the inoculum from the clinical material or any other plate is the first spread out in the form of primary inoculum which is which is called as the well the inoculum from the clinical material or or another plate is first spread out in the form of a primary inoculum which is called as well inoculum or any well the successive series of stroke b c d e are made with the loops sterilized with between each sequence at each step inoculum is derived from the most dis uh, distant part of the immediately preceding stroke so that it gradually reduces the number of bacteria this help in obtaining isolate colonies in alternative plating procedure one edges of the large loop is used to make a, a secondary well the other edge is then used to make a succession of the stroke across the remaining unseeded area <coughs> when the inoculum is small or a medium is selected it can be more heavily inoculated several loops full of specimen are used to spread the primary inoculum after sterilizing the loop it is recharged by rubbing it over a area a and the plate is seeded in a particular in a parallel stroke b c and d so if we look at this um, uh, diagram how do you uh, do the streaking of uh, the plate method streak plate method what is a streak plate method and how it is done uh, so uh, if we talk about how uh, this um, uh, sterilize of any uh, nutrient media is done so the culture uh, media that is bro bro um, that is broth or ag agar media even the water and other that materials uh, are um, are sterilized by an autoclave um, at uh, a very high pressure um, uh, steam using a very moist heat at a um, uh, pressure of um, the pressure of autoclave must be 15 psi that is a uh, pound 
per inch square for 20 to 30 minutes, which gives at the temperature of 1 to 1 degree centigrade. All the glassware that are being used must be wrapped with the aluminum foil and, and plants containing nutrient media must be plugged with the cotton and then wrapped with aluminum foil. After sterilization, the material should not be taken out immediately. You must be you must wait for 15 to 20 minutes. So why you should wait for 20 to uh, 15 to 20 minutes just to lower down the temperature to about for 60 to 60 degree centigrade after releasing the pressure the material should be taken out so what is the use of this needle here generally uh, people ask uh, the question what is the use of uh, the uh, this needle or this inoculating loop uh, in this whole uh, you know uh, experiment so basically it is used to make a uh, to select the particular colonies you can say or it is uh, used to you know uh, check uh, make uh, the uh, uh, selected uh, you know colonies or the inoculation needle or loop uh, is uh, it is um, uh, basically it is um, uh, it is used uh, to uh, are used for picking a small quanti quantities of solid materials and also for transferring the culture of uh, even the plants, animal or microbes from solid media. Even a smaller amount of liquid culture can be manipulated by using a straight needle. Okay, so now comes the seeding or liquid media. If the tube has to got a cotton plugs, plug, the mouth of the tube should be heated in the flame before uh, before and uh, after and after any handling of tube to prevent contamination from the rims of the tubes getting into the media. It is not required when the metal caps and screwed capped tubes are handled. In time, the liquid media containing tube of 45 degrees centigrade and deposit the inoculum on its wall above the surface of the liquid at its lower end. Return the tube to a vertical position. Now, the inoculum shall be uh, below the surface of the liquid. So, whenever you are using a tube, whenever a tube is used in the experiment to make sure the tube must be properly cleaned before it is used. Secondly, the tube should be properly uh, given heat so that any microorganisms that are present in the tube get eliminated. After giving a proper amount of heat, the tube mouth, that is the upper part of the tube, it must be, uh, you know, it must be uh, <coughs> um, must have a cotton plug uh, so that uh, so uh, at the uh, in the mouth of the tube it should be plugged with a cotton uh, it should be covered with a cotton plug so that there is no such entry of microorganism and after uh, or before handling uh, or the tube the tube should be properly sanitized so to prevent the uh, any further contamination of microorganisms so this um, uh, incline as uh, this um, uh, tube should be uh, you know Incline at a degree of 45 degrees centigrade and you can repeat uh, that uh, and, and the most important thing the position of the tube while giving a heat should be vertical position. Now seeding a solid media in the test tube. Slope of the solid media are inoculated by striking the surface of the agar with the loop in a zigzag manner. Start the culture uh, are inoculated by uh, punching the wire in the center of the media. You can see uh, in this diagram how this um, uh, uh, you know a streaking of the agar is done in a zigzag manner. Uh, uh, in a zigzag manner, uh, is, uh, the streaking of the agar medium is done. Now comes the aerobic incubation of culture. So, what is uh, aerobic uh, incubation of culture? So, uh, the first is for a bacteria of medical importance, uh, inocu uh, inocu incubation is usually done at 35 degrees, 37 degrees centigrade. Whenever it's a uh, medical importance, so uh, for bacteria should be inoculated at the degree of 37 degrees centigrade. But there are some bacteria that require a special temperature, for example, uh, Campylobacter that grow better at 43 degrees centigrade and lepidospire uh, is another type of a bacteria that can grow at a very well at a temperature of 30 degrees centigrade so depending upon the workload of the laboratory may have a tabletop uh, incubator or a walk-in incubator for a prolonged incubation are required for the growth of mycobacterium tuberculosis screw cat bottles should be used instead of petri dishes or tubes to prevent the drying of the media so uh, depending upon the workload of the laboratory, see every bacteria has their uh, 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 different incubation temperature. So basically, if we uh, see the majority can uh, easily inc uh, they, their incubation temperature is uh, uh, 37 degrees centigrade. But if we talk about the Campylobacters, they grow at 43 degrees centigrade, and another type of bacteria that is Leptosphere that grow at 30, 30 degrees centigrade. So both are two different uh, bacteria, but and as well as their uh, incubation temperatures also different. So depending upon the workload, that uh, what kind of work is done in that laboratory, so. So, uh, there are two types of uh, incubators are there. The first is the uh, walk-in uh, incubator and the second is the tabletop incubator. So, uh, depending upon the work, the incubator is placed. Uh, so, there are certain uh, microorganisms, bacteria, for example, um, you have uh, mycobacterium. So, their, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 their incubation uh, temperature uh, is very much uh, uh, high. So, they are required uh, for a longer period of uh, time, uh, time for the incubation. So, in that case, uh, it is your wish at uh, which uh, temperature uh, you are using that incubator. 
So basically, what is the role of incubator? So incubator, it is an instrument that it consists of a copper or sometimes steel chambers, uh, which are uh, which warms water or air um, is uh, circulated by the electric current or by means of the small uh, glass flame. So the temperature of the incubator is kept constant due to its control using by the thermostat. And depending uh, whenever you are uh, you want, you can uh, simply ch change the temperature. The incubator is made up of double wall chamber, uh, and um, according to uh, the, uh, uh, you can adjust the temp desired temperature um, of your, your own. So temperature in this uh, they are greatly influenced by the growth of culture and um, it is uh, and it is operated to allow microbial growth um, uh, on a very suitable medium under a con proper temperature in uh, an incubator the variation in temperature should not be more than a one degree and you should always take a precaution while you are handling uh, or you are using a incubator that is the door of the incubator should be open only when it is required if the test tubes are to be incubated for a longer period of time at a high temperature so the media that uh, uh, that is placed inside it it becomes too dry due to the excessive evaporation so in such cases you should always plug uh, you in, in that case you should always use a cotton plug uh, should be uh, pushed inside the neck of the test tube and the, uh, the petri dish uh, that should be inoculated for the longer period of time they should always be covered with the uh, for any foil or um, uh, this uh, cotton wool uh, so just to avoid the excessive drying of the tube then comes the method of isolation of the uh, uh, pure, pure culture. So, when the mixture of bacteria following methods can be utilized to, to isolate the bacteria. So, uh, use of enrichment and selective or in, in indicator media, I'll describe above, can help in isolation of the pure culture. So, uh, sometimes pre treatment of a clinical sample uh, with the substances uh, that can also destroy the unwanted bacteria. For example, the culture of uh, tuber cell, uh, basically, the spectrum is preheated with alkali and acid. Then comes the uh, plating the, on the solid media to obtain isolate colonies for selecting the desired one is the other method. Then obligate um, aerobes and anaerobes can be separated by uh, incubating the appropriate condition. Then comes the vegetative forms and spore forms can be you know separated by heating at a uh, 80 degree centigrade that uh, kills the vegetative forms uh, also. Then motile and non-motile bacteria can be separated by inoculating the French tube which is which permit the travel of motile bacteria to appear uh, in the outside of the tube. Then comes bacteria of different sizes can be separated by use of selective uh, filters um, uh, with the uh, different pore size then comes the pathogenic uh, organism that can also be separated from a non-pathogenic by animal inoculation test so in, in mcqs they can ask you that how this pathogenic organisms and uh, non-pathogenic uh, uh, organisms are separated so they are separated by um, by uh, animal incubation test then comes the anaerobic features. So, what are the anaerobic features? So, anaerobic bacteria are defined as a bacteria uh, that do not grow in the presence of oxygen. We all know this. Anaerobic means no oxygen. So, anaerobes are very greatly in their sensitivity to oxygen. So, aerotolerant uh, anaerobes are the another types of anaerobes that grow on the surface of agar plate with a very low level of oxygen. Whereas, the obligate anaerobes die or their growth is inhibited almost immediately when they are exposed to oxygen. So, there are some anaerobes that are tolerant to a small amount of oxygen. Then comes the facultative uh, or anaerobes are those organisms that will grow with or without oxygen means they require oxygen but sometimes they do not require oxygen so in exams they can ask you then in the anaerobes that can grow with or without oxygen that is the facultative anaerobes the method of obtaining the specimen of the anaerobic culture may be culturing procedure and perform to ensure the organisms that are protected from oxygen so basically what is the purpose so the basic purpose <coughs> basic purpose is the anaerobic bacterial culture they are performed to identify bacteria that grow only in the absence of oxygen and which um, may cause human infections. So, anaerobic bacterial culture uh, they, uh, is done, that is done only to identify bacteria, the, that bacteria that grow in the absence of oxygen and they infect uh, the humans. If uh, overcooked or looked or killed by exposure to oxygen, so sometimes the anaerobic infection result in a fair serious consequences such as uh, organ failure or sometimes even the death. Then culture is required to collectively identify the anaerobic uh, pathogen and institute the effective antibiotic uh, treatment. So, um, in this, the culture is required, uh, the correct culture is required to identify the anaerobic pathogen and uh, there are certain institute of effective anaerobic antibiotic treatment where you can do the treatment. So, this is all about the lectures. I hope you have understood the lecture. Any part of the lecture, if there is any query, so you can leave your queries in the comment section below. As far as this lecture is concerned, so what we have covered so far, so we have covered about the cultivation of bacteria, instrument that are used in seeding uh, media. We have seen the different types of instrument and how to seed a culture plate. We have even uh, seed, uh, the seeding a uh, liquid media and seeding a uh, solid media in a test tube. Then we have also talked about the aerobic incubation of cultures and what are the different temperature at which incubation of uh, bacteria is done and uh, what are the appropriate uh, temperature uh, that is given and what is the use of incubator and what is incubator. Then apart from this, we have seen the method of isolating a pure, pure culture. 
then we have talked about the aerobic culture we have seen that what is aerolentic aerobes what is obligate aerobes aerobes anaerobes uh, and uh, we have talked about the facultative anaerobes as well then apart from this what is the purpose of this we have also discussed the purpose identification of bacteria so in the previous lecture we have covered the in vitro fertilization of bacteria now in this particular lecture we will going to study about identification of bacteria so basically the first question generally arises what is this identification of bacteria means so it is nothing but it is um, uh, a morphological or you can say a biochemical test and uh, there are cert uh, certain um, supplements are needed by a specialized test uh, test such as like stereotyping and antibiotic inhibition patterns so in this way you can identify a certain bacteria so uh, generally one question arises that why these uh, tests are necessary why there is a, a need of these uh, tests and why you need to you know uh, identify bacteria so see bacteria are classified and they are identified just to distinguish among the strain and to uh, and to, to group them uh, by a certain criteria of interest to microbiologists and other scientists so now let's see the introduction part of the topic so the most important task of bacteriology is to identify the pathogens from the clinical sample so that appropriate treatment can be instituted the accurate identification is an overwhelming number of cases can be accomplished by a series of procedure which are as follows so see so the most important task of a bacteriology laboratory means in a laboratory for any bacteriologic uh, scientist it is a very important task just to identify the pathogens just to identify the bacteria if i am saying pathogens pathogens includes all the microorganism let's say bacteria fungi and everyone so they are identified from the clinical sample from a small sample so that uh, appropriate or you can say the best treatment can be given to them so the accurate identification uh, in a, an overwhelming number of cases so they are uh, achieved or you can say accomplished by the series of procedure so the first one says the um, uh, isolation in a pure form then comes the morphological of uh, morphology of bacterial colony then comes the uh, morphology and staining reaction then comes the biochemical test then comes the antigenic uh, characters um, then comes the fluorescence uh, fluorescent microscopy then comes typing of bacteria next is animal pathogenicity next is antibiotic sensitivity determination then comes the molecular techniques so these are certain uh, you know uh, accurate identification or series of procedure that is done to identify bacteria so given that these bacteria are um, you know routinely uh, uh, by a morphology uh, they are identified by a certain microbiological or a, uh, you say morphological test and there are certain supplements that we have already uh, told you so these supplements are i am writing here so these supplements are as follows as the, like first one is stereotyping so stereotyping is uh, one of uh, the specialized test test is there then comes the antibiotic inhibition anti biotic inhibition pattern is another uh, you can say uh, the specialized test just to identify bacteria so these are certain types of uh, bacteria uh, test that is needed to identify bacteria then coming uh, uh, is what is the uh, need of this identification so basically identification is nothing but it is a practical use of classification criteria just to distinguish certain organism from other to verify the authenticity uh, of a strain or a particular reaction or to isolate and identify the organism that can cause diseases so it is very important just to identify any sort of the pathogens or bacteria just to eliminate uh, the uh, further uh, you can say the diseases or you can uh, apply certain precautions um, uh, just to avoid uh, some uh, types of diseases now coming to the next that is isolation in a pure form so the first one if you can see it's a isolation in a pure form so the isolation in a pure form says studies on the biochemical antigenic and um, other characters of bacteria can be done only if the organism is available in the pure form from few clinical sample usually pure culture is obtained these include blood spinal fluid closed abscess but many other clinical sample especially sputum feces skin and body orif orifices shall provide a mixed culture for the isolation of organism in a pure form following techniques are available so what are these plating on a solid culture media then comes the use of selective enrichment or other indicator media so what is the isolation in a pure form so in this particular technique or you can say in, in this particular there uh, is a isolation of bacteria is done the characters of bacteria is uh, identified so these isolation um, uh, in a pure form needs a pure culture to perform the certain type of uh, 
uh, you know, result. So the pure culture, it may be, you can say, isolated by the use of uh, spatial media with a specific uh, chemical or physical agent that are allowed the enrichment or selection of uh, one organism on another, as we have discussed this. So what is the method of, uh, what is not the method, but you can say what is the uh, pure culture. Um, so pure culture, I am writing here, pure culture is also known as acidic culture that contain a single species. So pure culture is also known as acidic acidic culture and acidic culture it contains a one single species so it does not contain many species it contains only a single species and uh, that uh, isolation of pure culture it um, this technique is a uh, um, uh, you know uh, is a uh, the first scientist who's developed this technique is robert coach Robert Koch is a scientist who developed this uh, technique. So, pure culture, uh, if you see, it is a theoretically contain a single bacteria species that we have already discussed. Is me, uh, in this, uh, only a single species is uh, uh, contained and uh, the simple method for isolation of pure culture, the, it includes the streak plate method or a poor plate method or a spread plate uh, method or a spread plate uh, plate method is another so what is the purpose of the pure culture you can say what is the basic definition so a pure culture may be isolated by use of a spatial media with a specific chemical or physical agent that allow the enrichment or selection of one organism over another and make sure the culture should be a pure culture the bacteria the you can say the character of bacteria in this it obtain only available in a pure form that is the reason it is known as pure uh, pure culture yeah, pure form so what is the purpose of sp spreading uh, these uh, plate or streak is to isolate the individual because yeah, we are talking about a single species so by uh, the use of spread plating or streak plating so you can isolate a individual bacterial cell on a nutrient media now comes the next that is uh, plating on a solid culture media. So, plating on a solid culture media says clinical sample is strict into a solid media, uh, medium that is a nutrient agar, blood agar or McConkey uh, agar in such a way so that to ensure isolate discrete colonies. A colony is pre-assumed to be a pure culture since all the bacteria in the des designate of a single bacteria. This colony can be picked up with a, with a straight wire to obtain a subculture. So, if we talk about this um, uh, plating or you can say streak plate method. So, in this particular uh, method, right, um, uh, it is used to, uh, it is used most to isolate uh, any pure culture of bacteria so in this a very small amount of mixed culture is placed um, placed on the tip of inoculation loop inoculation loop you all know that a small wire with a hole uh, with a round or circular hole um, at one end so inoculation uh, inoculation loops and uh, and is strike across the surface of the agar media in the form of a zigzag let me show you uh, in the form of this it is a it is a plate so if it is a plate so in this form zigzag manner so uh, it is done with this inoculation loop right so the, it is done uh, in a zigzag uh, formation just to or uh, where on the uh, on the surface of the agar media so the the successive streak or you can say the thin out uh, the inoculation and the microorganism are separated from each other so these plates are incubated so uh, uh, after this these plates are incubated and allowed to grow the colonies so in this uh, colonies are grown and each uh, and this and the each separated bacteria from colony after inoculation then comes so this pore plate um, yeah so this is the thing then comes the next that is use of selective and enrichment or you can say indicator media so the sele a selective medium such as blood toiletrine agar is used to obtain a pure um, growth of a diphtheria bacilli because majority of other bacteria will not grow in this medium similarly growth of salmonella is of favored by enrichment media um, such as selenite f and subculture from selenite f within a recommended time shall given a pure form pure growth of salmonella in the indicator media some bacteria shall present with the altered visible appearance of colonies and some can be picked up and subculture to a procedure pure culture that is E. coli and, and Labisheria grow as a pink colored lactose fermenting colonies on McConkey agar as compared to Salmonella Shagila colonies which do not ferment lactose and hence are pale yellow in appearance. So this is about the use of selective or enrichment or indicator media. So whenever this uh, uh, indicator or selective uh, media is used to in this, the selective media such as you can say the blood uh, territory agar, so it is, uh, it is used to obtain a growth of Defitheri bacilli. Why? Why uh, it is used um, just to obtain in the majority because the majority of bacteria do not grow in this media. Then similar case, similar cases with the Salmonella. So Salmonella it grows in the enrichment media such as Selenite F and the subculture of Selenite F within a recommended time you can say and um, in this a pure for growth of salmonella is uh, is achieved then comes the indicator media so in this some uh, bacteria shall be present with the altered visible appearance of colonies and um, uh, and some can be picked up and subculture uh, to procure a pure culture so for example e coli 
एंड लेविशिया ग्रो एंड दिस ग्रो एज अ पिंक कलर्ड कलर्ड एंड दिस मैकॉन की अगार इज एज कम्पेयर टू सेलमन एला सेंगलाई कॉलोनी दे डू नॉट फॉर्मेंट लैक्टोज एंड हेंस दे आर टेल येलो इन कलर इफ एनीथिंग इज फॉर्मेंटिंग लैक्टोज तो इट इज इन पिंक कलर इफ इट इज नॉट फॉर्मेंटिंग लैक्टोज तो द अपियरेंस इज येलो so in this this slide is very important in the, for the MCQs because in this there are some questions that can be asked in your MCQs then comes the use of growth conditions so most important example of this is the growth of anaerobic bacteria which will not uh, take uh, which will not take place in an environment having an oxygen so most important of this is the anaerobic bacteria so we all know that this anaerobic bacteria will not grow uh, where uh, the environment have oxygen then comes the inoculation so some laboratory animals are um, selectively you know susceptible to some bacteria and use of this pro property is to obtain pure growth of bacteria so if the culture of organism having a pneumococci is injected into the mouse the animal would die to a pneumococcal uh, spectacemia in 12 to 48 hours and from the heart to blood of the mouse the organism can be obtained in a pure culture so this is about the animal inoculation so uh, in general if we talk about what is animal inoculation and what or you can say what did you understand by this animal uh, inoculation so what is animal inoculation so it is uh, again in um, it is a it is a method to obtain a culture Uh, of uh, the bacteria or you can say the pathogens uh, just to uh, you know um, uh, obtain a pure form so again this anim animal inoculation it is used to in distinguishing between the viruses which are produce similar relations such as food and mouth uh, diseases and vascular uh, stomatics of cattle so what is the principle of uh, this animal inoculation uh, just to uh, observe the pathogenesis immune response or you can say oncogenesis and the growth of the viruses is inoculated animal may be uh, in uh, indicated by the visible and diseases or death so this is all about the lectures hope you have understood the lecture if any doubt you can simply drop your uh, queries in the comment section below let's see what all we have covered in this lecture so in this lecture we have covered the introduction part of uh, the topic that is the identification of bacteria what are the different procedure through which you can identify the bacteria then comes the isolation in the pure form who is the scientist who first developed the isolation in the pure form and what does uh, the isolation uh, in pure form means and how this uh, isolation of pure form is uh, done like plating on a solid culture uh, media and uh, what is the use of selective or enrichment or indicator media then we have seen the use of selective growth condition and animal inoculation so today in this lecture we will going to study about morphology of bacterial colony so in the previous lecture we have discussed about the identification of bacteria we have seen the techniques we have seen the different types of media that are used to identify the bacteria and what is the use and what is the purpose or you can say what is the basic aim of this identification of any pathogen so in this particular lecture we will going to see the morphology of bacterial colony so the morphology of bacterial colonies the following characters of the colonies are noted as these are produced by different bacteria so bacteria have the different types of characters and these characters of bacteria it is produced by the colonies that we have isolated during the, any experiment or in the laboratory so if the first character of the bacteria says that size so the size of a bacteria is always in a diameter in mm then the outline means sometimes bacteria is circular sometimes it is entire sometimes it's wavy sometimes it's indented then elevation elevation says flat raised low convex dome shaped so how it is elevated then comes the translucy means sometimes it's very clear sometimes it's transparent sometimes it is opaque and sometimes it is translucent if we talk about the color so uh, if you see the characters that bacteria shows in the form of color it is sometimes colorless white yellowish black and pink as in the previous lecture if we have seen if it has a ferment it lactose property then it is always pink in color but if this quality of lactose fermenting is absent then it is a yellow color or you can say pale yellow color then changes in medium means hemolysis then comes the mucid these are they are mucid they are adherence to medium if we talk about their surface it is glistening or you can say it has a very dull surface then if we talk about the consistency then they are brittle or vitreous and if we talk about the smell or you can say odor so some bacteria have distinctive odor so if we see the shape of the bacteria then if we see the colony sometimes it is round sometimes it is irregular sometimes it is filamentous means in the form of these filaments they are uh, zygoid zygoid in structure they are curved in structure if we talk about the colony uh, edge so it has sometimes entire means it sometimes look like this some it is filamentous type sometimes it is irregular means they do not have a proper shape 
an elevation that we have discussed that it has sometimes it has a raised elevation sometimes it has a flat sometimes it have a convex sometimes it's again it has irregular means the it does not have any particular shape so now moving to the morphology and staining reaction so the colonies are subjected to basic straining with gram strain and their motility is checked by making a hanging drop or a wet preparation these steps see uh, these steps show the morphology and motility of bacteria which are a great help in identifying them depending upon the source and growth character other differential strain can be used further to confirm or classify the bacteria so bacteria if uh, the if you see the basic colonies that are subjected to uh, staining with gram stain or, and if you want to see their mortality means the moving character so it is checked by hanging drop so it is checked by which hanging drop or you can say the wet preparation and these wet preparation or hanging drop is so depending upon the source and growth characters other differential uh, strain can be used to further confirm or classify the bacteria so we all know that this morphology and mortality of bacteria it ha has a very great help in uh, identifying them means uh, how uh, how this bacteria look like depending upon the source and growth characters different other differential strain can be used for further confirm and classify the bacteria so basically here what we are doing we are classifying the bacteria depending upon the shape depending upon the character depending upon the uh, you know uh, their uh, uh, mode of nutrition so and then how the growth take place so we classify the bacteria on the basis of that then comes the gram staining so gram staining is basically of two type the first is gram negative rod and second is gram positive cocci so let's see how is, is it so this is a bacterial is you can see in the diagram this is a bacterial smear so firstly we have to you know wash the slides okay and uh, we just uh, pour your um, bacteria smear on that the application of cluster then uh, we do the uh, crystal violet color uh, for um, drop uh, a few drops of crystal violet color for 60 seconds then after this again wash then application of iodine for 30 60 seconds again you have to wash it off then comes the application of ethyl then you have to put the ethyl alcohol for 15 seconds then you have to rinse it and counter the stain with saffron for 16 seconds so through this you can uh, uh, do the staining of bacteria now comes the types of culture media so basically there are a large number of tests are available uh, which help in identifying the bacteria so uh, because there are numbers and thousands of bacteria that are present on the earth so uh, to identify which type of bacteria you want to study uh, you need certain uh, certain types of tests that tests that tests are available in the laboratory and so, uh, by performing uh, those tests you can simply identify the bacteria means like uh, which type of bacteria is there so these are uh, uh, these are uh, can be classified as test for metabolism of carbohydrates and related compound so the first test says test to distinguish between aerobic and anaerobic breakdown of carbon carbohydrates so the first test you have to um, see is to uh, see the metabolism of carbohydrate as well as the carbon and uh, as well as the related compound so you have to test between the aerobic as well as non aerobic uh, uh, breakdown of carbohydrates so the, in this test to show the carbohydrates that can be uh, attacked as such as glucose sucrose uh, mannitol uh, lactose etc so test for a specific breakdown products such as MP mrvp test to test to show ab ability to establish a substrate as citrate and malonate then comes test for metabolism so there are different types of tests then second test is test for metabolism of protein and amino acid the first test was to perform uh, the metabolism uh, of carbohydrates then here comes the metabolism of protein and amino acid so in this uh, um, we have gelatin liquefaction we have indole production we have amino acid decarboxylase test we have phenylalanine and deaminase test so all these tests are used to perform uh, or you can say these tests are used to uh, t used to test the metabolism of protein and amino acid then comes the test for metabolism of fat then comes the hydrolysis of tributyrin then comes the test for enzyme so under the enzyme it says catalase test oxidase test urease onpg test nitrate reduction so these are another test that is used to test the enzymes that are present in the certain amount of bacteria then typing of bacteria so a single bacteria 
Bacterial species may contain many strains which may vary from one another in minor characters. Thus, different similar strains may be constitute types within the same species. There are thus various methods by which these tests can be assinated and these techniques are also used in tracing the source of infection. So, uh, typing of bacteria um, is that ki, uh, by, the, by performing this, you can um, see the single bacterial species, you can study that and by studying a single bacterial species, uh, uh, species of the strain, uh, you, uh, which may vary from one another another means that different different bacteria have different characteristics and they may vary according to the uh, you know type of bacteria uh, then uh, so in this different uh, sim or different uh, or a similar strain may be constitute type within the same species uh, uh, if you have the same species or different uh, uh, types of strain within the same species are also present there are various methods by which these uh, types can be assinated and uh, and these techniques are also used in tracing the source of infection means what kind what is the source of infection in bacteria can be also studied by uh, you know uh, using this uh, specific techniques now coming to uh, the detail of this typing of bacteria so this typing of bacteria they, they contains uh, um, uh, different types of bacteria have different types of um, designation their character are different and we will going to discuss the uh, this with the help of an example Now let's talk about the designation of bacteria. So if the designation of bacteria is biotyping, if the first, let, let's see, if the first designation is this biotyping, so designation is biotyping, then the character is biochemical test, vibro, uh, cholera or uh, bio, so the character or upon which it is based is biochemical test and the examples are vibro, uh, cholera, salmonella. Then the second uh, is the designation is phage typing or uh, you can say bacteriophage. Then the character is susceptibility and examples are streptophyte, aurelius. Then the third is the designation is say stereotyping. So the character is surface uh, antigen, pneumonococcus. Uh, su surface antigen is a character and pneumonococcus is an example of this. Then comes the uh, uh, Fourth uh, designation is says the bacteriocyne uh, typing and the production of bacteriocyne is the character and the example is the Pseudomonas calibrisida. Then comes the designation is anti antibiogram typing. Designation character is susceptibility to antibiotics and example is again the uh, streptophyte aurelis. Then uh, designation says the resto, uh, rest, restogram typing. Susceptibility to chemicals are the characters uh, like such as heavy metals, uh, salmonella and the last is the plasmid profile. So this is about the typing of bacteria. Now comes the pathogenicity. Animal pathogenicity. What is animal pathogenicity? So the isolation of certain um, uh, organism is, uh, is facilitated facilitated by inoculum or uh, inoculation of uh, clinical material uh, into uh, very into a selectively susceptible animals uh, however uh, animals models are more frequently employed for ascertaining uh, whether isolated strain is pathogenic means toxic or not then comes the antibiotic sensitivity determination. So bacteria can be tested in the laboratory to find the most suitable antimicrobial agent. Two methods are currently practiced. These are Stoke method in which the test is tested against the standard reference strain for sensitivity to antibiotics and the results are based on the comparison between the zone of inhibition produced by the same drug for the test and standard strain. The second method is modified Calibri Burel's test that is NCCLS method where zone of inhibition produced by antimicrobial agent for a particular strain is measured and its diameter is compared with the standard figures. Based on this, the strain is pronounced as sensitive, sensitive or resistance to that particular antimicrobial agent. So if we, if we talk about the antibiotic sensitivity determination, so in, in this we have uh, divided this antibiotic uh, uh, sensitivity determination into uh, 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 parts or uh, there are two methods to find out the antibiotic uh, sensitivity determination. The first First method is the first method is the stroke method, and second is the Calibri Burel method. So if we if we see the uh, if we see this uh, uh, bacteria, so bacteria whenever you are testing bacteria in the laboratory, so you uh, find the most suitable antimicrobial agent, right? So there are basically two methods that is currently practiced. The first one is this stroke method, and second one is the Calibri Burel's method. So under the stroke method, in this the uh, strain that you have to be tested, it is tested against the reference strain for sensitivity to the antibiotics. Means what are the what uh, they have the sensitivity against the antibiotics, and uh, the result that is uh, going to find at the end are based on the comparison between the zone of inhibition that is produced by the same drug uh, for test and standard strain. Then comes the uh, Calibri Bureau method. It is also known as NCCLS method. Uh, in, in this, uh, the zone of inhibition that is produced by antimicrobial agent for a particular strain is measured and uh, uh, if you um, compare their diameter with the standard figures. So, based on this strain is produced as sensitive uh, resistance to that particular antimicrobial agent. So, basically it is uh, divided into two uh, methods and 
both the methods are mentioned here so that is comes to the end of the lecture hope you have understood the lecture as far as the lecture is concerned we have uh, covered uh, the uh, morphology of bacterial colony we have uh, uh, find out uh, what are the different types of shape their colony edge margin how these colony elevation uh, look like uh, what is the morphology and straining reaction then we have studied about the gram staining and the types of culture media uh, like uh, a large number of tests are available with the help through which you, you know uh, identify the bacteria then comes the test for metabolism of proteins and amino acid then we have seen the okay this thing is a leftover that is fluorescent microscopy so fluorescence in the name suggests means colored microscopy so antibody molecules labeled with a fluorescent dye is used in the direct fluorescent antibody test that is fat that is fluorescent antibody uh, test to detect the antigen so basically what is fat uh, hmm, uh, fluorescent microscopy it is so it is a uh, antibody molecule uh, where the antibody uh, molecule it is labeled with a fluorescent dye and it is further used for the in the direct fluorescent antibody test that is effect to detect the antigen basically yeah if you see in this uh, it is used to detect the antigen by uh, labeling it uh, with a fluorescent dye so if the antigen is present so the antibody get tagged uh, to the to uh, and the fluorescent dye uh, on exposure to ultraviolet rays shall be emit bright red uh, light uh, indicating the presence of homologous organism various diseases for which rapid diagnosis can be made with the fluorescent microscopy include rabies plague influenza etc so uh, under the whenever it is uh, exposed to uh, uh, exposed to uh, ultraviolet rays means uv ray so they emit a bright light and uh, by emitting that bright light it, it indicates the presence of a homologous organism and um, by this you can uh, figure out the various diseases that are uh, there like for example rabies plague influenza and uh, in um, in uh, companion to this uh, you can uh, you know uh, diagnose uh, these diseases uh, by uh, by various types of uh, producing antibodies then um, after this we or uh, we have covered about the typing of bacteria we have seen the examples then animal pathogenicity and the last we have uh, seen the antibiotic sensitivity determination so today in this lecture we will going to study about sterilization and disinfection so it is a very important topic in medical microbiology as it deals with the sterilization and disinfection techniques that is used to make an environment as well as utensils of uh, the laboratory free from any source of microbial contamination. So let's quickly see the definitions. So the first definition says that in the in antiseptic so antiseptic it is a substance that inhibit or destroy microorganism the term is applied specifically for substance applied topically to living tissues so we all know that this antiseptic it is a substance that destroy or you can say that inhibit the growth of certain microorganism that can cause several several types of diseases so and this term is um, specifically applied for the substances that is applied topically to the living tissues then comes biocides Biocide, um, biocide is a substance that kills all living organisms including spore, both pathogenic and non-pathogenic, for example, bacteriocytes and virocytes. So, biocides uh, are the another types of uh, type of substances that kills the uh, um, living microorganisms, microorganisms that include the spore. Because some uh, types of uh, techniques uh, like uh, in different types uh, when we were studying about uh, preservation, so there are certain techniques that does not, you know, totally kill the spore types of microorganisms though so biocides is a substance that kills the living organisms including the spore and it kills both that is pathogenic as well as a non-pathogenic organisms and for example bacteriocytes virocytes then comes the biostat so biostat is an agent that prevent the growth of microorganisms so it is what it is an agent that is preventing the growth of microorganisms and does not necessarily kill them so it prevents the growth but it does not kill uh, them for example bacteriostatics uh, fungi uh, fungi static so it prevents the growth it is an agent it is not a substance but it is an agent that prevents the further growth of microorganism but does not necessarily kill them then comes sanitization so sanitization is another process by which microbial contamination is brought to a safe level and this process uh, refers primarily to the process of cleaning in a in animate the object so sanitization we in our daily lives also we are using the sanitization word why because after covid we are more health conscious we become more conscious uh, related to this uh, microorganism so sanit all, all time whenever we are eating our food or handling any important uh, food items we generally sanitize our hands so what is the uh, use or what is the basic principle uh, behind that so the basic aim or principle behind sanitization that to avoid the microbial contamination interference Means to make a surface or you can say uh, to make uh, our hand or uh, free from microbial contamination and make uh, it safe to handle further food items now moving to the next definition that says that decontamination decontamination it is a removal of microorganism with no 
quantitative implication the term is relative and uh, the end can be achieved by sterilization or disinfection when it uh, when a highly infectious or pathogenic organism is suspected to, of being present decontamination is the best achieved by a process that renders the material sterile so it is again at a, it is also a removal of microorganism and when it is removing microorganism so there is no quantitative implication there is no uh, you know uh, quantitative implication is there and the term is relative and uh, the end can be achieved by again sterilization and by disinfection now comes what is disinfection so disinfection it is a process that reduces or completely eliminate all the pathogenic uh, organism except spore spore so uh, uh, disinfection is again a process of uh, um, removal of microorganism so it eliminates all the pathogenic microorganism completely there is a it is a method that completely you know um, uh, eliminate all the pathogenic microorganism but it cannot remove the spore forming uh, microorganism then comes the germicide so it is again a substance that destroy microorganisms especially pathogenic microorganism a germicide does not destroy spore so it is again just like a disinfection that it completely uh, eliminate or destroy microorganism but does not kill the spore and uh, we have already dis uh, discussed about this sterilization again the use of physical or chemical procedure to completely eliminate or destroy all forms of microbial life this term is absolute and indicate complete freedom from microorganism and their spore so again uh, uh, sterilization is again a method uh, th through which it indicates a complete freedom from microorganism and their spore so that is the only reason why we always sterilize any item whether it's a food whether it's our hand whether it's our environment or whether it's any medical equipment or any food equipment we always sterilize them why because sterilization indicates a complete freedom from microorganism and their spore this is very important now moving to the next that is uh, type of uh, sterilization so sterilization method is divided into uh, two categories that is physical methods of sterilization and second is the chemical method of sterilization so in this particular lecture we will going to study about uh, the first part that is a physical method of sterilization so under this it is divided into uh, three categories the first one is heat sterilization second is filtration and uh, third is the uh, sound waves so under heat sterilization it comes the moist heat sterilization and dry heat sterilization when it is a moist heat sterilization it is divided into three categories based on the temperature so if we see the first category it says at a temperature below 100 degrees centigrade means you are killing or destroying microorganism at a temperature that is below 100 degrees centigrade then comes uh, the third the second that is at a temperature of 100 degrees centigrade you are destroying a microorganism at a temperature of 100 degrees centigrade then third is at a temperature above 100 degrees centigrade again you are killing or destroying microorganism at a temperature above 100 degrees centigrade then comes the heat dry heat sterilization in this heat red heat flaming incineration infrared radiation hot air oven is used to inactivate or destroy microorganisms then the second physical method of sterilization is filtration in this filtration sterilization of liquid take place filtration of sterilization of gas take place and then comes the irradiation so as the name su suggests irradiation means using the certain types of radiations or like ultraviolet rays or ionizing radiation you destroy or kill microorganism and then how the sound waves uh, you know destroy microorganisms sound waves also known as sonic so it uh, uh, is used to destroy microorganisms second is pressure uh, pressure uh, high pressure pro processing that is pascalization in this a very high uh, uh, density of pressure is used like 340 uh, kilo pascal for 15 minutes it is used to destroy microorganism then comes the sunlight means solar air disinfection means you need certain uh, you need a sunlight to you know disinf uh, uh, kill microorganism and get a freedom from different types of pathogens now we need certain types of agent that are used in sterilization so the first agent of the physical uh, is c sterilization is divided into two categories physical and chemical so if we talk about the physical uh, sterilization so to achieve that certain agent is required so those agents are known as the physical agent so the first agent is sunlight second is dry heat third is moist heat fourth is filtration fifth is radiation and sixth is ultrasonic and sonic vibration that we have discussed in the previous slides then when it comes to the chemical agent so it requires alcohol that is ethyl isopropanol trichlorobutanol aldehydes like formaldehyde glutar aldehyde halogens phenol surface active agent metallic salt gases so these are certain chemical agents that are used to sterilize any uh, surface or food uh, food product or medical equipments then uh, under the physical agent so physical agent are usually prefer over a chemical agent for performing sterilization when it comes a uh, for a choice then you usually uh, refer physical agents over the chemical agent 
Heat is one of the one form or another occupies the most important place as a physical agent to sterilize. It is a method of choice wherever possible. Both moist as well as dry heat can be applied. So uh, in physical agent also we generally use heat. Uh, heat. So heat is the uh, first uh, uh, you can say the choice for any microbiologist or a person who is performing the sterilization. Why? Because um, it uh, is the uh, uh, most uh, uh, you know uh, important. You can say that this is the most choice hai, important choice hai to use heat. Uh, both the dry heat as well as the moist is to play a very important role in killing the killing of microorganisms so if we comes to the moist heat then uh, this is a heating uh, in the presence, uh, presence of water and can be employed in the following ways so in this uh, in this uh, you use the heat in the presence of water so you need a uh, you know you can say a boiling water is used to inactivate or destroy microorganism so the temperature below 100 degree centigrade uh, temperature around 100 degree centigrade and temperature above 100 degree centigrade so when it comes the temperature below 100 degree centigrade so it is the best and widely used example of these techniques are holder um, holder method of pressurization where 60 degrees on the where Temperature 60 degrees centigrade for 30 minutes is employed for sterilization and the flash modification of some wherein objects are subjected to the temperature of 71 degrees centigrade for 15 seconds. So whenever it's a temperature that is below 100 degrees centigrade, then how this temperature helps in killing of microorganisms? So it is a best method is method to explain this is pressurization. So we all know that we pressurize the milk in our, our home so the temperature is 30 degree centigrade 60 degree temperature uh, degree centigrade means you are pressurizing any liquid uh, product at uh, 160 uh, degree centigrade for 30 minutes when it is a flash pressurization so it is a more advanced form of uh, pressurization where you require a higher temperature than this um, 60 degree so that uh, that is the temperature is 71 degree centigrade and here flash means uh, you need a very lesser time that is for only for 15 seconds Okay, so it widely or you can say it kills the microorganisms in a very faster way as compared to the normal pressurization. Then comes temperature around 100 degrees centigrade. So tenderization is an example of this methodology in which steaming of object is done for 30 minutes on which um, of uh, this uh, three consecutive days the principle is that a spore which survived the heating process would germinate before the next thermal exposure and would be killed. So the second is a temperature around 100 degrees centigrade. So in this steam uh, is used uh, to uh, you know kill microorganism how you do steaming of an object uh, at uh, 30 minutes on each three consecutive days means on the three consecutive days you do the steaming of the object this kills the spore of um, forming microorganism means sometimes uh, the microorganism get uh, deteriorated or they are uh, get killed at a uh, uh, heating temperature but there are certain microorganisms that uh, that forms the spore they cannot be killed at that temperature so the, during this steaming and uh, for 30 minutes for, for each three consecutive days they can easily the spore um, uh, of the microorganism can easily be killed now comes the next that is temperature above 100 degrees centigrade so whatever the temperature is above 100 degrees centigrade let's say a dry saturated steam act as an excellent agent agent for sterilization because of the following reason so whenever we are using a temperature that is above 100 degrees centigrade so it is an excellent mode of uh, uh, agent to kill microorganism by the dry saturated you know steam act as an excellent um, agent for sterilization of uh, uh, of uh, different types of microorganism uh, sterilization of equipments to kill microorganism so it is used to so that uh, because of a high temperature wealth of the latent heat ability to form water of condensation in uh, instantaneous instant Instantaneous contraction in volume that occurred during condensation. Superheat, superheated steam is not that effective because it is hotter than dry saturated steam and the process uh, is akin to dry heat which is not as efficient as moist heat. As told you that superheated steam is not that effective. Why it is not effective? Because it is hotter than dry saturated steam. It is very hotter as compared to dry saturated steam and the process is uh, akin to dry heat and it is not efficient as moist heat. Now moving to the next that is sterilization. So we are using this term again and again sterilization. So let's uh, come into the detail that sterilization it is a process of destroying ink or physically removing all forms of microbial life including vegetative cells, spore and virus from surface, a medium or an article. So, uh, so uh, sterilization is nothing but it is a process of destroying or um, or you can say physically removing all forms of microbial life. So, whenever it's a microbial life, then it includes a vegetative cell, spore and viruses from the surface, from the medium or from any food item or anything, right? So, making an environment or uh, in making a, a place that is free from any source of microbial contamination. So, what is the reason behind that? What is the principle or you can say uh, what why sterilization is used? So, the first principle is to prevent the transmission of diseases and infections. Then comes the to prevent the contamination of undesirable microorganisms to prevent the, uh, the deterioration and spoilage of particles by microorganisms. 
Now comes the method of sterilization employed uh, depends on the purpose for which sterilization is carried out. The material which has to be sterilized and the nature of microorganisms that are not removed or destroyed. The various agents used in sterilization can be grouped into physical and chemical that we have already covered. Like depending upon the uh, type of thing that you want to sterilize, whether you are you want to sterilize any equipment, whether you want to sterilize any food particles and uh, whether you want to sterilize any medical equipment or medical uh, um, drugs. So different type method of sterilization is used to carry out uh, sterilization and they need certain they require certain types of physical as well as chemical agent to carry it out that we have discussed in our previous slides so uh, the first uh, that is again sunlight so sunlight it is a um, type of a physical agent where a direct sunlight has an active germicidal effect due to the combined effect of the ultraviolet radiation and the heat so this is a very natural method of sterilization without using of any types of chemicals then comes drying so moisture is essential for the growth of bacteria drying in the air has therefore a de de deleterious effect on many bacteria but spores are unaffected by drying hence this is very unreliable method so again after sunlight drying is another type of physical method to you know destroy microorganism as uh, you all know that my bacteria uh, grow uh, in a very well where the moisture content is high so it is very much important to remove that those type of moisture uh, to uh, you know inhibit the growth of microorganisms so uh, yeah, drying is used to you know um, uh, to kill uh, different types of microorganisms but spores are again unaffected by drying means spores are not killed through this drying method then comes the heat heat has a uh, killing effect on microorganisms and is one of the most popular reliable method to destroy as we have already discussed this microorganisms has a minimum optimum and maximum growth on temperature so temperature below the minimum usually produces static that is inhibition of metabolisms so whenever heat is required so heat has a very uh, important effect or you can say it is a very important sterilization technique where heat has a killing effect on microorganism and it is one of the most popular method to destroy them so microorganism usually uh, survive after uh, at different growth temperature means they are um, microorganism has a minimum um, growth temperature some they have maximum growth some uh, can grow on in the optimum range of temperature so temperature uh, usually is a very much in, uh, plays a very much important role whenever there is a microorganism is concerned so temperature the below the minimum they usually produces the static means inhibition of metabolism now moving to the next that is physical method so we have already discussed this now we will going to see some more physical methods so the rate the killing rate of heat may be expressed as a function of time and temperature each microbial species uh, uh, has a thermal death time so each microbial species has a thermal death time so this is very much important whenever mcqs is concerned or whenever you are going to give any sort of interviews that what is td t that is thermal death time so the rate of killing the rate uh, the killing rate of heat may be expressed as a function of time and temperature means what is the time what is the temperature at which killing is taking place so uh, the each microbial species has t dt that is thermal death time at which they are killed at what time they or matlab ki how much time they needed to be killed at a particular temperature so it is a minimum time required to kill a population of microorganism m of a microorganism in a microbial suspension at a given temperature under a defined condition each species has a thermal death point so it is a minimum time that is required to kill microorganisms population at a given temperature let's say at 15 degree centigrade it is uh, microorganism is killed in 3 seconds so that uh, known as the minimum time to kill the micro organism but you required a appropriate temperature to kill them so in determining in determining the same in determining the same temperature and time microorganism m and destruction have with the least uh, with the least heat um, uh, with the heat the following factors are considered so what are the following factor to be kept in mind while killing any the microorganism or while disturbing their population is the type of microorganism to be killed and um, second is type of material to be treated presence of organic material matter and acidic or basic nature of the material so depending upon the uh, type of organism you want to kill so it determine matlab ki when uh, in determining the time and temperature so microorganism have different types of uh, you know uh, temperature or type or at what temperature they can be killed if it is a thermophile so they can only be killed at a higher temperature if they are sacrophiles so they can be killed at that particular temperature so depending upon the type of microorganism it be killed what are the different types of material that you are using the presence of organic matter even the acidic and basic nature of the material now comes the uh, uh, insulination so insulination is nothing but it is uh, but they are used to destroy disposable or expendable material by burning we also sterilize our inoculating loop by insulination in the uh, one of uh, of this lecture uh, of medical uh, uh, microbiology we have uh, uh, studied this insulination in a very uh, detail um, in very detail so you can refer that lecture for insulination um, you can simply uh, in this you can 
specifically understand that insulination is also used to destroy uh, uh, the microorganism and it is mainly done uh, for, uh, by, for inoculating loop and ins or inoculating needles. Then come pressurization again. Pressurization is also a method to kill microorganisms. Pressurization is a mild heating of milk and other material to kill particularly spoilage organisms or pathogens. So it is not a concern only with the milk. It is concerned with the uh, fruit juices uh, and uh, milk and uh, any types of uh, uh, you know juices that are made made with fruits. And um, if you are doing uh, the mild pressurization, to only say 60 minutes is uh, temperature is required for only 30 minutes. But if you are uh, using a flash pressurization, then uh, uh, 71 degree temperature is required for 15 seconds right so um, milk is usually pressurized by heating at uh, 271 degree centigrade for at least 15 seconds this is known as flash pressurization low temperature again low temperature inhibit the microbial growth by slowing down the microbial metabolism including including refrigeration and freezing so uh, this is low temperature like it inhibits the microbial growth how they inhibit the growth by slowing down uh, the mi uh, microbial metabolism so it includes refrigeration or freezing sometimes we freeze uh, or refrigerate uh, food pro products or any medical uh, products uh, drug why just to inhibit their microbial metabolism so what uh, freeze uh, refrigeration at uh, 5 degrees centigrade it slows down the growth of microorganism and keep food fresh for a few days even uh, at freezing at minus 10 degrees centigrade it stops the microbial growth at 5 it slow down but at minus 10 it stops the microbial growth but generally does not kill microorganism and keeps the food fresh for several months they does not you know properly kill the microorganism but it slow down or it you know um, it slow down or you can say it stop the microbial growth and uh, keeping them a uh, keeping a food fresh for uh, several months now moving to the radiation so radiation whenever it's a radiation so radiation is another method of preserving um, any medical uh, equipment or drug or any food so what is this so a radiation uh, required now the first one is ultra ra ultraviolet radiation so the ultraviolet radiation uh, ultraviolet pro portion of the light spectrum include all radiation with a wavelength of 100 nm to 400 nm it has a low wave uh, length and low energy the micro uh, microcidal activity of uv light depends on the length of exposure that is the longer the exposure the greater will be the activity means how long you are exposing a uh, uh, item or equipment and um, uh, um, how uh, how fast you get uh, the uh, you get free from microorganism so it also depends on the wavelength of uv use the most um, impo uh, used wavelength of uh, uv light lie in th 260 nm to th 270 nm range range where it is absorbed by the nucleic acid so in term of this uh, mode of action uv light is absorbed by microbial uh, DNA and causes adjacent thymine based on the same DNA strand to covalently bond together forming what are called thymine thymine thymus. Then comes the ionizing re radiation. So ionizing radiation such as X-rays, gamma rays has much more energy and penetrating power than ultraviolet rays. It ionizing ionizes water and other molecule to form a radical that is a molecule fragment with unpaired electron. That can destruct DNA molecule and protein. It often used to sterilize pharmaceutical and disposable medicines, medical uh, uh, medical uh, uh, medical supplies such as syringe, uh, surgical gloves, uh, petri dishes. It can also be used to retard the spoilage in seafoods, meat, poultry, uh, and uh, fruits use uh, fruit uh, fruits. So uh, ionization radiation is the most uh, important radiation that is used as compared to X rays and gamma rays because it has a more penetrating power than UV rays. So what does it do? It is mainly used to sterilize any medical equipment uh, like uh, surgical uh, gloves, uh, like syringes. It is. Uh, has a very much important uh, importance in medicals now comes the filtration so microbiological so whenever it is a filtration so microbiological uh, membrane filters provide a very useful way of sterilizing material such as vaccine antibiotic solution animal sera enzyme solution vitamin solution and other solution that may be damaged or denatured by high temperature or chemical agents so filtration is another mode of uh, sterilization where it uh, is uh, sterilizing uh, sterilizing material such as vaccine antibiotic solutions or enzyme solution vitamin solution so mainly it has an importance in medical sciences though the filter so the filters contain a spore small enough to prevent passage of microbes but a large uh, enough to allow the organism free liquid to pass the liquid is then collected in the sterile fl uh, flask filter with a pore uh, diameter from 25 to 0.4 uh, micrometer uh, uh, are usually used in this procedure so filter can also be used to remove microorganism from water and air for microbiological testing in this lecture we will going to study about our part 2 of disinfection and chemical sterilization that is chemical method so in the previous lecture we have covered the physical method of sterilization and disinfection that how physical method is used to uh, avoid any microbial contamination and to make a surface equipment and any food item any medical item free from microorganism and we have seen different types of physical agents that play an important role in sterilizing uh, the food product medical product or the equipment so in this lecture we will going to see the chemical method of sterilization and disinfection so what is chemical method of sterilization? Chemicals are the down-to-earth substance 
in the microbiology laboratory. Despite the effect of some chemicals are dangerous, they are really great for killing numerous invisible microbes. Chemical methods are easy and economic friendly, thus it became a popular. Chemical can act as a disinfectant to destroy pathogenic bacteria from upper surface. So this chemical is very important sub uh, substance in any laboratory whenever it is concerned with a uh, uh, you know microbiological uh, lab uh, uh, laboratory. So it is very important for a microbiology laboratory so we all are aware that chemicals have some effect some chemical effect and those chemical effects are very much dangerous but if you avoid that thing there are certain chemicals that are really good for killing numerous invisible microbes that are pathogenics and non-pathogenic microorganisms so this chemical method are very easy they are economic friendly and that is the reason they become very popular chemical can act as a disinfectant to destroy the pathogenic bacteria for the upper surface from the upper surface now moving to the next status the chemical method if you see the chemical method so chemical method is divided into two phases that is liquid and the gaseous liquid under the liquid alcohols aldehydes phenolics halogens heavy metals surface active agents and dyes are used as a agent or you can say they act as a important source for chemical method to perform their function apart from that uh, gaseous has formaldehyde ethylene oxidase and beta pro pyrolo uh, like to electron um, and these uh, is also uh, is used to you know avoid any contamination that is been going to happen with the microorganism now moving to the ideal properties of chemical sterilization so what are the ideal properties of chemical sterilization so the wide spectrum of activity it has the first property is that it has a very wide spectrum of activity second property is active in presence of organic matter they are very effective in acid as well as alkaline media so it is active in acid as well as in the alkaline media then they have a very high penetration power they are very stable they have a very speedy action they are compatible with other antiseptics and disinfectants they are very safe and easy to use and apart from this they are very cheap and easily available they do not require any chlorate metals so these are certain ideal properties of chemical sterilization so the most important is it is safe and easy to use it has a very high penetration power whenever i'm saying high penetration power which simply means that they can easily kill the number of bacteria or even the microbes that are really very invisible because of the high penetrating power so it can easily uh, kill and with lesser time because the action time is very speedy and they are very stable and uh, easily available in the market now moving to the next that is mode of action of chemical disinfectant how this mode of chemical infection uh, disinfection take place means what uh, is the mode of action so it act uh, by a protein coagulation first is uh, the act is done by protein coagulation second is disruption of the cell membrane result in exposure damage and loss of content removal of freely sulfur hydryl group essential for functioning of enzyme whenever it um, removes the sulfur aldehyl group so it becomes very essential for the functioning of enzyme if you are removing this then of course you are uh, prohibiting the enzymatic activity then fourth point says substrate competition means a compound resembling the substrate uh, essential substrate of the enzyme it diverts the enzyme necessary for the metabolism of cell and they also cause a cell death this is the mode of uh, action of chemical uh, disinfections so as far as the uh, uh, in action is concerned we have completed this now moving to the uh, this chart that is liquid uh, air liquid so in liquid chemical method it contains the first is alcohol so how alcohol act as a chemical method how alcohol you know helps to sterilize or uh, the uh, any equipment or my, uh, it, how it removes the microorganism let's quickly see that so alcohol mainly eth eth ethanol that is 80 uh, percent volume by volume ethanol or isopropanol alcohol that is 70 60 to 70 percent volume by volume solution are used to disinfect it skin and occur the uh, contaminates clean surface so mainly uh, in alcohols if we see there are various type of alcohol the main alcohol that is here is using in to uh, you know disinfect the skin and to contaminate the clean surface is ethanol and isopropanol alcohol so if you are taking ethanol then you take 80 percent of ethanol is used and if you are taking isopropanol then 60 to 70% of isoethanol is used to disinfect the skin and decontamination contaminate the clean surface. Then comes methanol. So methanol is also used as a disinfectant but is less bacterial cider and then ethanol and highly poisonous. So as compared to ethanol, methanol is very much uh, poisonous as compared to ethanol and uh, it is uh, less, uh, it uh, is used as a disinfectant but uh, uh, it has a very uh, less bacterial cider than um, ethanol. So as compared to ethanol, it is not much used because 
of its lesser bactericidal property. On other alcohols such as propyl, propyl butyl, amyl alcohols are also be used and they are very powerful uh, germicidal than ethanol. So apart from ethanol, the other alcohols such as propyl, butyl, amyl alcohols, they have a very powerful germicidal then ethanol. So alcohols are very effective against fungi, vegetative bacteria, mycobacterium species and some liquid containing viruses. So they contain, they have a very effective, they are very effective against different types of microorganisms, let's say fungi, vegetative bacteria, mycobacterium species and some type of lipid containing viruses. Now the third point says they are more effective at the concentration of 70% in water. So uh, if in MCQs or interviews, if you uh, if they ask you what is the effective concentration of alcohol uh, that is used to, you know, um, in microorganism, that is 70% in water. In, in tinctures, uh, alcohols enhances the effectiveness of other antimicrobial chemicals. Now coming to the principle of this so if the principle uh, it based on a principle of denaturing coagulating protein and dissolving number of membrane lipids of the microorganism so what is the basic difference uh, principle so the basic principle is to denature the denaturing the coagulating protein as well as it helps in dissolving the membrane lipid of the microorganism now comes the advantages and disadvantages of using alcohol. So everything that, that we use to uh, de uh, use to decontaminate uh, uh, the microorganism has several advantages and they have at least disadvantages. So what are the advantages of using alcohol? So the first advantage is it is inexpensive and non-toxic. It is widely available. It is very effective. It has uh, it is very active against bacteria virus mycobacterium so these are certain advantages of alcohol then comes the disadvantages so it is not effective against bacterial spore that we have already discussed means they do not have the bactericidal properties for example methanol they are not effective with organic material so when combined with her when it is given to the organic material so it is not effective to that so these are certain disadvantages of using alcohol now next is aldehyde. So they are a low molecular weight compound and act as an antimicrobial. So the most important two aldehydes are formaldehyde and butaldehyde. So aldehydes are another substance that are used, uh, or you can say another compound that are used, and uh, they act as an antimicrobial. They act as an antimicrobial. They uh, they uh, you know they work against the microbes and uh, they have a very lower molecular weight. And uh, the two important aldehyde is former aldehyde and glutra aldehyde. So if two percent solution of glutra aldehyde, um, it is known as Cerex, which is used for bactericidal and uh, very cidal if in ten minutes and sidal in 3 to 10 hours so both these compounds are highly micro and uh, uh, microbial and also kill the spore so because of its concentration and because of its time it is um, these compounds are very uh, highly micro micro sidal and also kill the spore forming in microorganism also so they do the complete killing of microorganisms so the two important are formaldehyde and glutaraldehyde so let's talk about the formaldehyde so this formaldehyde is also known as uh, uh, also a common aldehyde which is a gas uh, gas it is a type of a gas in a high concentration but at a room temperature so concentration is very high at which temperature at the room temperature so what does it do it polymerizes and forms a solid substances it po uh, polarizes and forms a solid substance then formaldehyde solution as well as in the gaseous form used for the sterilization so this formaldehyde solution and, uh, is used as a um, uh, 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 solution as well as in the gaseous form it is used for the sterilization and disinfection of enclosed area respectively where vegetative cells are killed more quickly than spore so uh, the, uh, this formo aldehyde solution and they are uh, very well in the they work very well in the gaseous form because they are gaseous in nature when uh, and and they are very high they have a very high concentration at the room temperature so this formal aldehyde solution uh, they uh, they work very well uh, uh, in the gaseous form and it is used for sterilization whenever they are using uh, used as a sterilization and disinfection so they kill the vegetative cell more quickly than the spore now moving to the principle. So aldehydes combine with an important protein and nucleic acid. So they mostly combine with the important nucleic acid uh, and uh, so now if we look uh, at the principle so the principle says so aldehyde it combines with important proteins and nucleic acid of the bacterial cell so the bac uh, bac see if this is a bacterial cell so uh, it has certain uh, protein as well as the nucleic acid so this aldehyde so what does it do it combines with protein and nucleic acid of this bacterial cell so these when these interaction take place uh, so this interaction of an aldehyde with these cellular substance it produces an antimicrobial action so after after combining with the protein and nucleic acid so what does it makes it forms a antimicrobial action produces an antimicrobial uh, action and after producing an antimicrobial action they uh, uh, they you know uh, they uh, inactivates the microorganism by alkylating the amino acid and with the uh, sulfur group of protein and ring nitrogen 
items of the purine bases so all, already i have told you that sulfhydryl groups are the groups that uh, uh, that uh, helps in enzymatic activity so because of this they inactivate the sulfhydryl group and thus uh, uh, inactivating the molecules then if we see the advantages and disadvantages of aldehyde so the advantage of aldehyde says they have a good activity against spore viruses and fungi when it comes to the disadvantage of aldehyde so they are toxic they need a longer exposure time for action a minimum of 3 hours so uh, they required a longer ex Uh, uh, exposure time for the action so basically it required uh, uh, minimum time is 3 hours so the freshness and ph are very critical so the freshness and the ph to achieve is very critical they are uh, irritant and carcinogenic in nature now moving to the halogens part so halogens mainly iodine uh, chlorines are used uh, as a antimicrobial agent so iodine that is used as a antiseptic amongst uh, against all microbes fungi and viruses so halogens um, it includes mainly iodine and chlorine so halogens contain iodine and chlorine and used as a antimicrobial agent so this uh, iodine has a very antiseptic uh, against the microbes like fungi and viruses what does it do it, it inhibits the protein synthesis and it oxidizes the sulfur hydroxyl group of amino acid so these are various preparation of iodine such as 2% iodine plus 2% sodium iodide diluted in alcohol 7% iodine plus 5% potassium iodine iodide in 83% alcohol 5% iodine plus 10% potassium iodide in a aqueous solution so this is a preparation to make iodine against the microbial activity so this is very important how the iodine preparation take place now moving to the chlorine so chlorine is the another uh, disinfectant and a group of halogens so uh, this uh, uh, chlorine that is hypochlorous acid that is, that is hocl is an aqueous solution of chlorine which is used as a disinfectant some other compounds like calcium hypochlorite sodium hy chloride etc are used in the preparation of chlorine so chlor uh, chloromines are also chlorinated compounds which act as a antiseptics so a chlorine is another form of disinfection that also helps to inactivate the microorganism and they are very antiseptic in nature now comes the principle of this if we see the principle of iodine and chlorinated compounds then iodine is an oxidizing agent these agent are uh, irreversibly oxidize and inactivate essential meta metabolic compounds like protein with sulfur diol and diol group it also it uh, also has a halogenation action of tyrosine in a unit of enzyme and other cellular protein that are required for the tyrosine for the activity so if we see the chlorinated compound it shows the micro uh, uh, antimicrobial activity due to the formation of hypochlorous acid in water this hypochlorous acid uh, is further decomposes into a nascent oxygen which show a strong oxidation reaction basically they both are, if we talk about iodine so it has a it is an oxidizing agent whereas if we talk about the chlorine so it shows a antimicrobial activity how due to the formation of hypochlorous acid in water now moving to the advantages and disadvantages of iodine so if you see the advantages of iodine so iodine compounds are they are very effective against the gram positive bacteria they produce a residual activity so they retain microbial action in the presence of uh, organic debris they are available in solution spray and in gel preparation what are the disadvantages so iodine compounds when used uh, alone are major irritant so it must be accompanied with another compound they are weak against mycobacteria fungi and viruses they are absorbed into the skin and they may be toxic they can cause first and second degree burns so this are the these are the certain disadvantages of iodine compounds then moving to the advantages of a chlorine compound and disadvantages of fluorine compound so if you see the uh, advantages of chlorine compound the first is they are very cheap and readily available available in the market then comes the chlorine is highly soluble in water so they leave a residue in the solution only they are very toxic to most of the microorganisms so they can microorganism completely they remove iron and magnesium and ammonia nitrogen during the oxidation they destroy the red taste and other odd or odor compound Uh, and this advantages if we talk about so chlorine is a poisonous and toxic gas as we all know this uh, that it is very poisonous and toxic in nature they are very corrosive require a special non metal coagulants they require a careful handling operation and storage the vapor of chlorine are very irrelevant now these are certain advantages and disadvantages of the chlorine now moving to the basic difference of uh, between uh, disinfection and sterilization so disinfection it is a process of elimination of pathogenic microorganism however the process is not effective in case of vegetative spore so uh, in disinfection it uh, it is a process of elimination of pathogenic microorganism but it is not effective in the case of the vegetative spore whereas where in sterilization it uh, it refers to any process that eliminates remove or kill or deactivate all forms of life other uh, and other bio logical agent present in a specified region so it only eliminate or here they are they eliminate remove kill or deactivate all forms of life and other biological agent so this this is a very basic uh, difference that between disinfection and sterilization in interviews in examination this is the major question that will going to ask uh, uh, that will be going to be there in your examination paper or wherever you are going uh, you are going to give an interview we will going to study about antimicrobial chemotherapy so it is a very important topic of this my 
medical microbiology adds it deals with how antimicrobial therapies work what are the different sources of antimic antimicrobial chemotherapy what is antimicrobial chemotherapy and where it plays a very important role in which kind of patient and what are the diseases that are associated with this so let's get started with the topic and let's see what are antibiotics and antimicrobial so if we talk about antibiotics so is a lower molecular substance produced by microorganism that is both molds and bacteria that at a low concentration at inhibits or kill other microorganisms so whenever we all are familiar with this term antibiotic so it has a very lower molecular substance means it's uh, it is very small but it is produced by microorganism example molds and bacteria at a very lower concentration and it inhibits or kills other microorganisms so they are made up of this molds and bacteria but they are used in a very lower concentration and they inhibit the other microorganism as well as it kills other microorganism we all know that this antibiotics we uh, when we fall ill when we have a fever when we are having any sort of sort of diseases then we generally use antibiotics so antimicrobial what is antimicrobial so uh, first of all let's understand this term antibiotic like we all know that this biotic is living so against this living whenever it is uh, when whosoever is working against this uh, living is known as antibiotic means we are killing this living organisms we are working against this living and what is this living is microorganisms same with the case is with uh, with uh, this uh, antimicrobial so what are antimicrobial as the word suggests anti means against and microbes means microorganisms pathogenic microorganisms so uh, is in any substance of natural semi synthetic or synthetic origin that kills or inhibit the growth of microorganisms so it is a substance that is produced naturally or they are produced as a semi synthetic or synthetic origin means uh, or a substance would be like natural of natural origin it would be of semi synthetic or it would be a synthetic origin that kills or inhibit the growth of microorganism but causes little or no damage to the host means they are killing microorganisms they are killing the pathogenic microorganism but they did, did not cause uh, any damage to the host means humans so we all know that this antimicrobial it work against microorganisms like it kills microorganism and to an extent that it inhibit their further growth it inhibit their growth as well as it does not cause any uh, you know uh, source of damage to the host then comes before before let's start about the anti types of antimicrobial chemotherapy but before that let's talk about one thing that all antibiotics are antimicrobial but not if all antimicrobials are antibiotic this is very much important students like all antibiotics means whose jitne bhi antibiotics and they are not antimicrobials sorry they are antimicrobials means they possess the quality of antimicrobials but not all antimicrobials are antibiotics means they do not possess the quality of antibiotics antibiotics possess the quality of antimicrobials but whereas antimicrobial is concerned does not possess any quality of antibiotics then comes the type of uh, antimicrobial chemotherapy so whenever it's a type of antimicrobial so it is divided into four categories the first is anti micro antibacterial chemotherapy second is anti protozoal chemotherapy third type is anti fungal chemotherapy and the last is antiviral chemotherapy so whenever it it is anti bacteria chemotherapy so this type of chemotherapy it you know always associated with bacteria means it works against the growth of bacteria it inhibits the growth of bacteria now comes the anti protozoal means it always work against protozoa species then comes anti fungal so it is a type of a uh, uh, chemotherapy that works against fungi that against the fungal infection then comes the antiviral uh, means it always work against the viruses so means this type of therapy always work against the viruses now comes what are antimicrobial agents so to perform this antimicrobial activity you need certain types of antigens also or sorry agents also that can be easily perform the task of antimicrobial so antimicrobial agents they are the substances that can stop or slow down the growth of microorganisms such as bacteria fungi and pest means they are the substances that stop or you can say inhibit or sometimes even they slow down the growth of microorganisms like uh, for example bacteria is there fungi is there pests are there viruses are there so uh, some uh, important uh, agents are pesticides sterilizers sanitizers and disinfectant and the third is the medication so whenever the agent are concerned the important agents include pesticides sterilizers or you can say simple ster sanitization and uh, disinfection uh, disinfectants and uh, the third is the medications so whenever it's a pesticide so pesticides helps to kill or and repel parasites and small insects such as fleas and ticks so pesticide um, this type of uh, you know antimicrobial agents are mainly used in agriculture industries 
for agriculture farms where uh, they are uh, act as a agent uh, to kill or you can say uh, repel the uh, kill and repel parasites and in and it also include a small insect such as fleas and ticks now comes the sterilizers or sanitizers and disinfectants so these are the antimicrobials that are used to clean the surface water uh, sorry clothes hands and other places microorganism live they include common products like bleach alcohol antimicrobial soaps and hand sanitizers we all are familiar with the sanitizer or sterilizer or disinfectant because we all have covered these in our previous lecture so here it is says see these antimicrobials they are always used to clean the surfaces surfaces of your clothes surfaces of your hands and even other places where microorganism can live so they includes like bleach you can bleach the clothes mostly all the you know hotel uh, bed sheets uh, if, in fact the all the railway bed sheets and everything you do bleaching of that why uh, because just to kill or eliminate if any microorganism is there then comes the alcohol we so we generally use ethyl alcohol to wipe off uh, the microorganisms we use antibacterial soaps uh, just to clean our hands while performing any experiments or while working in laboratory industries so, and now this just after the covid virus we all are very uh, you know familiar with the sanitizers and this hand hand uh, sanitizers is a no, not sanitizer it's sanitizer sorry students so the sanitizers are very important why just to wipe off all the sort of bacteria that are associated with the, uh, our hands and to kill them and to you know make our hand uh, you know free from any source of pathogens then comes the medications so antimicrobial medicines medications they include antibiotics antifungals antivirals and anti parasites that works against different types of microorganism and also help them to remove them from the surfaces or even from the body of a human being or uh, any living host without uh, um you know damaging or without you can say uh you know without causing any little uh, you know damage to a human beings or the host then comes uh, the antimicrobial uh, chemo uh, chemotherapeutic agents so these are some antimicrobial agents now when it comes to the antimicrobial chemotherapeutic agents so um, so they includes antimicrobial chemotherapy so it uses or uh, it uh, is the use of chemical to inhibit or kill microorganism in the host so so ever microorganism is present in the host let's like, say bacteria fungi or any sort of viruses so antimicrobial chemotherapy is agent they are the chemicals and they inhibit or kill the microorganisms then comes the selective toxicity so this means that uh, that the agent that use uh, that used to or must inhibit or kill the microorganism without seriously damaging the host so all the agents whether it's uh, antimicrobial or therapeutic uh, chemotherapeutic agents so all these agents they inhibit or they kill the microorganism without uh, you know harming the host so based on their original uh, origin there are two general classes of anti microbial chemotherapeutic agent the first one is <coughs> antibiotics and second is antimicrobial therapeutic chemicals so based on the types of origin so they are divided into two groups the first is antibiotics and second is antimicrobial therapeutic chemotherapeutic chemicals so antibiotics so these are the substances that are produced as a metabolic product of one um, organism microorganism which inhibit or kill the other microorganism and second is antimicrobial chemo chemotherapeutic chemicals so these are the chemicals that synthesized in the laboratory which can be used therapeutically on microorganisms so antibiotics these are the substances that are produced as a metabolic products uh, of one organisms so microorganisms like for example if uh, they can also be produced from bacteria or molds and with a very lower concentration but it inhibit or kill the my other microorganisms then comes the antimicrobial chemotherapeutic chemicals so these are the chemical that are uh, since it is chemical <coughs> chemical in origin so they are synthesized in the laboratory and they are used as a therapeutically on microorganism and inhibiting their growth without further damages to the host then comes what are the use of antimicrobial chemotherapy means what is the basic use so antimicrobial chemotherapy has very has many important uses uh, in healthcare treating infections is one of the primarily used so it is basically used to treat uh, any sort of infection and this is its primarily use and apart from treating infection they uh, they are also used in the treatment of different types of uh, you know bacterial viral fungal parasitic or other types of infection then comes the two that is bacteriostatics and bactericidal so these are very important uh, point to understand what is bacteriostatics and what is bactericidal so if we talk about the first one that is bacteriostatics so they inhibit the growth of bacteria but they generally do not kill the bacteria means they inhibit they uh, means rok deta hai bacterial ki growth without uh, killing them they do not kill but they inhibit their growth means there should not be further growth examples uh, like protein synthesis inhibitors then comes uh, bactericidal so they uh, they are the agent that kills the target bacteria so, okay so like for example bacterial uh, bacteria bacteria 
present bacteria present as the uh, you know bactericide so uh, bacteriostatic what is the basic difference so bacteriostatics they inhibit the growth without killing them but in bactericidal they uh, are the agents that kills the target bacteria means they are killing the target bacteria without uh, you know inhibiting their growth so, so how is antimicrobial chemotherapy is delivered so the delivery of antimicrobial chemotherapy it depends up, uh, depends on the type as well as the strength of antimicrobial chemotherapy that someone is receiving right so basically they uh, are they, uh, they, they they generally depends on the type and strength of antimicrobial chemotherapy that someone is receiving for example some bacterial infections are treated with intravariants uh, that is iv antibiotics during uh, in an inpatient hospital stay so when a person is staying in a hospital in, and it and a uh, patient is having any bacterial infection so it is treated with iv intravenous antibiotics right then it says it may take several rounds of antibiotics for an infection to clear up as i think is only in a one dose uh, the infection can be cured no there must be several rounds just to clear up with the infection uh, 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 as it is very severe or if a bacteria strain is antibiotic resistant because sometimes bacteria strain is uh, resistant to certain types of antibiotics so you need several round means only not in a very first round uh, the infection would be clear so you need a several types uh, se several uh, rounds to clear up uh, with the infections then comes the viral infection so viral infections are sometimes uh, they are treated with uh, multiple injections given at a regular intervals for a set of number of days or even weeks so whenever you are having any viral infections so you, ne you need a certain types of injection that would be given at a regular interval of times or you can say at a regular intervals of days or sometimes even the weeks to treat the viral infection <laughs> again the reason is that uh, sometimes they are antibiotic resistant then some uh, some antimicrobial chemotherapy can be taken at home as a standard of oral medicine that we generally we users like we take paracetamol when we are having a fever so apart from paracetamol we take an antibiotics like azithromycin right so it is a dose of three days if you have a fever and you are taking an oral medic medication at our you at your place so you take paracetamol with uh, accompanied with uh, this um, uh, azithromycin once in a day and it is recommended to take three days course do, um, course of azithromycin so it may uh, inhibit the uh, growth as well as clear the infection so some antimicrobial chemotherapy can be taken uh, at home as a oral uh, medication your specification a specific infection and the severity of your symptoms will determine how antimicrobial chemotherapy is delivered means depending if it is a very mild fever so you can take uh, the oral medicine in your uh, home but if the fever is a uh, very harsh and very high and uh, it could not be treated at your place so you go to the hospital so you see any physician to cure up uh, with this uh, type of infection as in in, uh, in hospitals they perform they can give you a uh, certain types of inf uh, injections or uh, they give you a uh, certain types of uh, you know uh, anti antibiotics for that particular infection to clear up so this is uh, about how antimicrobial chemotherapy uh, mainly works then comes the major classes of antibiotics so what are the major classes of antibiotics sorry so uh, the first major sorry the first major classes of antibiotics is penicillin so it is produced by a mold that is penicillium then the second class, uh, major class of antibiotics is a uh, uh, cephalosporin so it is uh, produced by mold cephalosporium then comes the third is the bacteriocyan that is produced by bacillus uh, lecithiniformis then comes the polymyxin uh, six they are produced by bacillus poly uh, polymyxa then comes the aminoglycosides so they are produced by streptomycin gracious so these are the major classes of antibiotics uh, so the first of uh, first and the most important is penicillium so let's see what is penicillium so penicillium is a medication uh, that are used to manage and treat the viral infections uh, uh, treat a wide range of infection not viral uh, a wide range of infection so it is one of the beta lactam antibiotic classes of drugs and um, their activity basically describe the penicillin indication uh, actions and con uh, contradictions as a valuable agent in treating the infection then comes how do uh, penicillin work so penicillin work uh, uh, so they are the groups of antimicrobial agent and, uh, that attack a wide range of bacteria so they uh, they were the first drug of this type that doctors use so basically penicillin or you can say a group of penicillin so they are the group of antibacterial drug uh, this is the first drug that uh, the doctors used to cure any type source of viral infection uh, or you can say uh, infection so the discovery and manufacturing of penicillins have changed the face of medicine as these drugs have served millions of lives then comes penicillin fungi are the source of penicillin which people can take orally or via injection people across the group are now uh, widely used penicillin to treat infection and diseases so penicillin is important in treating the infection and the 
uh, several types of diseases and this is now globally used. Now comes what is an objective. The first objective is to identify the mechanism of action of penicillin. Then comes the uh, describe the adverse effect of penicillin. Then comes the describe the administration of penicillin. Just how like how penicillin will work. Then comes the discussion after interprofessional team uh, strategies for improving care coordination and communication to advance penicillin administration and improves the outcomes. So it is always recommended that uh, you should always use the advanced ver version of the older one. So that is the reason. And there is an interprofessional team strategies that uh, discuss that how to improve the care coordination and they can do the communication to advance the penicillin administration and also to improve their outcomes and then what is the function so the first function is drug in the penicillin class so works by indirectly bursting uh, the bacterial cell so they basically burst the bacterial uh, bacterial cell wall they do not do this by you know they act directly on the peptidoglycan that is the uh, material that is present in the cell walls of the bacteria or uh, which uh, you know uh, play that's what I, we have you know, i have told you just that which play a very essential structural role in bacterial cell peptidoglycan then comes the peptidoglycan can create a mesh like structure around the plasma membrane of bacterial cell which increases the strength of the cell wall and prevents the extra external fluid and particles from entering the cell wall so you know we all know that the cell wall uh, act as a protective against uh, for any microorganism or any uh, like for any cells um, as it does not allow the uh, you know ex uh, fluid to enter uh, the cells so what does this penicillin do penicillin directly or, or you can say indirectly it bursts the cell wall that is the peptidoglycan means it directly works act on a peptidoglycan if the peptidoglycan can be burst then you can easily kill the bacteria then comes the when a bacterium multiplies small uh, holes uh, open in in its cell wall or as uh, the cell you know divides uh, newly produced peptidoglycan uh, then fill with this hole or is, uh, construct the walls uh, now the penicillin uh, they block the protein struts and link the peptidoglycan together this prevent the bacterium from closing the holes in the cell wall as the as the as the water concentration of the surrounding fluid is higher inside and water rushes out and that is the reason the bacteria uh, you know they gets burst so this is about how you know penicillium uh, uh, play an important role in uh, uh, bursting the cell uh, bacterial cell wall and by and killing them. So today in this lecture we will going to study about infection and diseases. This is a very important as well as interesting topic of medical microbiology as it deals with how infection and diseases affect our human body. How this infection is caused by different types of microbial pathogens and that causes diseases. And what is the basic difference between infection and diseases? So let's get started and let's see the definitions. All organisms all organisms living in uh, in or on bodies of other organisms and drawing their sustenance from from them are considered parasite. In medical terminology, parasites include intestinal worms and organism causing malaria, kala azar, or amboic dysentery, whereas bacteria and viruses do not find mention as parasite. Any relationship in which two organisms live together in an intimate association is considered to be a symbiosis. The relationship can be mutualistic if both the members of the peer benefit. Common cell if one benefits and one host is harmed, is not harmed. Or parasitic if organism benefits and the host is harmed to a greater or lesser degree. So we all know that there are different kinds of uh, pathogens that are present in the earth. So whenever the organism that is living or they are present in the bodies of other organisms and they cont continuously drawing their subs here, substances from them are considered as parasites. If we talk about medical terminology, then parasites, they include the intestinal worms and organisms that cause malaria. So in medical terminology, parasites, it includes the intestinal worms and these uh, intestinal worms and organisms, they cause a diseases like malaria, kalazar, amboic, dysentery, whereas bacteria and viruses do not come under the heading of parasites. So when there, whenever there is a relationship between two organisms that are living together, they are known as symbiosis. So the relation can be Mutual if both the members are of peer benefit means if one benefits and the host is not harmed. In case of parasite, the parasitic organisms are those organisms in which the organism benefits and the host is harmed to a degree to a greater degree or a lesser degree. Then comes the predator. So the predator, uh, these are the organisms that hunt, catch and kill other my, uh, other organisms before eating them. Whereas parasites do not hunt, catch and kill their prey before eating it. Rather, they live it while uh, it continues to live. So if we talk about the predator, so we all are familiar with this term predator. So these are the organisms that catches or you can say that hunt or kill the other organism before eating them. They uh, hunt catch or kill them before eating them but in case uh, but in case of parasite they do not hunt they do not catch and they do not kill the prey uh, 
before eating it means before eating it they do not kill the prey rather they eat it while it continues to live now comes the saprophytes saprophytes uh, they eat the dead de uh, dead organism that that they did not kill so saprophytes are those organisms that eat the dead decaying matter and they do not kill them so the term saprophyte is reserved for microbes such as bacteria, protozoa, fungi that digest and thus degrade the bodies of dead plants and animals. So who are saprophytes? So saprophytes are those organisms that kills the um, dead decaying matter and they do not kill the particular body of an organism. So the microbes that are present in the, in the heading of saprophyte are bacteria, protozoa, fungi that uh, that digest and thus degrade the bodies of the dead plants and animals. Now moving to the inf infestation. Infestation uh, is when the parasite form and uh, orthopodas that live on the surface of the body or in the lemon of the hollow organ organs such as intestine are usually described as infesting their host. So these infestation and these are the parasite worms that uh, or you can say orthopoda that live on the surface of the human body or sometimes they live in the lemon uh, of the hollow organs such as intestine and usually they are described as infesting their host. They infest their host. Infections. So the bacteria, fungi, protozoa and viruses that are parasitics are usually described as infesting their host. The implication of the world infection is generalized invasion of host tissue whereas infestation is more so, uh, superficial. So whenever we are talking about infection, so infection it includes the uh, different types of bacteria, fungi, protozoa, viruses. So these all are the parasite, they are par parasitic in nature and they are usually infest, uh, infest, uh, infecting their host means the, uh, the organisms in which they are present. So, uh, the infection is, is a very generalized form uh, of world which, is, which means invasion of the host tissue whereas uh, the infection is more superficial, superficial. Then comes the diseases and infections. So, if we talk about infection and diseases, so infection and diseases are not synonyms but they are distinct. Means infection and diseases are not the same term that are used. So, they are different, uh, different. So, infection is the invasion or colonization of the body by pathogenic microorganism. So, it is an invasion or you can say the colonization of the body by any pathogenic microorganism that uh, can cause harm to them whereas disease occur when an infection result in any change from the state of health means disease is what disease is a type of an infection um, or you can say disease occurs when the infection uh, they um, result in any change from the state of health if we uh, see the state of health so any change in the state of health leads to disease now moving to the next that is general sign and symptoms common symptoms so if we see the fever and headache or, or you can say ache, diarrhea is another type of uh, uh, infection that causes disease like diarrhea then comes the vomiting is another disease that caused that is caused by a certain infection that is caused by any type of pathogenic microorganism and coughing fatigue so these all are the general sign and symptoms of diseases that are caused by pathogenic microorganisms now if we see the dynamics of infectious diseases for an infectious diseases to uh, per pitch to uh, there has to be reservoir of microorganisms from where the causative agent should be transmitted to a sus suspectable host either directly or <coughs> through the agency of a vehicle or a vector when we comes to the source of reservoir that the source of infection is the person animal objects or substance the substance from which the infectious agent passes or disseminates to the host where as a reservoir is defined as any person, animals or orthopods, plants, soil or substance in which the infectious agents lives and multiplies. So if we see the sources and reservoirs, so the source of infection is uh, is any kind of a person or it is a it is any type of an animal or object or substances from which the infectious agent passes or disseminates it to the host. Whereas if we talk about the reservoir, so it is defined as any person, animal or orthopods, plant, soil and substances or the combination of both of them that causes uh, uh, that is caused uh, an infectious agent lifts and multiplies. So there are basically three types that is human, animal and non-living substances. So if we see the source and reservoir then tetanus is an infection. Source of uh, tetanus is an infection that is caused by a source of infection through soil and reservoir is again a soil. Then hookworm. Hookworm and soil contaminated by larva and uh, what is the reservoir animal thyroid uh, thi typhoid it is caused uh, by a contaminated water and the food and um, the reservoir is a cases or means it is caused through a carrier means through different microorganisms then comes the mode of transmission then how this uh, disease is transmitted from one person to another so transmission is basically divided into two direct transmission or indirect transmission so indirect transmission it is a direct contact between the two person means it come it uh, is a direct contact second it's a droplet infection Third, it is a contact with soil. Fourth is an inoculation into skin or mucosa. And fifth is a transplantation means vertical. So these are certain direct transmission. Then comes the indirect transmission. So the first is a vehicle in uh, vehicle bond. Then comes the vector bond. It uh, under this it comes the mechanical and biological. Then comes the air bond means it is the droplet nuclei and dust. Then comes the formite bond that is another type of indirect transmission. And con and the fifth one comes the unclean hand and finger. This is also a indirect uh, way of transmission of diseases. 
so the microorganisms they can be transmitted to human being directly or indirectly we all know that microorganisms they are present in an environment in a very abundant form or you can say number so these microorganisms uh, they are uh, they are transmitted to human beings directly or indirectly so how they are transmitted the first is the direct transmission that occurs through uh, like a contact with men animals or other inanimate object or there is any droplet infection that also can cause a direct transmission means organism into the human body or a breach of skin or mucus uh, membrane trans transplacental or a conge cog uh, congenital uh, way through which a direct transmission occurs then comes the indirect transmission so it uh, occurs through a uh, vehicles vectors or a ear droplet or you can say unclean hands or fingers that we have discussed in the previous slide so uh, to understand this direct transmission or indirect transmission that how microorganism they are uh, trans uh, transfer from uh, to human beings so uh, you can understand this with the help of a covid virus since uh, in 2020 a virus that make us our, our life a very much uh, you can say a hell uh, in case uh, because of a single virus that is a covid virus okay so because of this covid virus uh, what it uh, what happens there is always a person who who has a covid virus and if the person is present uh, in a such a place there are where well, uh, there are number of people so it so because of him it uh, virus is transmitted from that person to the majority of the person that is the reason it is always recommended in covid virus that you should always wear the mask you should always use san sanitizer you should always change clothes while coming to uh while coming home before entering your premises you should always sanitize yourself just to avoid the, the direct uh, transmission of micro organism that is a particular virus into the other into the uh, other human being so you can understand this this viruses or this microorganisms or this pathogenic microorganism they needs transmission they are transferred from one person to another in this case you can understand this uh, with another example if i have a co cough and cold and if i am con continuously sneezing in front of you without using my hands um, over uh, my nose and i'm continuously sneezing and you are just sitting in front of me so there are chances that the virus that and uh, the same infection can cause you so it is always recommended to always avoid um, sitting where a person is sneezing uh, again and again or you should take certain precautions like you should always wear a uh, nose, uh, you can say mask, face mask, you should always uh, you sanitize it. that is all that okay you should all are in our homes why before eating we always wash our hand why just to free uh, our hand from any microbial pathogens now comes the mechanism of infection so to produce infection in man or in a man a microbe has to gain entry into the host the most frequent protocol of entry are the respiratory tract, the, uh, the gastrointestinal tract, and breaks the superficial mucous membrane and skin. From the pore, from the portal of the entry of uh, entry, the parasite may spread directly through the tissue or may proceed via lymphatic channels to the bloodstream, which distributes it widely and permit it to the reach of tissue particularly suitable for its multiplication. Then comes, nevertheless, the power, the perpetuation of the parasitic species, a satisfactory portal, portal of exit of the parasite from the host, and effective mechanism for transmission to a new host are also a paramount importance then comes the stages of diseases so how the stages of diseases are classified so the first stage is inoculation second is penetration third is infection fourth is growth and reproduction reproduction and fifth is dissemination of pathogens so if we see the stages so let's talk about each stage in detail so once the microorganism overcomes uh, comes the defense of the host development of infectious diseases they follows a sequence of event the first is the incubation or you can say a period of in incubation so under this it is the time intervals between the actual infection and the appearance of the first clinical feature then comes the normal period so in this uh, it, this is a very relatively a very short uh, period uh, that uh, follows the incubation period um, in certain diseases or you can say in some diseases and it is further characterized by a very mild or you can say very mild or early symptoms such as general ache or uh, fatigue means before uh, before fever our body feels a certain types of fatigue or a pain that leads to a further diseases like fever then the period of illness so this is an acute phase of illness acute means the main phase or you can say very accurate uh, or acute phase of the illness uh, that is characterized by a typical clinical features of infectious diseases then comes the period of deadline so during this period the sign and symptoms are subsides means the fever decreases and the feeling of malarize uh, uh, diminish and during this period the person may be attacked by secondary infection then period of convalescence, the person regains the strength during this time and the body returns to the pre-diseased state. Means after taking a certain types of medicines or antibiotics against that infection, your body regained the strength and came to the original form. 
so that brings to the end of the chapter we will going to study about one of the most important topic of medical microbiology that is microbial pathogenicity so in this topic we will going to study about what is microbial pathogenicity because already we are aware of the term pathogens so what are pathogens we already know and how these pathogens are very much harmful for human beings how they cause uh, different types of diseases in uh, human beings or you can say even uh, in any living uh, organisms so we will going to study this in this chapter uh, lecture so let's see the introduction part of the lecture so any microorganism that is able to infect a host and produce diseases is called a pathogen the infection and diseases do not always occur together bacteria can cause a multitude of different infection ranging in severity from apparent in apparent to fulminating the capacity of organism to cause disease reflects its relative pathogenicity so we all know that microorganism they are able to infect the host means they are able to infect the host in the sense they causes diseases and they produces different kinds of diseases depending upon which kind of pathogen is there if we say there are different types of pathogens that are present in on this earth like bacteria fungi mold viruses so they all are very harmful why because they are causing a disease and they are infecting a human being to an extent that sometime to save a life is just impossible so you should always be aware of the new technologies like sanitization is there just to sanitize your hands before eating you should always sanitize the environment just to get free from any source of microbial pathogens so the infection and diseases they do not occur together that is infection is another thing and diseases another thing these two are very much uh, you know differentiate from each other that we have already covered in our previous lecture so you can refer to my previous lecture um, for this infection and diseases so as of for now you just understand that infection and diseases they do not occur together and you know that bacteria is a most pathogenic uh, microorganism that can cause a different types of infections and their infections are so severe that you need certain types of medication to get uh, free from these type of infections so what are pathogens as already discussed any microorganism that has the capacity to cause diseases is known as pathogen whether it's a bacteria whether it's a fungi whether it's a virus whether it's a mold so pathogenic microorganism have a special properties that allow them to invade the human body to produce the toxins so they in they invade the human body they are just invading the host or you can say a human body and they have a very special properties that they allow to invade the human body or to produce the toxins so how they produces or cause infection in human body by producing a toxin toxin that is toxic in nature and as well as they invade the human body so it is a very special properties of the pathogen so what is not pathogenicity so pathogenicity it is a ability of a pathogen that is microorganism to produce a disease by overcoming the defense of the host like protozoans uh, of the entry then penetrate host defense damage the host cell and portal the of exit so pathogenicity is nothing but it is a ability of a pathogen means any sort kind of microorganism to produce a disease we all know that pathogen is a agent that has a capacity to cause diseases whereas pathogenicity it is a ability of a pathogen that is a microorganism to produce a disease and how they are producing the diseases by overcoming the defense of the host like uh, polter the of entry then comes the penetrate the host defense you know then they can also damage the host cell so this is the the way uh, a pathogen can have uh, can have an ability to cause infections or diseases then virulence what is virulence so virulence is the degree of pathogenicity up to which extent a microorganism can cause a disease so virulence is the degree of pathogenicity so it provide a quantitative measures of pathogenicity or likelihood of causing diseases means they tells that the quantitative kitni zyada you know infection ya disease us particular human being mein hui hai so that is known as virulence so what is virulence again virulence is the degree of pathogenicity in the sense that it is a it provides a quantitative data or measures of pathogenicity or likelihood of causing a disease so if we see this diagram so in this particular diagram it is showing how the microbial mechanism what is a microbial mechanism of pathogenicity so let us see this uh, um if you see this it is a portal of entry portal of entry one minute yes now if you see this is a portal of entry of the uh, you can say in infections so the number of invading microbes so here there is a number of there is not a single microorganism that can cause diseases so there are numbers of invading microbes and this is the adherence uh, 
uh, we will going to study about this in detail then these are the virulence factor that is uh, showing the degree of pathogenicity then the penetration or you can say invasion of host defense so here it is a host defense so what they are doing they penetrate the uh, host defense they damage the host cell whenever the host cell get damaged what does they do they will cause a diseases because they get an entry easy entry to the host and uh, after you know they get entry they damage the cells and of course we know that the cell is the basic unit um, functional unit of life so if the cell is damaged so the infection can easily be occur in that particular person so they are damaging the host cell after that, that it is a portal of exit means after doing the damage they exit from there so this is about this diagram how the mechanism of a microbial mechanism of pathogenicity take place now again moving to the next that is what is pathogenicity in microbiology now let's see what is a uh, microbi what is a pathogenicity in microorganism and let's see in it in detail so pathogenicity is an important term that is used in medical or you can say microbiology pathogens are those microorganisms that cause disease and, and harm us not all bacteria fungi viruses are pathogen most of them are beneficial or harmless to us only a fraction of them can cause animal human or plant diseases so pathogenicity is also described by the presence of antigen on the surface of pathogens cell surface these antigens are recognized by the host immune system which triggers an immune response it appears a body about the entry of pathogen into the body so that antibody production can be initiated to protect the body against them so if we see the path pathogenicity so we all know that it is a very important term that is uh, used in medical microbiology or in microbiology so we all know that not every microorganism like not every pathogens that are those microorganisms they can cause diseases or harm us because there are certain microorganisms like bacteria fungi even the viruses they are the pathogen but not every pathogens are harmful because we all uh, are aware of this term that uh, bacteria are harmful as well as they are beneficial for human beings for the, the, because they they different types of microorganisms helps in different types of food production if you see uh, in uh, the fermentation of alcohol in the in cheese making they have a very much important in uh, production of different types of dairy products as well as in the production of wine uh, so uh, these are uh, bacteria or fungi and uh, these are also a pathogen but not all the pathogens are harmful some are harmful and some are beneficial to us so they uh, so those who can cause uh, harm they can uh, cause harm to humans animal or plant diseases so we all know this pathogenicity is also described by the presence of ant uh, antigens on the surface of pathogens cells so anti antigens what they do they recognize by they are recognized by the host immune system if i am have a, if i am the host so my immune system recognizes the pathogens that are there on the uh, pathogens uh, surface uh, and uh, cell surface and as soon as the immune system recognize these pathogens they start to, uh, with uh, they start to triggering the, the immune response and they make the body aware that there is an entry of pathogen into the body so that any body production can be initiated and they can protect the body against these harmful pathogens now bacteria can be organized into three major groups now let's take take one pathogens that is a bacteria and so this bacteria is organized into the three groups that is a frank pathogens opportunistic pathogens and a non pathogens so when it comes to a frank pathogens so when isolated from a patient frank pathogens are considered to be the probable agent of disease example salmonella so what is a frank pathogen so whenever you isolate this type of pathogens from any patient body okay so what you see so you see that this frank pathogens they are considered as uh, to be a probable agents of diseases like salmonella then comes the opportunistic pathogen so these are also isolated from patients whose defense mechanism have been compromised example streptococcus or um, streptococcus epidermis infection then comes the non pathogen so they are these really or no or never cause uh, human diseases uh, and they do not cause any human diseases and uh, this is an example of a non pathogenic uh, uh, microorganisms like bacillus subtilis so the, these bacillus subtilis is a non pathogenic microorganism bacteria then comes the virulence factors of microorganism so we have already discussed about this definition what is virulence it is a degree of pathogenicity means it provides the quantitative measure of pathogenicity or the likelihood of causing diseases now if we see the virulence factors of microorganism what are the factors of virulence so the first factor is the invasionness second is toxicity and third is plasmid so in invasionness is the ability to ent ability to enter host tissue multiply there and spread so invasion means to destroy something or to invade uh, the host so in this it is a ability it uh, invasionness is what it is a ability how to enter into the host tissue after getting enter into the host tissue how to multiply there how to do multiply their population and after doing the multiplication of population how these 
different types of pathogenic microorganism are spread into the body of that host now comes our toxicity so after spreading the next is how to produce toxic substances how to, uh, to um, produce a toxic substances in the host then comes the plasmids uh, that is mediated the phono uh, phonotypic expressions means after production of toxic substance then how to mediate the phenotypic expression then comes the virulence factor that already we have discussed that if we talk about bacteria so firstly what they do let's take an example to understand let's talk about bacteria so what is what bacteria will do after entering the host so the first one is they invade the host second is they cause diseases third is they invade the host defense and there are the following four types of virulence factor that is the first is adhered factors invasion factor capsule endotoxin and exotoxin so these are the more four factors now let's quickly see all these factors of virulence one by one the, the first one is adherence factor so many pathogenic bacteria colonize mucosal site by using a pili to adhere to the cell adhere means to attach uh, on something so what does uh, so adhered factor how they work means many bacteria examples bacteria so what they do they colonize the mucosal site how they colonize by using the pili and after uh, colonizing uh, by uh, using pili they adhere to the cell they get attached to the cell then after attaching to the cell what they do the surface uh, invasion factor the surface component that allow the bacterium to invade the host cell they can be encoded on plasmid but more often on the chromosome then comes the capsule many bacteria they are surrounded by capsule and after that they uh, that they protect them from opponization and uh, phagocytosis so capsule so bacteria are uh, surrounded by capsule so what this capsule is doing or uh, they are just helping bacteria cell to get protect from opponization or phag phagocytosis then endotoxins what are endotoxins so uh, the lipopolysaccharides endotoxins on gram negative bacteria they what they cause they can cause fever they changes the uh, they causes changes in blood pressure inflammation lethal shock and many other toxin events so <coughs> what is endotoxins so endotoxins are the lipopolysaccharides endotoxins so they are generally on gram negative bacteria and what they do they causes a fever change in bp and they cause certain types of lethal shock and other toxic event then comes the exotoxins so exotoxins they include uh, several types of protein toxin and enzymes and produced or secreted from pathogenic bacteria major categories include cytotoxin neurotoxin and endo toxin so what is the basic difference between pathogenicity and virulence so this question generally arises in the interviews as well as whenever you are giving examination but this question is generally asked in the interview so they can ask you like what do you understand by pathogenicity or sometimes they can ask you what do you understand by virulence and they will uh, say can you just explain in one line what is the basic difference between this pathogenicity and virulence so pathogenicity it is a quality of or, or you can say state of being pathogenic and the potential ability to produce diseases whereas virulence is a disease producing power of an organism the degree of pathogenicity within a group or spice species so depending upon the type of species depending upon the type of group they can uh, you know they can virulence um, they can produce diseases and they uh, these are uh, uh, can see up to which degree of pathogenicity that is caused within that particular host then pathogenicity is a qualitative term that is all or none or exact so virulence that uh, is the term that quantifies the pathogenicity so this is the basic difference between pathogenicity and virulence so hope you have understood the lecture that's bring to the end of the lecture and as far as this lecture is concerned we have uh, covered the introduction part we have seen the definitions of pathogen pathogenicity and virulence we have seen the mechanism of pathogenicity we have also discussed about what is pathogenicity in microbiology how a bacteria can be organized in the three groups what is virulence factor of microorganism again what is virulence factor of any bacteria and how they different factors can cause infection and how these factors are affecting the virulence and next it is a, what is the difference between pathogenicity and virulence we're going to study about non-specific defense of host host parasite relationship so in this topic we're going to see what is the relationship between host and parasite it is a topic of immunology and we're going to cover all the defense of host that are non-specific in this particular lecture so let's see what is a parasitic relationship a parasitic relationship is one in which one organism the parasite lives off another organism the host harming it and possibly causing death the parasite lives on or in the body of the host a few example of parasites are tapeworm fleas and branicles tapeworms are segmented flatworms that attach themselves to the inside of the intestine of the animal such as cow pigs and humans they get food by eating the host partly digested food depriving the host of depriving the host of nutrients fleas harm their host such as dogs by biting their skin sucking their milk blood and causing them to each so if you see the parasitic relationship so parasites we all are familiar with this term parasites so parasitic relation is in which one organism let's say one organism lives uh, onto uh, another organisms like right so 
in this way let us understand with this with the example if let's say this is one organism and this is number two is another organism so this organism is going to live in this organism and causing harm to this organism sometimes the harm is up to an extent that it will cause a death of this organism so the, both are organism both are living organism but one is living in this organism and causing harm to this and sometimes the harm is up to an extent that it will cause death of this organism similarly this parasite this one is known as parasite and second is known as host host in which this parasitic organism is living so here it is building a relationship between a parasitic and a host now one thing one question arises that how this host let us again see how this host uh, sorry this parasite lives in this host so you need certain uh, things to uh, you know survive so the two is the organism that is a human organism and uh, if uh, the one is living in this organism so it is using all its nutrients the digested food uh, it is using for its energy and performing its infection to that particular host so uh, let us uh, understand this uh, with one example so if we talk about the uh, tapeworms so tapeworms are the are known as the flatworms and segmented of the flatworm that they are attached to the intestine of certain animals like they are uh, present in cows they are present in pigs they are present in humans so where they are present they are present in the intestine of these animals and causing harm to them so here they form act as a parasite and human uh, pigs cow they act as a host so how they get food so they get food by eating the host partly digested food the, the host the food that a host is consuming so the partly digested food they eat that food and depriving the host of the nutrient and depriving nutrients from the host nutrients then comes the fleas so fleas harm their host such as dogs uh, sometimes they uh, uh, fleas uh, uh, they mainly harm their host uh, like dogs and uh, what they do they bite their skin they suckle the blood that came out after biting the skin of the uh, particular uh, host and uh, sometimes they cause them to eating so this is particularly in the case of uh, in the case of sorry so this is particularly in the case of dogs now moving to the next that is what is a host parasite relationship so let's uh, uh, discuss this with a uh, definition so the host parasitic um, relationship is completely depend on the interaction between the two species here there is an interaction that is going to happen between the two species that is a parasite and second is any animal like human dogs pig anything so both are living in nature their interrelationship between the parasites and the host population they what they do they incorporate with the infection level so obligate parasite are mostly pathogenic bacteria which are associated with their host example of such pathogenic bacteria are simply staphylococci and streptococci so sometimes the obligate if we talk about the what are the obligate what are the obvious parasites that are, are mostly present in the host so most of them are bacteria, pathogenic bacteria which are always associated with their host for example pathogenic bacteria are staphylococci streptococci are the two examples of pathogenic bacteria that are generally associated with their host so human uh, host is normally in contact with many microorganisms normally a small number of these organisms can cause diseases so if we talk about humans so human uh, humans host is normally in contact with many microorganisms like if I say that we all are surrounded with microorganisms and um, these microorganisms are present in the environment in a very large number. So sometimes what happens if there is a proper, in, uh, if we, uh, if there is a not proper uh, sanitization, if, uh, there, if a human being come in contact with such microorganisms, so sometimes they enter our intestine and they start uh, harming our body. So similar case is with the COVID virus. So if you can see the virus, virus is what? what it is invading the bodies and, some, and leading to a number and thousands of lakhs of deaths uh, in one day what it is doing it is making a human body its host and infecting a human body up to an extent that some people uh, were dying uh, at a very large number uh, sometimes there are number of death in a one day so it is that in that case so host parasite relationship it categorized by the fighting the organism to invade the body and and the body and defending itself by protective measures so so the, we all uh, came across with different types of infections sometimes infections are very mild that uh, they uh, can go by their own sometimes uh, they are a little more than a mile and we need certain antibiotics to work against that and sometimes they are so much up to an extent that they causes death of a person so if we see the host to the host uh, they, they they do fight the antibodies do uh, the antibodies that are present in the host body they do fight with the uh, my, uh, uh, with the parasites parasite and they they take certain pre pre preventive measures to work against that parasitic uh, microorganism 
so this is the relationship between host and parasite so always a parasitic organism always need a host uh, body to survive to perform their infection Be without host they are inactive that is the reason during the covid virus it is always recommended to wear the mask where is uh, to properly sanitize because covid virus cannot survive on a non living organism why because these parasites need certain type of uh, living organism means host to perform their infection because why they cannot survive on the non living beings because living things because they need nutrients for their proper growth isn't it they need proper nutrient for their proper growth so non living things do not need do not have any kind of nutrient so so in this way they cannot survive in non living organisms uh, but they do survive in living organism because they are getting a efficient nutrient essential nutrients to perform their activities now let's move to the host uh, parasite relationship and let's understand the type of host parasite relationship so basically there are three types of host parasite relationship the first is symbiosis second is common common cilium and second is parasitism so if we talk about the first one that is uh, symbiosis so in this both the host and parasites are depend upon each other so symbiosis means uh, they, the both the organisms need each other for their uh, survival means both are depend upon each other none of them are harmed so this is mutually mutual relationship between host and parasite where there is no such harm and uh, both are depend upon each other for their survival then comes the common uh, common cilism so common cilism is one of the parasite deprive the benefit from the associated without causing an infection to the host it is capable of living independently so if we see the common cilism so in this uh, both the parasites are uh, they are uh, uh, opposite means they benefit uh, one only the parasite in this only the here uh, here both parasite and host are depend upon each other but here only a parasite they get benefits from the host but here while they are getting the benefit from the uh, host they do they are not uh, infecting the host means they are capable of living independently but where where comes the parasitism so always harm the host due to their association if they are present in the host so they are always uh, present in the host and if present they uh, they do uh, they do harm the host the parasite cannot live an independent life without the host so here a pa parasite cannot live without the host so uh, to perform their uh, action it needs host for their survival so here there is a uh, three types of uh, uh, relationship between host and uh, parasite so first is symbiosis where both are depend upon each other and none of them get harms second is common cilism uh, in which only a parasite uh, deprived the uh, uh, benefits from the host and uh, it but it uh, but it do not cause any harm to them and uh, it is capable of living independently whereas in the parasitism or it always harm the host due to their association and they cannot live independently so parasite host can survive and increase the population outside the body of the host and however it infects the host source within the host the host tissues these organisms set up an infection and start and start spreading throughout the body other bacteria like gladiolus bacillus gonococci meningococci and pneumococci are closely adapted parasites these bacteria are capable of multiplying outside the body of the host and that is only under the artificial condition of the laboratory all these bacteria have a complete metabolic capabil cap capabilities and cell structure so if we talk about certain bacteria like uh, gladiolus bacillus ya gonococci meningococci pneumococci so they are uh, closely very adapted uh, parasites and they are capable of multiplying outside the body of the host uh, but in the in the laboratory uh, labs uh, under the uh, artificial conditions and uh, they uh, have and all these bacteria whether it's a bacillus glandulus bacillus or gonococci all these bacillus have a metabolic capability and they have a proper cell structure now moving to the parasite specificity so the condition of obligate parasitism varies with the degree of parasite and host that is the parasite host is is closely adapted to the specific uh, species as its host about 90% of microorganism that adopt to the plant host cannot adopt animals likewise microorganism which can survive in animal host rarely accept the plant host the rate of infection depend upon the relationship between parasites and host the taxonomic relationship include the host variety it it may depend on the vertebrates and invertebrates so these are certain specificity of the parasite so if we see the negative level or uh, survival value of the parasite it often show a cons consistent fatal diseases in the host species this is termed a negative survival parasite as it is it can completely quickly from the eliminate quickly from the host if the host cell start adopting the parasite which cause infection in the host the infection rate will become less and start to tolerate it the, so this is very important students that what is a negative survival parasite i am marking this what is a negative survival so this point what is this so this is nothing but it uh, is a it, uh, this term is a uh, that uh, it offers it can eliminate any infection from the host very quickly how if the host cell let's say if the host cell uh, cell uh, they start adopting the parasite means they adopt the parasite which they which uh, causes infection to the host so the rate of infection will become less and it will start adopting it will start to start to tolerate it and it will start adopting the 
infection so the best example for reducing the severity of diseases can be absorbed from the uh, spicrocoxite which causes sp spicillus in human being then come the severity of spicillus is more more in 16th century but it is start because the host, the host get accepted to the diseases so in the late 19th uh, 16th century the severity of spicillus is very uh, severe but as the uh, after that 16th century it becomes gradually decreases why because the host get accepted to the disease to this particular disease now comes host resistance what is a host resistance so the specificity of pathogenic microorganism they mainly depend upon their host means how specific would be a pathogenic microorganism it should it is always depend on their host means the type of host in which they are present so the microbial characters are very depending upon the host resistance so depending upon the host resistance the microbial characters are they are they differ they are varying so the microorganism that can cause diseases and severity of diseases mainly depend upon the host reaction resistance and immunity of the host reaction regard to its effect of the microorganism the effect of the host may remain constant and or may vary accordingly for example virulence is an infective agent that determine experimentally by inoculating the group of host the graded dose of agent determine the inter population so now after completing this let's understand one question is the relationship between parasite and host called mutualism so after completing the um, uh, after completing 11 slides let's understand this question so symbiosis uh, shows the close relationship between the two species further at least one species will get benefit from the two species here a mutualism is a the type of symbiotic relationship in which both the species get benefit so usually parasite will come under the symbiotic relationship in which one of the species get benefit while the other species will get harm now let's uh, see are viruses parasites so the next question is all the uh, sorry are the viruses they are parasites so whether or not viruses are parasite depending upon the definition of parasitism so most paras uh, parasitologists consider virus as an obligate intracellular parasite other scientists only include eukaryotes uh, as a potential parasites and exclude the prokaryote uh, that is bacteria and viruses so there are um, so different uh, so are viruses parasites so for the answer for this is quite different like most of the parasitologists they considered virus as an obligate intercellular parasite but if we talk about scientists the only scientists only include eukaryotes like plants animals and uh, fungi uh, algae uh, they considered them as a potential parasites wherever uh, whereas they exclude prokaryotes like bacteria and viruses so these are certain questions that uh, are very important hope you have understood the lecture so as far as the lecture is concerned we have covered the first part of this uh, uh, lecture that is non specific defense system of host that is we have uh, uh, covered the host and parasite relationship so in this we have seen that what is the host and parasite relationship what what are the three different types of host and parasite relationship and what is the parasite specificity we have also seen what is a host resistance and some uh, two questions so today in this lecture we will going to study about our part two of non specific immune response that is resistance of host to microorganisms so in the previous lecture we have seen the relationship between a pathogen and the host now in this particular lecture we will see what is the resistance of host to microorganisms so in this particular lecture we will going to see that host take certain preventive measure against microorganisms so these preventive measures are also known as resistance means they resist the entry of microorganisms when they resist the entry of microorganism it means it simply means that they want micro they do not want microorganism to invade their body so to stop the entry of microorganisms or if by any chance if they get entry into the host they want to attack that microorganisms in the sense that they could not harm the host body so there are variety of mechanism by which human beings resist attack by microorganisms these can be broadly divided into two that is natural resistance and acquired immunity so under the natural resistance it is also known as innate immunity non specific resistance or a constitutive immunity then the second is the acquired immunity so acquired immunity says a specific indivisible or adaptive immunity so whenever it's a natural resistance that is innate uh, immunity so this type of resistance are those resistance that gives a host protection developed during the ontogeny without contact with any parasite or its product is not specific for any particular parasites so when it comes to the innate resistance so they are providing a protection to the host how they are pro providing by and yes and they are developed because they are naturally present inside our body they do not need any artificial means of resistance or any you know acquired immunity so they are present in our body itself only and how they are developed so they are developed during the ontogeny and uh, without any contact with any parasite means uh, without uh, coming in contact with any parasite they are developed so 
that is the reason they, uh, this type of product is not specific to any particular parasite means they are active to all the parasites why because they are developed without coming in contact with any of the parasites this is very important to understand then come inducible mechanisms so inducible mechanisms are only developed following exposure to a particular parasite or its product and are specific for inducing the parasites so inducible paras uh, mechanisms so they are developed uh, only when they are exposed to any particular parasite or its product and are specific for inducing parasites so as uh, natural uh, res uh, res resistance or innate resistance they are developed without any particular parasites coming in contact with any parasites and they are um, not uh, specific for any particular parasite so uh, but inducible they are developed only uh, when they are exposed to any particular parasites and this pro this inducible mechanism is only specific to a inducing parasites mean means to one specific parasite so the term natural uh, resistance is often used to place a consecutive immunity since the word immunity has a connotation of a specificity that is usually not present in natural resistance mechanism now comes to the next that is host defense so what kind of defense host show so the first is resistance what is resistance so resistance is nothing but it is a ability to ward off diseases means uh, to uh, stop the diseases or wave off from diseases you can say second point say it varies among organisms and individuals within the same species means uh, if uh, for example we all humans are belong to a species called humus or sapien but still every organisms and individual are varies uh, depending upon the type of genotype depending upon the type of phenotype means all our characteristics are totally different from the other organisms so the resistance may also varies depending upon the type or uh, depending on upon the type of organisms means individual and organisms depending upon them means the uh, resistance is also varied now moving to the next so the now the next is immunity so immunity it is nothing but it is a mechanism that used uh, by the body as a protection against microbes and other foreign agent self versus not non self so this immunity it is a mechanism or it is a process by which uh, it is used by our, our body as they provide protection against microbes as well as any for, foreign agent uh, that came into contact with the body so immunity is that and we all want a very strong immunity that is why we take a apart from consuming food apart for apart from consuming the food products we also consume different types of supplements to increase our immunity why we are doing so just because and just because why we are doing so so this is because to increase our immunity if the immunity get increases so ultimately what it is doing it is playing uh, it, it is working against uh, any sort of infection and uh, or any uh, foreign particles that enter our body and the immunity itself will work against that pathogens or microorganism and uh, it provide protection to the host then comes the non specific so non specific immunity they are known as innate they are natural inborn and they are uh, they do not developed when uh, through any artificial or any uh, man made uh, supplements so they are present in our body naturally and they provide defense against any sort of pathogens then comes the specific immunity so this specific immunity they are resistance to a specific pathogen so they provide resistance to any specific pathogens means they require they are only uh, active to any specific pathogen means they are not active for all pathogen so any specific pathogen so they so th that is the reason its name is specific immunity now coming to the difference between so a non specific resistance and a specific resistance so if we see the first line difference so intact skin mucous membrane and the secretion normal microbiota biota then as the second line of defense is phagocytic white uh, blood cells in inflammation fever antimicrobial substances then the third line of defense is specialized lymphocytes b cells t cells and antibodies so the first line of defense means when a microorganism like this is a microorganism when it is entering the host so first it ha he has to pass to the first line of defense so first line defense says intact with the skin this uh, the human skin is also act as a barrier for different types of microorganism if let's suppose there is no skin then the the this cells uh, would be with the all the blood will come out and they provide they do not means a microorganism can easily attack the body so intact the skin as the first line defense so uh, another the mucous membrane and uh, their secretion they are also acting as the first line of defense then comes the normal microbiota is the third uh, of uh, line of defense then comes the second line of defense so the uh, second line of defense is the phagocytic white blood cells so white blood cells again they play against uh, work against um, any foreign particle that enters the uh, human body then comes the inflammation inflammation is another 
uh, um, line of defense they, that they work against the microbes then comes the fever and antimicrobial substances so antimicrobial substance it also act uh, as a um, defense against any type of microbial substance that are entering the host body then the third line defense is the specialized lymphocytes like b cell and t cells they are also a uh, type of a defense system that works against any sort of in, uh, microorganisms that attack the human body then ultimately antibiotics antibodies so they are also work against any sort of infections then comes the natural uh, resistance or innate so natural resistance or innate immunity it refers to the type of resistance which e uh, which each individual has by virtue of being in the individual he or she in terms of a species race sex and other factors associated with genetically controlled resistance so they are present naturally they do not require any uh, uh, one to you know create this type of immunity so they are present since our birth and uh, different individual have different type of innate resistance so depending upon the whether uh, whether it's a male or a female which type of a species is that what is the race sex and other uh, factors are also associated and uh, with the natural or innate resistance so the important factors that influence the effectiveness of natural resistance are first is a species so the a given pathogenic organisms is capable of producing diseases in one animal species but not in another human gets mumps but dogs and cats do not M mammals may con contract anthrax but birds do not so depending upon the type of species means where all uh, is means if i'm talking about every living organism so we all are belong to other species uh, species if we say human beings so they are the living creature but they belongs to the homo uh, homo sapien we belong to the species known as homo sapien birds dog cat rat they are also a living creature but they depend uh, they are, have different types of species so every living creature they belong to different species so depending upon the type of species uh, diseases or pathogen act means if i say human beings they get mumps but dogs and cats do not still they are species but uh, sorry living creature but they have a different species so depending upon the type of species uh, the uh, uh, a pathogen attack then apart from this mammals may uh, contract the anthrax but birds do not so why because birds th uh, birds have different uh, species then comes the nutrition so if we talk about the nutrition so the low protein diet make a person uh, susceptible to infection vitamin deficiencies often exhibit a significant effect on the host defense vitamin a vitamin c deficiencies are well known to increase susceptibility to bacterial infections so if we talk about the nutrition so if if your diet is not full of nutrition so ultimately your body is becoming weak means your immunity level becomes weak so you are more susceptible to the infection so that is the reasons you have to have a proper balanced diet with full uh, amount of nutrients or you can say a required amount of nutrients should be there in your diet so if you have a low protein diet that will also make a person more uh, uh, open to infections apart from uh, which uh, proteins vitamins deficiency can also exhibit uh, the significant effects on the host defense vitamin a vitamin c deficiencies they are also uh, you know exhibit the increased susceptibility of bacterial infection so then third is racial uh, racial or um, you can say uh, the genetic basis so with one animal with one uh, within one animal uh, species there may be marked racial or genetic differences in susceptibility black uh, blacks appears to be more susceptible than whites to the tuberculosis so if you talk about uh, the type of racism right so if you take, take one examples like tuberculosis means tb so they are more uh, uh, the, the chances of tb is more in black people as compared to the white people so depending upon the genetic differences uh, a person may get infection or diseases then comes the hormone related resistance so how hormone related uh, resistance uh, may affect to the uh, uh, deficiency so hormone imbalance such as diabetes mellitus pregnancy has a direct effect on susceptibility to a number of infectious diseases so whenever there is a hormonal imbalance like uh, diabetes or during your pregnancy so there is a more chances of number of infections that could attack the human body then comes the mechanism of uh, natural resistance so what is the mechanism of natural resistance so if, sorry natural resistance operate non specifically during the early phases of immune response it functions uh, although though activation of non specific cells which are phagocytic of monoclonal mono nuclear and granulolytic system and natural killer cells so if you talk about the natural mechanism of natural resistance so natural resistance they operate non specifically during the very early age of immune response so basically if we talk about its function so the first fun uh, its function um, uh, through the activation of non specific cells so it uh, functions uh, uh, you know uh, they give uh, the activations of non specific cells like phagocytic cells of mono nuclear and granulolytic system and killer cells so uh, since the presence of these uh, they can uh, they can show their uh, functions 
or you can say perform the functions and apart from this the most significant is the phagocytox the phagocytic cells so they are more microphages and large granular lymphocytes so if we talk about the natural uh, natural resistance so it results to the action of number of system then there is there may be a differentiated between external and internal systems uh, that are bridged with the acquired uh, immunity by the process of inflammation then the external system they prevent the entry of uh, microbes into the body and internal system comes into play following injuries like breach and physical barrier in addition to the inflammation also aids to the host containing the infectious agent so here the two system that is ex external system and internal system resistance they play a very vital role in controlling or uh, working against the infection so if we see the external uh, external system so they prevent the entry of microbes into the body while whenever the internal system work against the, the infection if um, it get uh, uh, get entry into the uh, body and uh, by providing a very physical barrier so this way it works so what are the external defense system what is the internal defense system and what is the inflammatory response so let's talk about each in detail so the external defense system means the, uh, these different system they work uh, they work uh, uh, um, outside the body before the infection get uh, into our the into the host body so the external defense system includes the uh, skin they includes the respiratory tract they include the mouth and uh, the second is they include the digestive tract second uh, the next is the uh, urogenetically tract so it is against the external defense system then comes the eyes uh, they uh, they also act as a external defense system so apart from these then comes the internal defense system they include the phagocytic cells so they include the phagocytosis uh, they include the chemotaxis ingestion oxygen dependent killing of microbes oxygen dependent killing of microbes independent and dependent means if the presence of oxygen or in the absence of oxygen the structure of inject, the injected uh, microbes then then comes the immunitary response that is local or generalized so what is the characteristics of the natural component of natural resistance so if we sorry so the characteristic is the component of the natural resistance are preformed means the component are present before challenge second is standardized the response magnitude is constant then without memory the host does not realize what is what um, that it has been re-exposed to the same antigen and non-specific means it does not differentiate between the invaders then the types of the defense system that we have already discussed let's, uh, let's see the definition so the external defense system that is the first line of defense against the infections are the external um, external system means it is also known as the first line of defense means they are external means they, they are the first line to uh, work against the infection so the major component that includes our skin respiratory tract mucus and they uh, they uh, work against uh, many types of uh, pathogens that came in contact with the host then comes the internal uh, defense system so when the microbes uh, the microbe that uh, by any means or uh, any other succeed in passing the external barriers so they encounter the second line of defense and uh, the internal system these include the variety of antimicrobial substances in our blood and uh, body fluids and the process of phagos uh, phagotosis uh, through uh, the viscous cell then these are some important non-specific antimicrobial factors so the first is lysozyme so the source is most body fluid also within the phagocytosis what is the effect of lysozyme, lysozyme? so it uh, destroys the bacterial cell wall then comes the beta lysine so they, they uh, the source is a serum and leukocytes so what is the effect they attack the cytoplasmic membrane uh, against the uh, gram negative positive bacteria then peroxidase is another factor uh, they, the source is leukocytes saliva and other but what is the effect kills a variety of microorganisms important within neutrophiles then comes the interferons so these are the uh, leukocytes and tissue cells they interfere with the multiplication of viruses and bacteria or you can say the immune regulation then comes the complement system they are also produced by microphages uh, lymphocytes and liver uh, uh, haplocytes and uh, what is the effect they do the cell lysis and um, or opsonization or and chemo passes uh, is another effect then comes the inflammatory response so inflammatory response um the says so the process the phases of infl inflammatory response uh, processes are the first is the acute phase means it is it is divided into another two subdivisions that is early or subacute so early stage says the inflammatory response they last for two or uh, four days and the late is that is subacute so it may continue to two weeks then comes the second is tissue formation or you can say poly for poly Federation, then it says tissues rebuilding approximately two to three weeks this uh, does not include chronic inflammation then the third phase is remodeling phase so this remodeling phase says the adapt adapt to the natural uh, original tissue and it continues up to one year year of post injury then comes the inflammatory 
response so tissue damage or infection uh, is done if, if you see this by one uh, flow chart so if you see this diagram to understand how the inflammatory response occur so a tissue get damaged or it get infected so what it does it release release of hist histamine from the mast cell and other pro inflammatory cytokines so the first it is so in this histamine is a released or other pro inflammatory uh, uh, cytokines is released so local uh, rt roller uh, vas uh, vas vasodilation increased blood flow what it happens incre increases the blood flow redness <coughs> heat and here the local increase of capillary permeability movement of fluid and protein to intestinal space like swelling and pain so what does they do they repair the tissue by fighting against the infection and further cytokine secretion so this is how the inflammatory response helps uh, in fighting against the, uh, the different types of pathogens that take an entry to the body cells now that brings to the end of the lecture hope you have understood the lecture we will going to study about overview of immune system this topic is very important in medical microbiology as this topic is de is dealing with the immune system of our body so we all know that immune system is very much important to fight against various type of microbial infection that is the reason in our diet we consume those type of food that has a good amount of energy and that could boost our immune system so that our immune system becomes so strong that it can fight against various diseases that are caused that can cause severe diseases in human body so now in this uh, this lecture we will going to see what is the immune system so the immune system protect a child's body from outside invaders these includes germs such as bacteria virus and fungi even toxins that is chemicals made by microbes the immune system is made up of different organs cell and proteins that work together so if we talk about what is immune system so immune system has already told you that it is a system that protect your child's body means here i am referring your child means a human body from outside invader invader means a foreign particle that can cause diseases okay so this immune system is protecting a human body from outside foreign particle or you can say invader and this invader includes such as uh, you can say bacteria viruses fungi and toxins what are toxins chemicals made by microbes so the immune system is made up of different organs cells and protein and all these organ cells and protein they work together to build a strong immune system in human body so um, the immune system is made up of complex network of organ cell and proteins that fight against infection or you can say microbes so this is the basic definition of immune system now coming to the next that is what is the immune system look like so if you see this diagram this is a system this is an immune system of a human body so this diagram tell us about the immune system and what are the uh, uh, you know what are the different organs look like of an immune system and uh, what are uh, the different parts of the immune system so the first is the mucus mucus membrane so mucus membrane it is present in our nose and this membrane uh, play a vital role in inhibiting or stopping the entry of microbes because uh, whenever a microbes enter our body through our nose so the mucus membrane because the uh, hair that are present in our nostril helps to trap that uh, particular uh, pathogen and uh, and inhibit the entry of that pathogen in our body now comes the lymphatic vessels so lymphatic vessels are present in the neck and uh, it again play a vital role uh, in uh, inhibiting the entry of any sort of microorganisms then comes the thymus thymus is present here and this is the tonsils and uh, the, it is present in our head and it play uh, again a very important role in inhibiting the entry of microorganisms now comes the skin so skin we all know skin play a vital role in uh, uh, inhibiting or uh, stop the entry of various type of microorganisms because it is a protective layer that uh, that is there in our body human body and it helps to stop and it helps to uh, helps uh, our to stop different kinds of microorganism to, uh, to enter in our body and this skin is composed of different types of hairs and these hairs play a vital role in trapping the microorganism and help as a barrier um, uh, to different types of microorganisms so skin here acting as a barrier for different types of microorganism to get entry into the body then comes the spleen and then comes the lymphatic vessels so lymphatic vessels lymph node we all are familiar with lymph node our body consists of different types of lymph lymph node and all these are uh, uh, things we'll be going to discuss in detail and the next is the bone marrow so this diagram is consists of all the types of uh, the uh, immune system uh, organs that are there that are present in our body now we will going to study all these in detail one by one so uh, before starting that um, let's understand the parts of immune system so basically the immune system is composed of two parts 
द फर्स्ट इज द इनट इम्यून सिस्टम एंड सेकेंड इज द एडेप्टिव इम्यून सिस्टम सो वॉट इज इनट इम्यून सिस्टम एंड वॉट इज द एडेप्टिव इम्यून सिस्टम so so what is the innate immune system so innate immune system is that immune system that you are born with it means when a baby is born and when it is brought in a when uh, it a uh, baby is brought to this world right so the baby itself has a inbuilt immune system that is the reason he can or he or she can survive on this earth because of the presence of um, immune system that uh, he or she is having apart from uh, this other immune system include that is a adaptive immune system so this type of immune system is uh, adapt when your body is exposed to microbes or chemical that is released by microbes so innate immune system it includes the dendritic cells mast cell macrophages is there natural killing cells granulocytes is there so these all are included in the innate immune system and these are the different types of cells that fight against uh, the any foreign um, uh, particle or you can say any foreign Uh, 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 thing that is attacking the body. So apart from this, there is an adaptive immune system that is a B cell is there, T cell is there, antibodies bodies is there, CD uh, plus T cells are there, CDS T cells are there. So all these type of uh, um, cell is um, present. Once your body is start adapting or uh, or you can say start uh, to uh, expose to all these type of microbes or the chemicals that are released by the microbes. So basically, both the immune system is it is nothing that in innate uh, innate immune system will work uh, separately or it adapted adaptive immune system will. Work Work separately. No, both the immune system, whether it's us uh, innate or adaptive, both the immune system work together. Now comes, and yes, uh, now comes the next. That is. the uh, flow diagram of the uh, this is a basic diagram of adaptive and innate immune system how they works and how their um, cells work against different types of microbes so let's talk about first is the innate immune system so we first we will going to see the innate so innate immune system is also act as a defense to any uh, any uh, microorganisms that are attacking the body so innate immune system they uh, work against the foreign bodies injuries and pathogens whenever you are body get any type of a disease though this immune system works against uh, that infection if you <laughs> fall um, ill or if there is a any foreign bodies uh, inside our body and causing infection so the uh, innate immune system uh, they are fighting against uh, that uh, type of uh, infections as well as if you fall fall and found some injuries in your legs in your hands in your body so again who will responsible to cope up with that uh, injury is the immune system so then comes the how it's actually work so the bacteria killing substance so we all know that at uh, uh, immune system have all the facilities uh, facilities or you can say the cells that work against uh, the foreign particles so it has a bacteria killing substances so this uh, uh, immunity is uh, having a bacteria killing substances then have they have a protection uh, on the outside that is a uh, skin as already told you that skin play a very major role in when it comes to um, uh, 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 when it comes to any uh, inhibiting the entry of any sort of microorganisms then comes the protection on the outs inside means all the mucous membrane it again play a vital role in inhibiting or stopping uh, against any foreign bodies as already told you the mucus that is present in our nose it have it play a vital role in stopping the entry of any foreign bodies then comes the first attack in the tissues like scavenger cells means um, it also play a vital role because it is uh, it act as a scavenger means whenever they found anything foreign in our body in our body they start uh, um, eating that uh, uh, thing and uh, and start inhibiting their further growth then uh, this is about the innate immunity immune system or you can say uh, immune system that is present since our birth now comes the adaptive immune system so this type of immune system is those Im are those type of immune system that we adapt when the body is exposed to different types of microbes or chemicals that get entry and how we adapt to fight against uh, that uh, type of foreign particles or bodies so again they uh, they uh, also fight against the specific pathogen or uh, changed in the body cells so so there is a slightly um, diff slight difference between both of them like innate immune system Uh, it uh, fight against the foreign bodies whereas when it's adapted it is a most uh, more uh, upgraded form of the immune system and it uh, fight against certain specific pathogens or you can say if there is any change in the body cells they recognize that and they fight against that okay so now comes the defense uh, so they have different types of lymphocytes are there they have antibodies uh, are there they have different types of uh, t lymphocytes so again they are also fighting uh, for the foreign particles but here it is a slight difference that they are fi fighting against the uh, any specific type of a pathogens right so they they fight again they have a defense cells in the blood cell, so they are known as b lymphocytes so b lymphocyte you can also say b lymphocytes are those cells that uh, uh, fight uh, that those cells that uh, that it, sorry it is also known as defense cells and it is main, mainly present in our blood then comes the antibodies then antibodies against they fight against the different types of microorganisms or any foreign particles that get entry into the cells and uh, apart from this um, 
antibody or uh, B lymphocytes. The another is the defense cells in the tissues that is T lymphocytes. So when the defense cells that are present in the tissues, so they are known as T lymphocytes. So that is the only reason. What is B lymphocytes? So B lymphocytes are those defense cells that are present in our blood and um, T lymphocytes are those type of uh, lymphocytes uh, that are present in our tissue. So both of them, they fight against any foreign bodies that uh, have uh, just attacked our body and um, they fight against that. Now moving to the innate immune system, let's talk about innate immune system in detail. So this is a child rapid response system. You can see it is a child rapid response system or here I am using one word. Now uh, you will uh, going to see this child. So child is ultimately I am referring this child to human. Okay. So this child is I am referring to human. So make a, just to make a, an easy version that whenever a baby is born. So it has only a innate immune system. So I am just referring to that. So here the child means all the humans. So this is a child rapid response system. It is the first to, uh, to response when it finds an invader. It, it can be made up of a skin, iconium and the mucous membrane that the that the lines uh, the respiratory gastrointestinal uh, uh, genito uh, torinary tracts so uh, it is the first response uh, when uh, when it find an invader and uh, whenever a baby is born so uh, he or she is very small a child is very small to um, develop a um, uh, adaptive immune system so it uh, he or she is ha is having only an innate immune system and um, they uh, when they find uh, any foreign particles so they uh, they first respond to that invader so it is made up of innate immune system here it is made up of like uh, skin uh, the uh, eyes cornea and the mucous membrane that is present in our nose and the lines are of the respiratory gastrointestinal or genito urinary tract so they all makes a innate immune system of a child so these all create the physical barrier to protect the, uh, the child's body so these are uh, like whether it's a gastro, gastro, uh, gastrointestinal whether it's a respiratory whether it's un uh, urinary uh, tract or eye cornea or skin mucous membrane so what they are doing they are protecting a child body from all these type of foreign particles so uh, once the they protect against the harmful germs like parasites such as worm or a cell such as cancer so the innate immune system is inherited means the moment the baby is born it becomes active so when this uh, system recognizes an invader, it goes into an action right away. So it doesn't make, um, it is not like uh, when a baby is born after one week or after a month or after two months, baby will uh, recognize the invader and uh, their immune system will start working. No, baby is present in a mother womb. So um, whenever, when a baby is there, so all its act, it start working uh, very properly once a baby is uh, brought into this world. So innate immune system is inherited as it is inherited from um, uh, uh, naturally and this um, type of immune system is very active the moment a child is born and when this uh, system recognizes any foreign bodies or invader you can say it goes uh, into action right away it means it does not need take any time to perform their action so the cells of this immune system they surrounds and cover the invader how they do um, so the, the cells that are present in this immune system they um, they make a cover or they surround the uh, and cover the invader the foreign bodies the invader is killed inside the immune system that is the reason that is known as phagocytosis phagocytosis is a process by which the cell surrounds the invader like i am drawing here like this is a cell so so what does this uh, cell is doing this is an invader the cell is surrounding the cell uh, so this uh, invader and after uh, surrounding it and after covering it it uh, start killing it and uh, this is known as phagocytosis means phagocytosis means killing of a foreign body now moving to the next that is the acquired immune system so the acquired immune system uh, with the help of the innate immune system makes a special protein called antibodies to protect our body from the specific invader these antibodies are developed by the cells called b lymphocyte after the body has been exposed to this invader the antibodies stay in the child's body it takes several days for antibodies to form but the first uh, exposure the immune system will recognize the invader and defend against it the acquired immune system changes during the your child life so immunization train your child's immune system to make antibodies to protect them from a harmful disease so this is again very important that how uh, this um antibody uh, makes uh, anti, uh, anti uh, how this antibody work against a certain type of infection so acquired immune system they as already discussed they work against a very specific type of um, pathogens so what they do with the help of uh, the innate immune system they make certain uh, type of a special uh, proteins that is known as antibodies and these antibodies these antibodies what they are doing they are just fighting against the foreign invader so these antibodies they are developed by the cell known as the b cell b lymphocytes and after the body is exposed to such invader they start uh, killing uh, the invader and the antibodies uh, when it is present in our child in the child's body so um, the antibody uh, stay in the child's body and it takes several days so 
for that antibodies to form so there is a uh, antibody there in the child but it takes several days to um, uh, make that antibody full of action and to defend them um, to any sort of a foreign particles but after but after the first exposure means uh, when uh, a body is exposed to any foreign invader when the after the first exposure to um, any foreign invader the immune system they recognize the invader and defend against it means they recognize this yes this is not our uh, our uh, um, 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 you can say ye hamara sathi nahi hai in hindi if i tell you ye kehta hai ki ye hamara sathi nahi hai kuch foreign hai ye alag hai so they recognize that invader and they start um, defending uh, against and defend against it and after uh, recognizing and defending against that particular invader so they uh, acquired the immune system and the and they and the acquired immune system changes during the child's life so at every stage of our life so it start changing once they uh, once a child is born till it becomes so it start changing and we will going to study in this in detail when uh, we will going to study about the antibodies how the antibodies changes so this is known as immuno immunization um, so immunization is nothing but it trains the child's immune system to make antibodies so that they can have a protection from harmful diseases now coming to the next is that is the cell of both the uh, pa uh, both parts of immune system are made up of organs of the body that we have already discussed in uh, this diagram that we have just uh, uh, so these are nothing but it is a part uh, or you can say these are the cell uh, of both the immune system whether it's uh, innate or um, or uh, um, uh, the acquired immune system so the first is adenoids so adenoids are the two glands that are located at the back of the nasal passage and they again act um, as a barrier for any type of foreign bodies then comes the bone marrow so they are the soft spongy tissues that are found in our bone ca bone cavities so they are uh, also a part uh, a cell uh, that are present in the immune system and uh, basically uh, they all are the organs that are present in our body and these all organs uh, act as a barrier to any sort of foreign invaders then comes the lymph nodes so small organ shaped like beans which are located all over the bodies and connect via lymphatic cells if you can refer this diagram to see this so these are the lymph nodes that are present all over the body and uh, to perform their functions they require a lymphatic cells right so they require our lymphatic cells to perform their uh, functions and they are they uh, are located all over the body and they connect via which cell which vessel lymphatic vessels then comes the lymphatic vessels so lymphatic vessels here what it is doing they are acting as a network of channels so lymphatic cells are they are the network of channels all over the body that carries the lymphocytes to the lymphoid organs and bloodstream so what they are doing they are acting as a uh, carrier or you can say a network that carries the lymphocytes lymphocytes uh, to the lymphoid organs and bloodstream um, and then comes the uh, pyre patches so pyre patches is a lymphoid tissue in the small, small intestine so pyre patches they are the lymphoid tissues that are present in the small intestine then comes the spleen so the spleen is a first sized organ located in the belly like abdominal cavity may uh, there is a spleen that is present they again act as a barrier for many types of different types of uh, foreign particles then comes the thymus thymus two lobes that joint in front of the windpipe that is brachia behind the breast bone then comes the tonsils so tonsils two oval muscles that are present in the back of the throat and they again act as a uh, barrier for any types of foreign invader so how the how do antibiotics help against infections so how these antibiotics uh, that we take whenever we fall is how they act uh, 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 or you can say help to fight against infection so antibiotics can be used to help a child's immune system fight against infections like by bacteria but antibiotic don't work for infections that are caused by viruses antibiotics were developed to kill or disable certain bacteria that means that antibiotics that works for a skin infection caused by certain bacteria may not work to cure diarrhea that is caused by different bacteria so using antibiotics for the viral infections or using the wrong antibiotic to treat the bacterial infection can help bacteria to become resistant to that antibiotic so it won't work as well as in the future so it's important to take the antibiotics as prescribed for the right amount of time if the antibiotics are stopped early the bacteria may develop a resistance to that antibiotics then the infection may come back again and again and to and it's very hard to treat them so how this antibiotics work so every antibiotics they are used to treat uh, a child infections uh, and mainly uh, it only works uh, against the infection that is caused and that is caused by bacteria so they won't be working against the infection that is caused by viruses they will not work against so antibiotics they are developed in the sense so to kill or disable certain bacteria but it doesn't means that if you have any skin infection that is caused by different bacteria so you can't take medicines of that particular type of antibiotics to treat the same uh, amount of antibiotics that you are using to treat the infection that is uh, caused by different bacteria during your fever means every infection is treated with different types of uh, antibodies so every bacteria they required the different types of, of um, uh, infections require different types of antibiotics to treat the different types of infection means it does not like uh, is it does not work for the same uh, infections that every so if you are if you uh, is suffering from fever and if you take um, azithromycin in fever and the same medicine if you take take uh, when you are uh, having uh, infections in the skin so it will not work so every time you have to change the antibodies 
so um, uh, so whenever we uh, stop um, uh, using um, any antibiotics so early so uh, the bacteria may develop a resistance to the antibiotics and the infection uh, may come back again and again and it is very harder to treat that uh, type of infection so this is about uh, how do antibiotics fight uh, against uh, any uh, infections now comes how do the immune system do and how does it works so your immune system works hard to uh, keep uh, you healthy right so uh, so it's a job uh, to keep the germs out of your body and destroy them for a limit to the extent to their harm if they get in your body so um, we all know that this immune system they work so hard to keep a human body healthy so it is their basic job uh, to keep uh, any germs out of the body and to destroy them or you can say to limit the extent of their harm if they get inside our body so when your immune system uh, wo uh, is working properly so how you know that yes your immune system is working properly so when your immune system is working properly it can tell which cells are yours and which uh, substance are foreign to your body okay so the body start working against the foreign invader that is um, that came in contact with that particular cell so they uh, work against that foreign invaders it activate or you can say the mobilize the attack and kills the foreign invaders germs that can cause uh, you harm so it is the duty of the immune system to learn about the germs after uh, you have exposed to them and your body start develops the antibodies that we have already discussed what are antibodies to protect you from those specific germs so it is not always that all the antibodies will work against all the sort of a type of a germs a specific antibodies will work against the specific um, germs that get an entry in our body so an example of this concept occurs when you get a vaccine your immune system built up the antibodies to a foreign cell in the vaccine and will quickly remember these foreign cells and destroy them if you are exposed to them in the future sometimes even uh, i can tell you uh, this with an example that sometimes even a doctor can prescribe the antibiotics to help your immune system if you get uh, so sick but antibiotics uh, only kill certain bacteria they will not kill viruses so this is very much important that all the antibodies they only kill antibiotics they only kill certain bacteria okay so they do not kill any sort of a virus so whenever a child is born so a doctor so if, um, after discharge you get certain uh, vaccine vaccination child that ki is month pe ye vaccine lagegi is month pe ye vaccine lagegi just to boot uh, boost or you can say to make a child have a acquired immune system when your immune system is not working properly then how come to know that your immune system is not working properly so when you, when your immune system can't mount a winning attack against an invader a problem such as any infection is developed also sometimes your immune system mount a attack when there is no invader or doesn't stop an attack after the invader has been killed means if the infection is uh, keep repeating itself and again and again the same infection is coming and you are taking the antibiotics to uh, fight against that foreign invader but there is no a result of that antibiotic so it, this means that your immune system is not working properly so these activities result in such problems like uh, autoimmune diseases or any allergic reaction sometimes you can say cancer so what is the mechanism of infections now let's see the mechanism of infection so how this mechanism of infections occur so to produce an infection in a man a microbe has to gain entry into the host okay so whenever a microbe uh, wants to perform you can say infection or wants to produce an infection in a human body so the first step is to get the entry into the host so the most frequent you can say the protocols of entry um, are the respiratory tract gastrointestinal tract is there and break the superficial mucous membrane and sometimes they can also get entry through your skin so, but the most important is the, um, the respiratory tract that is the reason uh, why um, when there is a covid virus it is always rec uh, recommended to wear a uh, uh, mask why just to stop the entry of a, that uh, harsh virus to get uh, in the entry into our body because uh, through our nose because that is the reason we apply we wear mask just to stop the entry of those uh, that virus so from the portal of the entry the parasite uh, they may spread directly through the tissues or they may proceed via lymphatic channels to the bloodstream and uh, once they get um, uh, get a uh, proceed uh, with the, these lymphatic channels in the bloodstream so they start distributing themselves very widely and permits to reach a tissue uh, particularly that is suitable for the multiplications because the virus they multiply very fast with a fraction of second they multiply very fast so when the, when they uh, they start multiplying it um, themselves once they reach to the particular tissue nevertheless the basic agenda of the parasitic in uh, species is a set, uh, is to satisfy the uh, respiratory uh, satisfactory portal of the exit of the parasite from the host and in effective uh, mechanism of transmission to a new host are uh, also uh, this is very important in case of this parasitic host so that brings to the end of the lecture hope you have understood the lecture so as far as the lecture is concerned what all we have uh, finished so today we have talked about what is an immune system we have seen the different parts of the immune system what is the innate immune system what is an adaptive immune system and uh, we have seen the cells uh, of both the immune system um, that is a uh, innate and acquired immune system then how this antibiotics uh, helps to fight against infections and how does the immune system do or how does it work 
and uh, what are the major criteria for the infection to perform their uh, sorry uh, bacteria to perform their infections and we at last we have seen the mechanism of infections in this lecture we will going to study about one of the most important topic of immune response that is functional anatomy and development of immune system and biology of immune response so in the previous lecture we have seen the overview of immune system that is what is immune system and how immune system are useful for human beings how immune system are divided into two categories that is innate immune system and uh, uh, acquired immune system and what is the basic difference of both of them that is what is innate and what is uh, the acquired immune system so in this particular lecture we will going to study about what is the functional anatomy and development of immune system uh, immune system we will going to see the different types of parts that are involved in the immune system and how these part play an important role or you can say what are the functions of all these parts so we will going to cover this topic now these all thing in this lecture so the first thing if we say what is immune response parts are so the first part of our immune system is our immune system is made up of complex collection of cells and organs they all work together to protect you from germs and help you to get better when you are sick so these immune system uh, our immune system is uh, basically composed of many different types of complex organs and each organs and cells together form a immune system of uh, any human living creature and these immune uh, system protect uh, our uh, body from different types of germs that uh, are going to deteriorate our body so these immune system is very important when it comes to fight against different kinds of diseases now if we see this organ and cell so immune system is very complex why i am saying that immune system is very complex because this immune system is composed of different types of cells and organs and all these cells and organs together forms a system that is known as immune system and this um, immune system that organ and cells they work together to form a immune system that is a very much important when uh, when your body wants to fight any foreign particles or any foreign bodies that have uh, came into uh, in contact in the body and that is going to invade the body in different ways and causes the diseases so it is the function of the immune system to fight against those type of um, foreign bodies or invaders so let's talk about what are the organs or you can say what are the parts that are involved in the uh, formation of immune system so the first is the bone marrow second is liver third is thymus then comes the lymphatic system that consists of lymph nodes then comes the spleen and the last is the immune system, uh, and last is or is your spleen different types of spleen so can you see this diagram so this diagram is consists of a lymph node white blood cells respiratory system spleen stomach and intestine and skin if i say that skin play a very major role when it comes to uh, you know fight against various type of uh, foreign invaders then this is very right why because skin act as a barrier uh, of to different types of uh, Uh, diseases that uh, is uh, like any foreign particle whenever it is coming in contact with the skin so uh, skin it plays a very important role in fighting against that uh, particular type of a microorganism or pathogens because skin act as a external barriers to the to stop the entry of such a type of pathogens or foreign invaders then comes the white blood cells we all are aware of this white blood cells that is wbc so wbcs are the blood cells that fight against any infections or you can say white blood cells they uh, they act against uh, the different types of foreign bodies when it comes into uh, contact with the body, uh, with the body so this um, uh, white blood cells play a very important role when it comes to fight against various types of pathogenic microorganisms or if the body if the white blood cells see that there is any foreign invader so they start working against uh, those uh, foreign invaders so that is the reason white blood cell is known as uh, the known as a uh, uh, f- that fight against a different kinds of uh, pathogens that leads to, uh, to the infection in the body so this is about the white blood cells then comes the lymph nodes so in lymph nodes there are in, in the lymph nodes there are cells that is known as lymphocytes of the immune system these recognize and eliminate the invading pathogen so whenever it's a lymph node so this lymph node uh, <coughs> they are very much uh, uh, <laughs> consist of the lymph uh, lymph nodes they are the cells uh, which type of cells they are the lymphocyte cells and uh, they are they are very much uh, um, so these are in the lymph nodes they are uh, in the lymph nodes they consist of the cells and these cells are known as the lymphocytes of the immune system and they recognize and eliminate the uh, eliminate the invading pathogens means the pathogens that are not in uh, our body cells they are at the outside type of the body cells so, so they recognize those type of uh, cells and they start uh, invading them then comes the uh, respiratory system so the cilia that is a fine hair like projections line the airway and moves mucus and contaminants out upward and out of the respiratory tract so so uh, we all are familiar with the cilia that is a hair like projection that are there in the respiratory tract that is a in a uh, airway they recognize any foreign particles and they start invading them and they start uh, removing them from our body uh, through respiratory tract so so uh, it is again very much important when it comes to fight against different types of uh, uh, you can say pathogens 
then comes the skin uh, as we have already discussed the skin forms a very effective uh, barrier against invading pathogens because it acts as a external uh, external barrier to these kind of uh, invading pathogens then comes the white blood cells so the white blood cells uh, they are uh, again very much important and uh, how uh, because how bl white blood cells they attack pathogens both in the blood itself and in the uh, other tissues of the body it is, doesn't mean that white blood cell only fight against the um, pathogens that are inside the blood so outside the blood they also fight against such type of pathogens then comes the spleen so the spleen uh, it assists the body in projecting in protecting itself against bacterial infections then comes the stomach and intestine the stomach is its kill most of the harmful bacteria antibodies are secreted by uh, intestinal cells attacked viruses and other pathogens that have landed in the intestinal tract so when it comes to the stomach we all are we all are aware that stomach consist of uh, uh, different types of uh, uh, bacteria or you can say a different type not bacteria it consists of different types of acid and these acids they attack different types of bacteria or pathogens that are there in the body so in this way they are um, somewhere protecting the uh, body from different types of uh, harmful pathogens especially bacteria that are present in the stomach then comes the um, apart from this uh, there is an intestine intestine they also consist different types uh, types of um, uh, different types of uh, what you call in the acids and these acids against um, again that uh, they destroy different types of um, microbial pathogens that are there in the body so uh, can you see that these type of bacteria these type of acids are also working against different types of pathogens that in that are there in our body so in this way they are very uh, useful for human body and uh, so that uh, they can work against different types of pathogens so uh, in this way they act as a barrier to different types of microorganisms that are present inside the body now comes the next that is what is the function of the white blood cells so serving uh, as an army against harmful bacteria virus white blood cells search for the attack and destroy germs and keep uh, you healthy so <laughs> so if you say white uh, blood cells so white blood cells they act as a um, uh, they act as a, you can say that uh, this white blood cell they act as a soldier or they act as a army uh, and they defense our body from uh, from the entry of any types of foreign particles that could invade our body so in this way they protect your body from different types of microorganisms and help you to uh, remain healthy and um, the main function is to fight against different types of pathogen and keep the uh, body uh, they keep the body away from any sort of diseases so now this uh, white blood cells they are kept the uh, white blood cells are the key part of our immune system and uh, you can see that uh, uh, there are many white blood cells the uh, cells the uh, that are present in your immune system and each cell uh, yeah, each cell type either circulate in your bloodstream and throughout your body or residue in a particular tissue waiting to be called into an action so it is not it is not always the case that uh, the blood uh, that uh, this white blood cells they are always present in your of course they fight against uh, different types of pathogen when it comes to um, your blood because the white blood cells are mainly present in our blood streams but apart from this blood stream they also fight against different types of pathogens when it came uh, when it uh, comes under the actions when it uh, it uh, can also fight against different types of pathogens when uh, it is a concern with different types of tissues so they fight against the, those type of pathogens then uh, then comes the each type of cells has a specific mission in your body's defense system so when it comes to the defense system so each blood cells have a different type of uh, you can say defense system against uh, different types of infections in our body and uh, and these type of infections they are mainly uh, because uh, they invade the uh, body through different types of foreign particles and that uh, foreign particles is known as microorganism clear now comes each type of uh, each cell type has a specific mission in your body defense systems then comes each has four different ways of recognizing a problem communicating with other cells on the defense team and performing their functions so whenever it comes to a defense system so it is always a case with our wbcs that it came into first line defense and they act as a barrier or you can say they act as an army to different types of uh, uh, microbial pathogens that are invading uh, the body body cells and now comes to the next that is the lymph nodes so we all are familiar with the lymph node what are lymph nodes so these are a small glands filter and destroy germs so uh, that they can they can't spread to other part of the body and make you sick so it um, so lymph node is nothing but it is a small type of a glands and these glands they what they do basically they filter the uh, filter and destroy the germs so that they can, could not uh, you know spread to other part of the body cells and uh, and if they spread to the other body cells they make you uh, fall ill so uh, they are also a part of a body's uh, lymphatic system so lymph nodes contain immune cells that uh, that analyze the foreign invaders to into the body into the body they then activate replicate and send a specific lymphocyte that is a white blood cells to fight off at the particular invader we have th we have hundreds of lymph nodes all over our body including our neck arm pits and glon solid gender lymph nodes are a clue that our body is fighting against infection so because of the presence of lymph nodes so lymph nodes they are present all over our body so basically they are present in the arm pits they are present in, in our neck so these lymph nodes they are acting as a filter 
to destroy different types of pathogens and they are always ready to fight against these type of microbial uh, pathogens so that you, uh, you uh, so that it can save our body uh, from different types of infections now comes to the next that is spleen your spleen store white blood cells uh, that defends your body from the foreign invader it also filter your blood destroying the old and damaged blood cells so when it comes to the spleen so spleen uh, what is the function of the spleen so they act as a reservoir you can say or they act as a storage uh, tank where they store the white blood cells and um, after uh, you know storing the white blood cells they destroy and damage all the types of the foreign invaders that came into the body so it is the basic function is to restore the white blood cells so that they can act, they can, uh, you know, come into um, uh, action when there is any foreign particles that are there to invade our body cell. Then comes the tonsils and uh, adenoids. So, because they are located in, in your uh, throat and nasal passage, tonsils and adenoids can trap foreign invaders, for example, bacteria and viruses. As soon as they enter your body, they have an immune cell that produce antibodies to protect you from foreign invaders that can cause throat and lung infections. So, basically, these tonsils and adenoids, they are present in the throat. And because they are located in your in the throat and the nasal passage, so these tonsils and uh, adenoids, what they do, they trap the foreign invaders. So here I am refer uh, referring the foreign in invader as a bacteria and viruses. So as soon as they enter uh, your body, so what they do? They start, uh, um, they start performing their actions like they destroy, they started uh, destroying uh, the body cells and uh, causing different types of pathogens. And uh, because of that. Uh, what they do, they start uh, uh, releasing, uh, they start uh, trapping all these type of microbial pathogens and they start working against these microbial pathogens. Why? Because it is very much important because they are present uh, in your throat and in your uh, nasal cavity. That is the reason they act uh, as a barrier to different types of microorganism or you can say the foreign invaders. Then comes the thymus. So this, uh, this is very small organ. Um, they are basically present in the upper uh, part of your chest beneath your uh, breastbone and they helps, uh, to, uh, they helps to mature a certain types of white blood cells. So we have what they are doing they are maturing the different types of white blood cells and these white blood cells they are uh, obviously they act against any foreign invader so in this way um, they are they act uh, as a barrier to different types of microorganisms or foreign invaders that came into existence uh, when it uh, uh, that came into our body and uh, try to destroy our body so it is thymus who, uh, who recognize uh, this uh, who, uh, whose function is to mature the white blood cells and after maturing a certain types of white blood cells they uh, work against that uh, different types of pathogens then comes the bone marrow so when it comes to the bone marrow so bone marrow is very much important when it comes sorry so bone marrow these are the stem cells in the spongy center of the of your bones they develop into a white uh, red blood cells plasma cells and a variety of white blood cells and other immune cells so your bone marrow makes a millions uh, billions of uh, new blood cells and every day release them into the bloodstream then comes the skin mucous membrane and other uh, first line defense your skin is the first line defense in preventing and destroying germs before they enter your body skin produces oils and secrete under protective immune system cells mucous membrane line the respiratory digestive and reproductive tract these membrane secretes the mucus which lubricates and moisture surface germs sticks to mucus in the respiratory tract and then moved out of the airways like a hair like a structure called cilia so that is the um, that is we have already discussed that the skin act as a barrier and this barrier is a uh, uh, this barrier is consists of different types of oil and uh, they, what is the major functions of the skin or the sea or the mucous membrane so they trap the different types of microorganisms when they enter the body at a very first uh, line defense you can say and they have certain types of oil that um, you know protect the body for, uh, body from different types of pathogens when they get entry into the uh, cells then comes the stomach and bowl so the uh, stomach uh, we have already discussed this also that stomach they consist of various type of uh, bacteria enzymes uh, sorry acids and these acids work against uh, different types of uh, uh, pathogens that uh, that are very harmful to the body then comes the next that is conditions and disorders so many def deficiencies and disorder can damage or disrupt your immune system some medicines make it harder for your body to fight infection certain health condition and uh, condition cause your immune system to attack healthy uh, and these cells and make it hard for your immune system to protect you from the harmful germs so they include allergies autoimmune disorder primary immunodeficiency disorder infections cancer and and sepsis then comes the how to keep your immune system uh, healthy so this is uh, the conditions and disorders that are uh, majorly related to um, the immune system and how immune system fight against that so the first is the uh, many deficiencies and disorder can damage or disturb the immune system some medicines make it harder for your body to fight against infection certain health condition causes immune system to attack healthy cells or make it hard to so it is always said that because of the certain deficiencies or disorder uh, so um, different types of diseases they can disturb the immune system that is the reason whenever we fall ill we say our immune system is not working properly or it has uh, it is not so healthy so it is very harder to fight against uh, that uh, infection why because your immune system has already disturbed so in certain conditions 
it is very hard to find uh, uh, protection from the harmful uh, germs so the first uh, disease or disorder it includes the uh, allergies so when the body over react to harmless substances such as food um, or pollen the immune system launches a response your body fight uh, with this uh, allergy triggers by releasing histamines that can cause allergy symptoms and allergic reaction can range from mild to severe and histamine medication can help to calm the symptoms so allergies what is allergy so allergies are nothing but it uh, it act when uh, the body uh, they what they do they overreact with the harmless uh, substances harmful um, uh, substances the immune system uh, what they do they launches a response to that so when your body fight against these type of allergy triggers so they release certain histamines and because of these histamines the body uh, get a uh, allergy symptoms and uh, if you see the allergic reactions they uh, they have a very great uh, wide range because they um, ranges from sneezing uh, or sniffing nose to the to develop various um, severe health breathing uh, problem sometimes even the death so histamine medication is a medication type of a medication that uh, uh, help and calm these type of symptom then comes the autoimmune disorder so these disorder occurs when the immune system mistakenly attack its own healthy cell autoimmune means auto means self so whenever the immune system they attack their mistakenly not purposely mistakenly when they attack their own healthy cell so they uh, uh, so this type of autoimmune disorder occur so basically like um, histamino diseases arthritis arthritis and lupus diabetes so these are certain types of diseases that occurs due to the autoimmune disorder means the immune system itself destroying or attacking their own cells then comes the primary immunodeficiency disorder so these disorders they are inherited means inherited from your family members so the, there are more than 100 primary uh, Im, uh, immunodeficiency diseases that is PIDD that prevent the immune system from working as it should so then comes the infection so HIV uh, infection is the well known infection that weaken the immune system and it leads to the serious um, health issues so that is the reason because you know what um, whenever a person fall ill we generally speak these type of words spoke this type of word that your immune system is not working properly you take certain types of supplements to boost your immune system isn't it so why we are doing so just to boost your immune system just to make your immune system healthy that is why we are adopt to uh, a new lifestyles of eating why because we um, include those foods that has a great impact when it comes to boost your immune system so it is very much important to have that type of food that in boost your immune system make your immune system strong so when a person is start falling again and uh, ill again and again after a fraction of days he became again ill it become he becomes again ill so what it uh, there is a random pattern of falling and ill and because uh, the person is continuously after a certain uh, days gap it um it is because he is becoming ill 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 so what does it means they are just uh, you know um, their immune system becomes very weaker because why because their immune system no, not so strong to fight against different types of diseases that is why when a newborn baby has a very uh, you cannot say very strong immune system to fight against different types of pathogen as compared to the uh, human beings uh, a mature human being so as the time passes your immune system becomes strong but at a at a uh, when it reach to a certain age limit so the immune system start becoming weaker because of the age factor because you are not taking a proper amount of nutrient so that is the reason it is always recommended to take a that type of food that has a strong um uh, effect on your immune system so apart from the, this infection then comes cancer so certain types of cancers like leukemia lympho, uh, lymphoma and myeloma uh, they affect the immune system directly and these cancers occur when immune cells grow uncontrollably you can say mutation because of mutation uh, cancer occur then comes a sepsis so sepsis is nothing but it is an overwhelming response of your body's immune system to an infection so this trigger widespread infection and causes a down uh, downyard spiral of event and that can end the organ damage and organ failure even sometimes the death now comes how to keep immune system healthy so what is the basic uh, rules or you can say method to keep uh, the immune system healthy so the first is to keep your immune system running smoothly quite um, you you should always quit uh, smoking lose weight or maintain a healthy body mass eat a healthy diet that include lots and lots of fruits and vegetables avoid consuming alcohol or use um, if you are using to uh, take in a very low amount then get enough sleep exercise regularly wash your hands very often try to stress less and focus on the uh, mind and body wellness make sure you are up to date on vaccines so these are certain criteria that you should always keep in mind to boost your immune system or to keep your immune system healthy so this because this uh, uh, leads to the end of the anatomy of the immune system now in the next lecture what we will going to study we will going to study the next part that is the immune response so we will going to cover the immune response in the next lecture it will be a very short term uh, lecture of immune response so we will going to cover this uh, in the next lecture so hope you have understood the lecture so today in this lecture we will going to study about immune response or you can say biology of immune response so this topic is the continuation of functional anatomy and development of immune system we have already covered what is functional anatomy and development of immune system we have seen the part of immune system we have studied the different functions of each part of the immune system we have seen what is white blood cell we have also studied what is lymph nodes what is the function of the lymph nodes and we have seen different other organs and conditions and disorders that came into uh, existence when a person fall ill and what are the major precautions that a person needs to take 
so in this particular lecture we will going to start about immune response so the immune response is how your body recognize and defends against itself against bacteria viruses and substances that appear foreign and harmful and so now what is immune response so we all know that immune res response is how your body recognize and defends against the different types of pathogens like bacteria viruses and substances that appear foreign and harmful to the body so in simple words we can say the immune system it protects the body from possible harmful substances by recognizing and responding to the antigen antigen again is a foreign substance that came into the body and they are uh, um, harming the body and uh, causing a type of a diseases so what are antigens so antigens are the substances that are usually protein on the surface of the cells viruses fungi or bacteria non living substances such as toxin chemicals and drugs and foreign particles such as splinters can also be an antigen so the immune system they recognizes and destroy or try to destroy the substance that contains antigens so we all know that all the vertebrates have immune system whereas invertebrates have a primitive defense system let us understand with this example let us say that if a person if it if, if this is a person person one he is suffering from cold but without taking any medicine after two or three days it's cold automatically uh, get cured so this is because due to the presence of the auto immune system that is present in the this uh, person in this person why because of the presence of auto immune system okay however our body has evolved immune system to protect from infections by pathogens we all uh, we have already discussed so any foreign macro molecules whenever i am saying macro molecules means protein polysaccharides or even the nucleic acid when they induced immune response so what they are doing they are inducing the immune res response so the properties of inducing antibodies are called immunogenicity in in exam if, or in the interview if they can ask you what is immuno immunogenicity genicity what is immunogenicity so immunogenicity is the properties of inducing antibodies antibodies it is known as immunogenicity so the antigens are very specific and are so are the antibodies means if we say that antigens are very specific means they target the um, tissue where they wants to uh, spread their um, harmful infection so antibodies also um, are also very specific and they target the specific antigens so with a slight change in protein even a single amino acid changes arises in the nature of antigens so the study of immune system is also known as immunology we all know that so the immune response um, they are also uh, you know divided into uh, different categories like hormonal uh, immune response are there uh, cell mediated immune response is there so what is hormonal immune response so hormonal immune response or you can say immunity they involves to the production of globular proteins that provides immunity called immunoglobulins so that is uh, another things we will going to discuss this again in detail so this is what immunogenicity is now moving to the next that is primary immune system and secondary immune system so what is the difference between primary and secondary immune system so we all know that this immune system helps the body to fight against different types of microbial pathogens sometimes they are in the forms of living things like uh, bacteria viruses or uh, uh, different types of mold yeast and sometimes it is in the form of chemicals like toxins like different types of uh, chemicals so depending upon the nature immune system is divided into two uh, two categories the first is the primary and second is the secondary so let's talk about the primary one so the primary immune response occurs when a pathogen comes in contact with immune system for the first time means whenever the whenever the pathogens they start uh, when they enter our body and they start contact with the immune system for the very first time the first contact between a pathogen and immune system is known as primary immune system so during this time the immune system has to learn to recognize the antigen produced antibodies against that it um, it and eventually produce a memory lymphocytes the primary immune system or response is slow and short lived so whenever whenever a infection came into um, the uh, body of a human being the immune system so firstly pathogen is equal to immune system means equal to matlab the first contact between pathogen and immune system is known as primary immune response so during this time the immune system it has to recognize the antigen that is um, there and start producing the antibodies against this antigen to fight against this type of infection but again the primary immune system is a very first step of the very starting step so this step is a little slow and very short lived so uh, uh, so the next is the Uh, immune uh, response that is secondary immune response so the secondary immune response occurs when a person is exposed to the same antigen again and again means if you are having a cold 
again and again so what um, um, is there the antigen the person is again exposing to this antigen of that cold again and again or um, a certain virus that caused cold again and again so it is exposed to the same antigen again and again so during this time immunological memory has been established means and the, the immune response has developed a memory that yes this is the same antigen that is harming the body again and again so you know, what they do they start producing antibodies immediately so within an hour um, after recognition of an antigen a new army of plasma cells are generated so within two to three days the antibodies concentration in the cell they rises they are steepy and reach much higher level than a primary response and this is known as the booster response so secondary immune system is also known as the booster immune booster response why because once they recognize the antigens uh, they start producing the antibodies in numbers and once um, they generated the uh, antibodies they develop a new uh, army of plasma cells they are generated so within two or three days the antibody concentration they rises very rapidly and um, at a very much higher level as compared to the primary response and this is also known as booster response now moving to the next that is what is the basic difference between a primary uh, immune response and a secondary immune response so if we see the difference that is the primary immune response is it occurs as a result of primary contact with an antigen whereas the secondary response is it occurs as a result of a second and subsequent contact with the same antigen so here if the uh, contact is um, uh, the first contact between the uh, antigens and the um, immune response uh, whereas um, uh, here it is the same uh, antigen that came in contact with the same uh, same antigen is coming in contact with the immune system then comes the antibody in this so the antibody level reaches the peak um, in a 7 to 10 days means it takes a uh, 7 to 10 days to reach whereas the antibody level reaches within 3 to 5 days means here the time limit is less then comes the prolonged period is required to establish the immunity means you require a more time to establish immunity whereas in the secondary immune system it establishes the immunity in a very shorter period of time so there is a rapid decline in antibody level well, as in the secondary, the antibody level remain high for a longer period of time. So, it <coughs> primary immune system it appears mainly in the lymph nodes and spleen, whereas it appears mainly in bone marrow, followed by spleen and lymph node. So, basically, the primary immune system they uh, basically appears in the lymph node and spleen, but um, uh, the secondary immune response they mainly uh, occur um, or appear in the bone marrow. And apart from bone marrow, uh, they also followed by they, are all, they may also appear in the spleen and the lymph node. So, this is the basic difference between the primary immune response and the secondary immune response. So, now this is very important because in examination, they can ask you what is immune response or what is the basic uh, difference between the primary immune response and secondary immune response. So, now this is uh, basically the difference uh, uh, that uh, we are going to be asked in the examination. So, apart from this, let's discuss one definition of antigen and uh, what is antigen so i am writing the definition of antigen you can just take a screenshot of the definition of antigen so what is antigen antigen so antigen is any chemical substance that stimulate that stimulates immune response means any chemical substance which is uh, stimulating the immune response is known as antigen so it is um, it is uh, uh, it consists of sometimes a very large molecules uh, number of molecules that, that act as uh, antigens like uh, such as some complex uh, heteropolymers uh, are there certain types of serum proteins are there certain bacterial glycoprotein lipops uh, lipopolysaccharides uh, are there peptidoglycan bacterial flagellin is there so they act as an antigen so if if i i make a diagram of antigen so you can see how this antibody they uh, you know work against this antigen so if this is an antigen antigen i'm marking as an okay so uh, antigen has certain substance surface like this and again so this small dot is or you can say circle is haptic and this uh, is known as antigenic determinant or you can say antibody binding site so this is the place where this antibody bind itself and it performs their action so this is antibody ab so this is a site of uh, uh, by this you can say this is a binding site so uh, antigenic determinant is the binding site where antibody bind with antigens and uh, it is like this so it is somewhat a diagram of antigen that how the antigen uh, look like and how antibody binds uh, the antigens. So the, this is uh, about uh, the antigen. So that springs to the end of the lecture. Hope you have understood. So as far as this lecture is concerned, we have seen what is immune response, the definitions of immune re response, what is antigen. We have discussed the primary and the secondary immune response as well as we have seen the basic differences and we have also seen 
uh, how this uh, antigen and antibodies bind together and uh, what are the basic um, uh, binding site where they bind itself so hope you have understood the lecture if there is any doubt related to the lecture or anything you, know, you want to ask you so you can leave your uh, queries in the comment section below in the next lecture i'll be answering the queries and yes in examination point of view they can ask you certain questions like uh, what is the basic difference between um, uh, immune um, primary immune system and secondary immune system or uh, what uh, what term is used for uh, formulating uh, formulation of clump by antibodies around antigen you can just tell the name of that binding site and uh, they can also ask you what do you understand by immune response the basic uh, thing and um, sometimes they can also ask you in one fill in the blanks like hormonal anti immunity works through antibodies right so uh, this is all about uh, today's lecture we're going to study about antigen and antibody interaction so this antigen and antibody interaction is a broad topic of immunology so in the previous lecture of immunology we have seen and studied about the overview of immune system we have also seen what is immune response we have also studied about the anatomy of immune system that is what all organs are involved in protecting our body from any foreign body so today's lecture is based on antigen and antibody interaction means how the antigen and antibody interact with each other and how they fight against each other and make our body free from any sort of diseases so antigen and antibody interaction or reaction is a particular chemical interaction between antibodies generated by b cell of the white blood cells and antigen during the immune reaction the process of agglutination combines antigen and antibody so the introduction part says that antigen and antibody interaction or reaction is a sort of a chemical interaction between the antibodies those antibodies that are generated by generally b cell of the white blood cell uh, and antigen so if this if this is an antibody they uh, they combine with antigen like this and they fight against each other and uh, during the immune reaction so this is how the interaction take place so can you see in this diagram this is an antibody and this is an antigen whenever this antigen strike the body part the white blood cell immediately generate b cell b cell they forms the antibodies and these antibodies what they do they they find this antigen and they get attached to, to this antigen surface and when the antibody um, get attached to the antigen surface then this is known as antibody or antigen antibody complex and this is how interaction occurs so it is a chemical interaction between antibodies and antigen now moving to it is the basic biological process that the body uses to defend itself against various foreign particles like viruses and their toxic chemicals <coughs> so it is a biological process uh, through which our body itself uh, defend um, themselves from uh, any foreign particles like viruses and their toxic chemicals an antigen antibody complex is formed in a blood when antibodies specifically and strongly bind to antigen so the what is the main purpose or primary um, principle behind this interaction is to fight against any foreign particles like viruses and like other toxic chemicals so when the antigen and antibody complex uh, when it is formed in the blood uh, when you know, the antibody is specifically and strongly bind to the antigen like this and this basically is um, the whole process is done in the blood the immunological complex is subsequently transferred to cellular system where it can be eliminated or deactivated so this immunological complex that is formed then it is transferred to the cellular system and from cellular system it is eliminated or it get deactivated now comes what is antigen nt means opposite gen means something that can cause of course antigen is a foreign particle gen means something that can cause they can cause what they what antigen cause antigen cause harm to human body so immunogens are any foreign substances that once enter our bodies frequently causes a sequence of immunological response while other known as ha haptins require the assistance of other molecule or carrier protein to activate a immunological response all the immunogens and haptins are referred to as antigens so antigens are known as a, um, uh, any any substance that uh, or anything that can cause harm to human body that that is known as antigen or you can say a foreign substance that that somehow enter our body and start invading the cells of our body and causing infections so these immunogens they are um, nothing but they are a foreign substance that once enter our body they uh, frequently uh, causes the sequence of immunological response then other uh, other known as haptins so antigen are also called as immunogens or they are also known as haptins so haptins they require the assistance of other molecule means a carrier protein they require um direction or assistance of the carrier protein to activate the immunological response so both of them um, uh, known uh, together together uh, both of them are known as antigens so they could be polysaccharide lipid protein or peptides and epitope is an antibody binding <coughs> location so where antigen and antibodies bind together it the place is known as epitope 
Now moving to the next, that is how this interaction or immuno um, antigen look like. So as you can see in the diagram, the, this part, this uh, no, well, this part that is a one part, these are known as antibodies. These are what antibodies. Then this ye yellow portion is known as what antigen. This is antigen, and inside this there is a pathogen. Pathogen. Okay. So what they do, the antibody the bodies find that there is an antigen. They come and get attached to this antigen. Okay, and a different antibodies will made for this antigen and there are different types of antibodies depending upon the type of infection. They come bind with this antigen and they form an antibody antigen complex or you can say interaction. Then before moving to antibodies, let us uh, quickly uh, take a revision of what is antibodies. I am writing here antibody or oh, sorry antigen antibody reaction. So, anti antigen and antibody reaction can easily be studied um, in the laboratory by using the preparation of antigen and anesthesia. So, these uh, type of studies um, uh, says that reaction is called seriology. So, whenever there is a, uh, I am using another, oh, oh, again I am writing antibody antigen <coughs> reaction. Now, what is it? This is nothing but this reaction. This reaction is known as zero logy what does this reaction mean serology so these different types of serological reaction can be obtained or you can say observed depending on the properties of antigen and antibodies type of antigen antibody reactions have different types of reactions means this serological uh, what is uh, this reaction is known as serology, uh, serology and uh, this whole uh, the reaction is known as serology reaction this whole is known as serological reaction and this reaction is different um, that means depending upon the type of antigen and antibody reactions so basically they have for different types of application as well as different types of functions so when the combining site of antibody and, and uh, antibody molecule when it is capable of binding a very small number of amino acid of protein antigen so the recognition of antigen by antibody is governed by the secondary or tertiary structure of the polypeptide chain in the antibody molecule so it generally depends which type of infection is used to treat. Now moving to the next, that is what is antibodies. <clears throat> See, an antibody is a component that an immune system produces in response to antigen. Thus, antigen result in the production of antibodies. They act uh, they act together to exhibit an immunological response. The ca general characteristics of antibodies are as follows as. So just like antigen, antigen is what? Antigen is a foreign uh, substance that get entry inside our body. And once it uh, get entry inside our body, they causes harm to the body. So to work against these foreign bodies, the immune system, they generate a type of a body uh, that is known as antibodies so that they can easily defend or uh, against these type of antigen. So what is antibodies? Antibodies are the uh, compound that, that an immune system uh, uh, basically um, uh, what does they, they do? They basically uh, generate in response to these type of antigen. So antigen result in the production of antibodies. Whenever there is an antigen, uh, so to to work against the, that particular antigen, antibody is there. So what is the general characteristics? So whenever the general characteristics of antibodies is the first one is an antibody is also known as immunoglobulin. So IB. So we uh, I have already discussed about immunoglobulin in our in my previous lecture that what is immunoglobulin when when I was. Uh, completing the uh, immune uh, response so in that particular uh, uh, lecture I have taught you about immunoglobulin so you can refer to that lecture to, to get an information about immunoglobulin so uh, they are generally a Y shaped as you have already seen uh, antibodies look like this <coughs> they are glycoproteins they are made up of or composed of glycoproteins they are generated by plasma B cell so basically from where they are generated so they are generated from plasma B cell then comes the paratop is the name of the antigen binding site. So where they go and bind with the antigen, so that site is known as paratop. There are basically five types of antibodies present that is Ig, IgG, IgA, IgM, IgE and IgD. So every type of antibodies have different function to perform. So IgG antibodies have different functions to perform, IgM have different function to perform. So depending upon the type of antigen and type of infection, every antibody 
body have different types of functions so they are basically uh, uh, ig now i am writing a full form of each antibodies uh, in detail so uh, if we see this diagram uh, so this is a diagram of antibodies this is a antigen and uh, an antigen binding fragment and this is an antigen that how antigen get bind to, uh, to this antibody so antibody is a y shaped and this is a place where the antigen get bind to it now let's quickly uh, discuss about what is igm or what is the full form of ig uh, G A I G M. So firstly, we will going to cover these two. Then I will proceed to further. So I G M. So here G is known as gamma. What does G known as gamma? So uh, uh, and M is uh, known as mu mu. M is known as mu. We will going to discuss each one in detail. Then D comes for I G. <coughs> D is known as for delta. And at last A that is I G A. So A is known as alpha. So these are the full form of each antibodies. So uh, the I G um, G forms a major part of blood. So in in all these five, this uh, G one uh, and uh, the G one that is I G um, uh, G, they forms a major part um, in the blood. And uh, these antibodies are always bivalent. Why bivalent? Because they containing two antigen binding site that you have already seen in the diagram. So the hinge uh, region is flexible. Therefore, the distance between two antigen binding sites varies. So uh, this hinge uh, season, uh, region is flexible. So you will uh, ask me what is hinge region. So this uh, region is known as hinge region, and because it is flexible, so uh, this uh, the distance between two uh, antigen binding site may get may be varied. Now moving to the next, that is antigen antibody reaction. So antigen and antibodies they combine specifically with each other. The antigen antibody reaction is in the term used to describe this interaction between them. So, AGAB reaction is common acronym for it. These serve as a building blocks or hormonal or antibody mediated immunity. These reactions serve as a foundation for the detection of both the specific and non-specific antibodies, such as enzyme that can cause non-specific enzyme. Serological reactions are also referred as AGAB reactions when they occur in in vitro. So whenever the reaction uh, is carried out in the laboratory in in vitro process so that a reaction is known as that uh, reaction is known as serological reaction that i have already discussed this is how antigen and antibody interaction take place so if this <coughs> is a antibody uh, so uh, both of them are the antibodies and these are the epitope and uh, this is how the interaction between the antibodies and inter antigen take place now moving to the next what are the stages of antigen and antibody reactions so basically when it uh, sorry whenever it's the stages so basically the, the the reaction occurs in three stages the first uh, stages the first stage of reactions entitles the formation of a b a g and a b complex so where the first is in the first step uh, it forms a antigen and antibody complex they form the complex of both antigen and antibodies then in the second stage it uh, results in the visible phenomena like agulation precipitation etc in the third stage it involves the destruction of antigen or neutralization of antigen so in the first step uh, it is the interaction like this here the interaction is taking place then after interaction phenomena like precipitation agu agglutination etc take place after that whenever the, the antigen get binds with the antibodies so this uh, harmful antigen they are deactivated or uh, neutralized and they are eliminated from the body through the cellular cells so this is how the stages of antibody and antigen reaction take place now uh, antibody and antigen uh, reaction this is a diagram through which you can understand how antigen uh, and antibody interaction take place first of all in this di particular diagram can you see the antibody in the parent serum patient serum they uh, are the, they are target rbcs after that rbcs they combined with rbcs they found a, formed a bond with rbcs then agitation of rbcs take place then after that uh, this uh, antigen is removed from the body cells or they are uh, they can uh, they are uh, inactivated or eliminated from the body then what is the properties of antigen and antibody reactions so uh, the first property says they are uh, specific uh, they have a very specific reaction they occur in noticeable manner they have a non covalent reactions like uh, non covalent reactions like ionic bond van van der wall forces hydrophobic interaction hydrogen bond then anti antibodies and antigen are not denatured the reaction is reversible affinity means this refers to how strongly an antigen bind to certain antigen binding site on the antibody so affinity it is the it refers to how strongly an antigen binds then affinity affinity it is more general concept than affinity then it represent the antibodies and uh, antigen complex total strength it depends upon the antibodies affinity antibodies and antigen with, with, uh, 
valencies and then how epitope and paratope are structurally uh, structurally 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 arranged then comes the cross reactivity so that of uh, cross reactivity is described that an antibody they have a capacity to bind similar epitope or other antigen so this is about the lecture now let's quickly discuss some important questions so the first, first question that can be asked in the interview as well as in the exams that is what are the three types of antigen what is antigen made up of and what are the five types of antibodies so these questions can be asked in the examination we will be going to study about types of antigen antibody reaction so in the previous lecture we have discussed about what is antigen and antibody interaction we have seen that how antigen and antibody interact with each other we have also discussed about different types of antigens and different types of antibodies and their functions and how they bind with antigens we have all seen in the previous lecture so today we will going to study about types of antigen and antibody reaction so the types of antigen and antibody reactions are as follows as the first one is precipitation reaction second is agu <coughs> agglutination reaction third is competent area fixation fourth is immunofluorescence and last is elisa that is enzyme playing immunosorbent assay so all these uh, reactions we will be going to study one by one so the first reaction is the precipitation reaction so in precipitation reaction uh, 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 unsoluble precipitate of uh, antibody and antigens complex is produced when a soluble antigen and its antibody combine in the presence of electrolyte that is NaCl at a specific pH and temperature. So this means that uh, an insol uh, insoluble precipitation of uh, Ag and Ab complex is what it is produced whenever a soluble antigen uh, antigen is a soluble that is a soluble antigen and its antibody means this antigen and its antibody when they are combined together. So the environment should be at the presence of electrolyte which type of electrolyte that is NaCl and the, at a specific temperature and pH so the precipitant in, in the antibody that causes precipitation and reaction is termed as precipitation reaction so uh, they have precipitant precipitant is the antibody that causes precipitation and because of the precipitant the name uh, is there termed as precipitation reaction <coughs> so the precipitation reactions occur in both liquid and gel media um, so this precipitation uh, it occurred both in gel and as well as the liquid media so if we talk about the liquid media then a liquid uh, liquid media or you can say liquid precipitation is that type of a precipitation when a reaction is occurring in a liquid media so in this the antigen and antibody reaction they, it is carried out by adding increasing amount of antigen to the tubes containing a constant amount of antibody precipitation result from the combined reaction of antigen and antibody um, uh, reaction so this liquid precipitation is a type of a reaction in which antigen and antibody reaction it is carried out in a liquid media in which you put uh, an increasing amount of antigen where yeah? the number of antigen in this liquid precipitation is higher than the number of antibody so here antibody is remaining constant but what you are increasing you are increasing the amount of antigen in that tub so in that so the precipitation uh, result from the combined reaction between antigen and antibody now comes the gel precipitation so gel precipitation is a type of a reaction that occurs in a gel media so in this uh, petri dishes are used or you can say petri plates are used and uh, these petri plates or uh, petri dishes well, they are filled with the uh, agar gel or similar gel are used in these type of method in gel system both antibody and antigen rapidly diffuse in all directions so once the antigen um, is a uh, uh, you know <coughs> Uh, once uh, both the antigen and antibody are, uh, are transferred to the petri dish or petri plates then that petri plates uh, which contains uh, agar gel or similar gel which is uh, similar to the agar so what they do the antigen and antibody they rapidly diffuses themselves in all the directions so a zone of equ uh, equivalency observed at a visible precipitation and it will form a specific amount a point uh, depending on the diffusion rate and <coughs> concentration of the reactant so um, um this um after the antibody and uh, antigen they re they rapidly diffuse in all direction so um, a zone of equivalency is observed as a visible precipitation will and it is formed at a specific point depending upon the diffusion rate and concentration of the react uh, reactant so here the uh, zone of equality or equivalency it is observed and it is based on the diffusion rate as well as the concentration of the reactant now comes the agglutination agu uh, reaction so uh, now we have completed the precipitation reaction now we are going uh, moving to the agitation reaction so the particles are uh, in this type of reactions so the particles they are clustered or agulated in a certain antigen is uh, combined with antibody in our presence of electrolyte at an appropriate temperature and ph so in this uh, agitation means a cluster means our, the particles they are clustered with certain antigen 
as well as the antigen is combined with antibody and in the presence of electrolyte and <coughs> the temperature should be appropriate or the pH should be specific. So the clumps of the <coughs> The clumps of the cellular antigen formed by the serum's antibody is known as agglutins. So, uh, the, the clumps of the cellular antigens means the, the clump that is made from the cellular antigen. So, they are formed by the serum's antibody. That is the reason it is known as agglutinins. So, agglutinogens uh, are the name uh, for the agglutinated uh, and uh, particulate antigens so uh, it is basically of two types that is a slight agglutination and a tube agglutination so when it is a slight agglutination so it, this is the fast and the convenient way to identify the presence of agglutinating antibodies then tube <coughs> agglutination this is a common technique for estimating the quantity of antibody a constant amount a constant volume of antigen suspension is introduced after serially Dilutating the antibody containing serum with a saline in multiple small test tubes. So, as compared to the tube, slight agglutination is more fast, more convenient, and it is very easy to identify the presence of agglutinating uh, antibodies. And um, uh, whereas the tube agglutination is concerned, so it is a very common technique for estimating the present quantity of antibodies. Here we are identifying what agglutinating antibodies, and here we are estimating the quantity of antibodies. Kitani quantity mein hai. Then a constant volume of antigen suspension is introduced. Here the antigen uh, should be of a constant amount means the constant volume of antigen is introduced means a, a specific number is introduced after serial diluting means here serial dilution is taking place the antibody containing serum with saline in multiple test tube we all know that what is serial dilution now coming to the next that is a complement fixation so complement fixation is another type of antibody and um, antigen reaction so uh, in this some non-specific unstable fresh serum the component known as complement are required for the lysis of rbc's or microorganism so here non-specific as well as unstable fresh serum so these type of serums are used serum components are used as a complement and they are why they are required for the lysis means breakdown of rbc's or microorganisms so every person has 11 protein that comprises the complement system so every person every human has how many number of proteins 11 number of proteins that comprises the complement system so what they do they attach to the fc subunit of antibodies in the ag and ab complex <coughs> so whenever AG and AB complex is formed. So, in AG, uh, AG and AB complex, they get attached to the FC submit of uh, subunit of antibody and complement fixation test make uh, use of the antigen and antibody complexity to fix the complement. So, basically, it is uh, used uh, for fixing the complement. So, the first in the first step, the AG and the anti serum which has been heated to uh, 56 degrees centigrade, they are heated so to inactivate the complements. Then further, they are further combined uh, with a known quantity of complement. This is incubated again for 18 hours at 4 degrees centigrade. So if the serum contains antibody at a very specific for antigen, and then AG and AB complex will develop and fix the complement. Now coming to immunofluorescence. So immunofluorescence in this fluorescence is used. Fluorescence means light. So Fluorescence is the ability to absorb light rays of a certain wavelength and emit uh, light rays of different wavelength. So, fluorescence, they have an ability uh, to absorb light rays <coughs> as well as uh, the wavelength should be of certain wavelength. But they emit the light rays of different wavelength. This is the ability. Means they absorb the light of certain wavelength, but when they are emitting, so they can emit the ray of light of different wavelength. Then fluorescence dye emit intense visible light when exposed to UV radiation. So when it when fluorescent dye, when they are uh, exposed to UV radiation, so what they do, they emit the intense visible light. So in 1942, a scientist known as Albert Coons and co-workers demonstrated that how labeled dyes could be coupled to antibodies, allowing for the detection of antigen using these labeled dye. So, in year 1942, a scientist known as Albert Kuhn and Coons and uh, the work and his co-worker he demonstrated that how labeled uh, uh, dyes means the dyes that are labeled could be coupled with antibodies. How these dyes are coupled means they get uh, attached to antibodies and after attaching to the antibodies, they allow the detection of antigen using these labeled dye. So, because of the label dye, they can detect the presence of antigen. Now, what is the commonly used dyes? So, the most uh, used dye of for the immunofluorescence operation is fluorescence fluoros and it is an inorganic dye that absorbs blue light of uh, 490 nanometer and emit a strong yellow-green fluorescence of 4, uh, 517 nanometer. So, this question can be asked in the interview in the examination so this is very important that what type of uh, immuno uh, dye is used in uh, uh, immunofluorescence so uh, the, dye, the dye is known as fluorescence and it is an inorganic dye that uh, can absorb a blue light 
uh, which has a wavelength of 490 nanometer but when they emit they emit the <coughs> yellow green fluorescence of 590 nanometer so basically immunofluorescence they contain a dye and known as fluorescent dye and these dye uh, they emit uh, the visible light when they are exposed to the uv radiation but when they are coupled with antibodies they allow the detection of antigens and uh, they absorb uh, blue light but when they emit they emit the green uh, yellow light a strong emitter of red fluorescence and effective light absorber 30 times more efficient than fluorescence a poly uh, polycothrin uh, is often used as a label immunofluorescence so apart from fluorescent uh, another dye that is known as uh, phycoetherin. Phycoetherin. Phycoetherin is another type of a dye that is used for the label of immunofluorescence and it is um, uh, more effective than fluorescence. Why? Because it is 30 times more effect effective. So that is the reason it is used in immunofluorescence. So basically there are two types of dye. Now moving to the next that is ELISA. So ELISA is a, uh, our last type of antigen and antibody reaction. So uh, in 1971 enzyme linked uh, antigen and antibody were created by serological reagent for testing of antibodies and antigens. So uh, to test antigen and antibody so a serological reagent is used is created to uh, check the testing of both antigen and antibody and this uh, has took place in year 1971. So when it compared to radio immunoassay that is RIA they are more simple uh, uh, and sensitive affordable and risk free so as compared to RIA we will going to study about RIA also that is a radio immunoassay so it is more uh, you can say more simple in uh, sensitive and affordable and it has no risk risk free so the uh, the ligand used uh, is a is as a molecule that is covalently attached to the enzyme like peroxidase beta uh, galacto Sides, uh, alkaline phosphatase and it is capable of detecting the antibody so basically it's work is to detect the presence of antibody elisa's full form is <coughs> because uh, again in exams in mcqs in interviews they can ask you about elisa so elisa is an enzyme linked immunosorbent assay and it is basically used to detect antibody to detect the presence of antigens or antibody they created a serological agent and uh, as compared to ria these are more effective sensitive and uh, cost effective and one of the most important factor is it is free from any source of contamination and um, in this ligand is used as a molecule uh, when they what they do their ligand they covalently attach to the enzyme like for example peroxidase beta -galacto galactosidase or alkaline phosphatase and when they are attached to these type of enzyme they, um, uh, they are capable of detecting the antibodies now moving to the next that is there are basically three types of ELISA this is again very important that how many types of ELISA is there so basically there are three type of ELISA the first is indirect ELISA second is sandwich ELISA and fourth is competitive ELISA so when it is a indirect ELISA so HIV can be detected using the indirect ELISA method ELISA uh, the surface of the micro uh, micro uh, micro eaters uh, plates are coated with developed protein uh, developed using competent uh, technology unbound proteins are washed out when suspect uh, serum is added so uh, this type of um, ELISA is used to detect the uh, HIV uh, HIV uh, uh, disease and how it is how they do they use um, the, uh, the surface of the micro tighter uh, plates uh, means i will show you this type of plate uh, so they are coated with enveloped uh, protein um, protein that is developed using a uh, recombinant dna technology uh, recombinant technology and those protein th those are unbound so they are washed out when the suspect serum is <coughs> added then comes the sandwich um, the ELISA. So this method is used for determining whether there is an antigen in a sample or not. So sandwich says so they is basically they are basically used to detect the presence of antigen in a sample. So the suspect serum means the serum that is added added and um, given time to react um, after uh, after the well has been coated with the antigen um, specific antibodies like this. So after that um, an unbound antigen is removed from the well through washing. So the next step is to add the antibody against the different antigen epitope. Washing is uh, used to remove the unbound antigen and uh, followed by the addition of colored substrate and color development. The um, color intensity is directly proportional to antigen and deep concentration or in the serum. Then comes the competitive ELISA. So these competitive ELISA is another variant for estimating the antigen concentration and um, in this method the antibody is initially incubated in the solution for the same containing the antigen. So the antigen coated microfilter will and then uh, it is filled with antigen and antibody reaction mixture. This is how the uh, direct ELISA is uh, look like and indirect in this how the sandwich <coughs> and this is the competitive ELISA. This is how the ELISA plate look like this uh, dot, dot that you are seeing it is known as the well and you just pour your sample here and just place it in the laminar to get a result of this. 
then comes the uh, radio immuno assay definition so what is ria that we have already discussed that uh, elisa is uh, more effective than ria so what is ria so ria is nothing but it is a radio immuno assay and uh, it is involved in the separation of protein from the mixture using the specificity of antibody antigen binding and quantitative quantitation using the radioactivity so basically it is involved in the separation of protein from the mixture which type of mixture um, uh, that is the specific mixture and uh, basically they use the specificity of antibody and antigen binding so the technique was first introduced in 1960 by uh, Burson and uh, Yellow <coughs> as an assay for the concentration in um, of insulin in plasma. It was uh, shown first time at a hormone level in the blood could detect by in vitro assay. This is how the in a, a radio immuno assay process took place. That uh, um, uh, you take a test tube. In that test tube, you put um, the antibody coated well. Then uh, after that, uh, add the radio labeled antigen in the excess amount like this, the red one. After adding the radio act uh, labeled antigen in the excess amount, you remove the unborn antigen. So you remove the um, unborn. Uh, Antigen by washing means the antigen that are extra, they uh, who are the antigen that could not bound uh, with the antibody, they are removed. You can see the red one, uh, you have just put in the excess. Uh, can you see this diagram? So, here this is an excess um, uh, antigen you have already poured in this test tube. So, these are certain unbound um, uh, antigens. So, uh, here washing is done after washing. Uh, the unbound uh, uh, antigen is removed. You can see here only a bound antigen and antibodies are there. Then add a known amount of labeled antigen. Then again, you add certain known amount of here. Unknown amount of antigen is, uh, is uh, poured in it or added in it. The here, un <coughs> unknown labeled antigen is added in this here then uh, we do washing again washing why we are washing so remove any unborn antigen uh, and then after removing that you can measure the radioactivity of precipitate and after here you can just measure the radioactivity of the precipitate <coughs> then comes the applications of Ria. So the, the first application is the narcotus drug detections. In uh, drug detection, it is uh, mainly used. Then early cancer detection when you have to detect the cancer. So early cancer detection can be uh, detected through Ria. Then measurement of growth hormone level, tracking of leukemia virus, diagnosis and treatment of peptic ulcer, research in with brain chemicals called neurotransmitter. So and the last is estradiol measurement in translator diseases of breast cancer. So basically, it has a great application in the medical science because it is detecting the various type of diseases at a very early age. So it is always recommended to use Ria whenever you want to detect uh, any diseases and it has a great uh, uh, medical <coughs> and, uh, application. So that brings to the end of the lecture. I uh, hope you have understood the lecture. If any doubt, any query related to the lecture, you can just simply leave your queries in the comment section below. In the next lecture, I will be answering the queries. Thank you for watching. Please do like, share and subscribe the channel. Thank you.